If this is your first time visiting this channel, please subscribe and click the bell for notifications. Section 19 of Psychological Types, or The Psychology of Individuation. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more recording by Olivia. Psychological Types, or The Psychology of Individuation, by Carl Gustav Jung. Translated by Helton Godwin Baines. Chapter 5.3 The Significance of the Reconciling Symbol. If from the standpoint now gained, we glance once more at the unconscious elaboration of the problem by Spittler, we appreciate at once that the compact with evil originates not in the aim of Prometheus, but in the thoughtlessness of Epimetheus, who only possesses a collective conscience and no power of discrimination for the things of the inner world. As invariably happens with the collective standpoint that is orientated to the object, he allows himself to be determined exclusively by collective values, and consequently overlooks what is new and original. Current collective values are certainly mensurable by the objective standard, but only a free and unfettered valuation, a matter of living feeling, can yield a true estimate of the thing that is newly created. But such an appreciation belongs to the man possessing a soul, and not merely relations to external objects. The downfall of Epimetheus begins with the loss of the newborn divine image. His incontestably moral thinking, feeling, and acting in no way hinder the evil, hollow, and destructive from creeping in. This invasion of evil signifies a conversion of something previously good into something definitely harmful. In this fashion, Spittler expresses the idea that the moral principle hitherto prevailing, although excellent to begin with, loses with the lapse of time its essential connection with life since it no longer embraces the abundance and variety of life. The rationally correct is too meager a concept upon which to found a hope for an adequate and permanent expression of life in its totality, but the irrational occurrence of the divine birth stands beyond the frontiers of the rational kingdom. Psychologically, the divine birth heralds the fact that a new symbol, a new expression of supreme vital intensity, is being created. Every epimethium element in man and every epimethian man is incapable of comprehending this event. Yet from this moment, the supreme intensity of life is to be found only upon the new line. Every other direction falls gradually away, dissolving into oblivion. The new symbol, the bestower of life, springs from Prometheus's love for his soul, a figure pregnant with demonic characters. One may be sure, therefore, that interwoven in the new symbol with its living beauty, there is also an element of evil, for, if not, it would lack the glow of life as well as beauty, since life and beauty are naturally indifferent to morality. For this reason, Epimethean collectivity finds no value in it, for it is quite blinded by its one-sided moral standpoint, which is identical with the lamb, that is, the traditional Christian standpoint. The raging of Epimetheus against the lamb is therefore écré les femmes in a new form, a revolt against the established Christianity, which was unable to comprehend the new symbol wherewith to guide life upon a new way. Such a reaction, however, might remain entirely unproductive, were there no poets who could fathom and read the collective unconscious. They are the first in their time to divine the darkly moving mysterious currents, and to express them according to the limits of their capacity in more or less speaking symbols. They make known, like true prophets, the deep motions of the collective unconscious, the will of God, in the language of the Old Testament, which, in the course of time, must inevitably come to the surface as a general phenomenon. The redemptive significance of the deed of Prometheus, the downfall of Epimetheus, his reconciliation with his soul-serving brother, and the vengeance Epimetheus wreaks upon the lamb, recalling in its note of cruelty the scene, from Dante, between Ergolino and the Archbishop Ruggieri, prepares a solution of the conflict that involves a deadly revolt against traditional collective morality. We may assume in a poet of modest limits that the summit of his work does not overtop the height of his personal joys, sorrows, and aspirations. But with Spittler, his work quite transcends personal destiny. For this reason, his solution of the problem does not stand alone. From here to Zarathustra, the breaker of the tables, is only a step. Stirner also joined the company after Schopenhauer had first conceived the idea of denial. He spoke of the denial of the world. Psychologically, the world means how I see the world, my attitude to the world. Thus the world can be regarded as my will and my presentation. 
In itself, the world is indifferent. It is my yes and no that create the differences. The idea of negation, therefore, is concerned with an attitude to the world, and particularly Schopenhauer's attitude to it, which on the one hand is purely intellectual and rational, while on the other it is a mystical identity with the world in his most individual feeling. This attitude is introverted. It suffers, therefore, from its typological antithesis. But Schopenhauer's work in many ways transcends his personality. It voices what was obscurely thought and felt by many thousands. Similarly with Nietzsche, preeminently his Zarathustra, brings to light the contents of the collective unconscious of our time. In him, therefore, we also find the same distinguishing features, iconoclastic revolt against the conventional moral atmosphere, and the acceptance of the ugliest man, which in Nietzsche leads to that shattering unconscious tragedy presented in Zarathustra. But what collective minds bring up out of the collective unconscious also actually exists, and sooner or later must make its appearance in collective psychology. Anarchy, regicide, the constant increase and splitting off of an anarchistic element upon the extreme socialist left with an avowed program that is absolutely hostile to culture, these are phenomena of mass psychology, which were long adumbrated by poets and creative thinkers. We cannot, therefore, afford to be indifferent to the poets, since, in their principal works and deepest inspirations, they create from the very depths of the collective unconscious, voicing aloud what others only dream. But what the poets proclaim is only the symbol in which they sense ascetic pleasure, without any consciousness of its true meaning, that poets and thinkers have an educational influence upon their own and succeeding epochs, I would be the last to dispute. But it seems to me that their influence essentially consists in the fact that they voice rather more clearly and resoundingly what all know, and only in so far as they express this universal unconscious knowledge have they any considerable effect, whether educational or seductive. The greatest and most immediately suggestive effect is gained by the poet who knows how to express the most superficial levels of the unconscious in a successful form. Should the vision of the creative mind search more deeply, it becomes all the more strange to mankind in the mass and provokes an even greater resistance in all those who occupy conspicuous positions in the eyes of the mass. The mass does not understand it, although unconsciously living what it expresses, not because the poet proclaims it, but because its life issues from the collective unconscious into which he has peered. The more thoughtful of the nation certainly comprehends something of his message, but, because his utterance corresponds with events already developing among the mass, and also because he anticipates their own aspirations, they hate the creator of such thoughts, not at all viciously, but merely from the instinct of self-protection. When apprehension of the collective unconscious reaches a depth where conscious expression can no longer grasp its content, it cannot be decided at once whether it is a morbid product we have to deal with, or whether something quite incomprehensible because of its extraordinary depth. An imperfectly understood yet deeply significant content usually has a somewhat morbid character, and morbid products are, as a rule, significant, but in both cases the approach is difficult. If it ever arrives at all, the fame of these creators is posthumous and often delayed for several centuries. Ostwald's opinion that, at the most, a highly gifted mind of today would obtain recognition within a decade or so was not, I hope, intended to reach beyond the realm of technical discoveries, for, if so, such an assertion would be extremely ludicrous. There is another point of particular importance to which I feel I ought to refer. The solution of the problem in Faust, in the Parsifal of Wagner, in Schopenhauer, even in Nietzsche's Zarathustra, is religious. That Spittler was also drawn towards a religious setting is therefore not to be wondered at. When a problem is accepted as religious, it gains a psychological significance of immense importance. A value is involved which relates to the whole of man, hence also the unconscious, the realm of the gods, the other world, etc. With Spittler, the religious form possesses such an exuberant wealth that its specially religious quality loses in depth, although it certainly gains in mythological richness, in archaic as well as prospective symbolism. The luxuriating mythological web makes the work difficult of approach, as it also tends to shroud the problem from comprehension and a possible solution. The abstruse, grotesque, and uncouth quality that always clings to mythological exuberance hinders the flow of sympathy, alienates one's sensibility from the work, and gives the whole work a rather disagreeable suggestion of a certain type of originality which can only successfully escape the charge of psychic abnormality by a painstaking and scrupulous adaptation in other directions. 
However fatiguing and unpalatable such mythological exuberance may be, it has the advantage of allowing the symbol to expand and develop in a relatively unconscious unfolding, whereby the conscious wits of the poet are quite at a loss as to how to assist in the expression of the meaning. Thus he labors with a single mind in the husbandry of the mythological yield and its plastic development. Spittler's poem differs, in this respect, both from Faust and from Zarathustra, for in these works there is a greater conscious participation on the part of the poet in the meaning of the symbol. Accordingly, the mythological luxuriance in Faust and the intellectual exuberance in Zarathustra are pruned down to the advantage of the desired solution. Both Faust and Zarathustra are, for this reason, far more beautiful than Spittler's Prometheus, but the latter, as a more or less faithful image of the actual processes of the collective unconscious, has a deeper truth. Faust and Zarathustra are of the very greatest assistance in the individual mastery of the problem in question, but Spittler's Prometheus and Epimetheus, thanks to its abundant harvest of mythological material, provides not only a more general appreciation of the problem, but also its manner of appearance in collective life. The principal revelation of the unconscious religious contents in Spittler's work is the symbol of the God renewal, which is subsequently more fully expanded in the Olympian spring. This symbol appears in the most intimate connection with the type and function antithesis, and manifestly bears the significance of an effort to find the solution in a renewal of the general attitude, which, in the language of the unconscious, is expressed as a renewal of God. The God renewal is a familiar archetypal image that is quite universal. I need only mention the whole complex of dying and rejuvenating God with all its mythological precursors, down to the recharging of fetishes and chiringas with magical force. The image affirms a transformation of attitude, by which a new potential of energy, a new manifestation of life, a new fruitfulness, have come into being. This latter analogy explains the connection, for which there is abundant proof, between the God renewal and seasonal and vegetational phenomena. There is a natural inclination to confine astral or lunar myths to these seasonal and vegetational analogies. In doing so, however, we entirely lose sight of the fact that a myth, like everything psychic, cannot be solely conditioned by outer events. The psychic product brings with it its own inner conditions, so that one might assert with equal right that the myth is purely psychological and merely uses the facts of meteorological or astronomical processes as material for expression. The arbitrariness and absurdity of so many of the primitive mythological assertions make the latter version appear more frequently applicable than any other. The psychological point of departure for the God renewal corresponds with an increasing divergence in the manner of application of psychic energy or libido. One half of the libido moves towards a Promethean, while the other towards an Epimethean manner of application. Such an opposition is, of course, a very great hindrance not only in society but also in the individual. Hence, the optimum of life recedes more and more from the opposing extremes and seeks out a middle way, which must necessarily be irrational and unconscious, just because the opposites are rational and conscious. Since the middle position, as a function of mediation between the opposites, possesses an irrational character, it appears projected in the form of a reconciling god, a messiah, or mediator. To our Western forms of religion, which are still too primitive in matters of discernment or understanding, the new possibility of life appears in the figure of a god or savior who, in his fatherly care and love and from his own inner resolve, puts an end to the division in his own time and season for reasons we are not fitted to understand. The childishness of this conception is self-evident. The East has, for thousands of years, been familiar with this process and has founded thereon a psychological doctrine of salvation which brings the way of deliverance within the compass of human intention. Thus, both the Indian and Chinese religions, as also Buddhism, which combines the spheres of both, possess the idea of a redeeming middle path of magical efficacy, which is attainable through a conscious attitude. The Vedic conception is a conscious attempt to find release from the pairs of opposites in order to gain the path of redemption. End of section 19. Recording by Olivia. Section 20 of Psychological Types, or the Psychology of Individuation. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Avian X. Psychological Types, 
The Psychology of Individuation by Carl Gustav Jung Translated by Helton Godwin Baines, 1882 to 1943 Chapter 5.3a The Brahmanic Conception of the Problem of the Opposites The Sanskrit term for the pair of opposites in the psychological sense is vandva. Besides the meaning of the pair, particularly man and woman, it denotes strife, quarrel, combat, doubt, etc. The pairs of opposites were ordained by the creator of the world. Moreover, in order to distinguish actions, he separated merit from demerit, and he caused the creature to be affected by the pair of opposites, such as pain and pleasure. As for their pairs of opposites, the commentator Kaluka names desire and anger, love and hate, hunger and thirst, care and folly, honor and disgrace. Beneath the pairs of opposites must this world suffer without ceasing. Not to allow oneself to be influenced by the pairs of opposites, nirvanva, free, untouched by the opposites, but to raise oneself above them is then an essentially ethical task, since freedom from the opposites leads to redemption. In the following passages, I give a series of examples. 1. From the Book of Manu He who becometh indifferent towards all objects by the disposition of his feelings attaineth eternal blessedness, as much in this world as after death. Whosoever in this wise hath gradually surrendered all bonds and freed himself from all the opposites, reposeth in Brahman. Footnote 1. Brahman is the designation generally applied to the Supreme Soul, Paramatman, or impersonal, all-embracing divine essence, the original source and the ultimate goal of all that exists. Encyclopedia Britannica. End of footnote 1. 2. The famous exhortation of Krishna. The Vedas speak of the three gunas. Footnote 3. Qualities are factors or constituents of the world. End of footnote 3. Nevertheless, O Arjuna, be thou indifferent concerning the three gunas, indifferent towards the opposites, nirvanva, ever steadfast in courage. 3. In the Yoga Sutra of Patanjali, we find, Then, in deepest contemplation, samadhi, cometh that state which is untroubled by the opposites. Footnote 5. Yoga is well known as a system of training for the attainment of the higher states of redemption. End of footnote 5. 4. Concerning the wise one. Both good and evil deeds doth he shake off in that place. Those who are known unto him and are his friends take upon them his good deeds, but they who are not his friends his evil works. And like one who is faring fast in a chariot looketh down upon the chariot wheels, so upon day and night, upon good and evil deeds, and upon all opposites doth he look down. But he, freed from good and evil deeds, as knower of Brahman, entereth into Brahman. 5. To the one who is called to meditation. Whosoever overcometh desire and anger, the cleaving of the world and the lust of the senses, Whoso maketh himself free from the opposites, and relinquisheth the feeling of self, above all self-seeking, that one is released from expectation. 6. Pandu, who desires to be a hermit, says, Clothed with dust, housed under the open sky, I will take my lodging at the root of a tree, surrendering all things loved as well as unloved, tasting neither grief nor pleasure, forfeiting blame and praise alike, neither cherishing hope nor offering respect, free from the opposites, nirvanva, with neither fortune nor belongings. 7. Whosoever remaineth the same in living as in dying, in fortune as in misfortune, whether gaining or losing, in love and in hatred, will be redeemed. Whoso nothing pursueth and regardeth nothing of small account, Whoso is free from the opposites, nirvanva, whose soul knoweth no passion, he is wholly delivered. Whosoever doeth neither right nor wrong, renouncing the treasure of good and evil deeds heaped up in former lives, whose soul is tranquil when the bodily elements vanish away, whoso holdeth himself free from the opposites, that one is redeemed. 8. 
Full thousand years have I enjoyed the things of sense, while still the craving for them springeth up unceasingly. These, therefore, will I renounce and direct my mind upon Brahma, indifferent towards the opposites, Nirvanva, and, freed from the feeling of self-will, I will roam with the wild creatures. Footnote 2. Bhagavata Purana. 9.19.18. After he hath put off silence and non-silence, thus will he become a Brahmana. Brihadaranyaka Upanishad. 3.5. End of footnote 2. 9. Through forbearance to all creatures, through the ascetic life, through self-discipline and freedom from desire, through the vow and the blameless life, through equanimity and endurance of the opposites, will man share the bliss in Brahma, who is without qualities. 10. Whosoever is free from overweening vanity and delusion, and hath overcome the frailty of dependence, whoso remaineth faithful to the highest Atman, whose desires are extinguished, who remaineth untouched by the opposites of pleasure and pain, that one released from delusion shall attain that imperishable state. It follows from these quotations that it is external opposites, such as heat and cold, which must first be denied psychic participation in order that extreme affective fluctuations like love and hatred, etc., may also be avoided. 5. I am indebted to the kind help of Dr. Abeg of Zurich, the Sanskrit specialist, for these to me somewhat inaccessible citations. Numbers 193 and 201 to 205. End of footnote 5. Affective fluctuations are the natural and constant accompaniments to every psychic antithesis, hence of every antagonism of ideas, whether moral or otherwise. Such affects, as we know by experience, are proportionately greater the more the exciting factor affects the totality of the individual. The meaning of the Indian aim is therefore clear. Its purpose is to redeem human nature altogether from the opposites, to attain a new life in Brahman, to win a state of deliverance, and at the same time God. Brahman, therefore, must signify the irrational union of the opposites, hence their final overcoming. Although Brahman, as the cause and creator of the world, has created the opposites, they must again be resolved in him, if he is to signify the state of redemption. In the following passages, I give a group of examples. 1. Brahman is Sat and Asat, the existing and non-existing, Satyam and Asatyam, reality and unreality. 2. In truth, there are two forms of Brahman, the formed and the formless, the mortal and the immortal, the solid and the fluid, the definite and the indefinite. Footnote 2. Brihad Aranyaka Upanishad. 2, 3, Sacred Books, 15. Definite, Sat, literally being, or this, and indefinite, Tya, literally that, or hereafter. End of footnote 2. 3. God, the creator of all things, the great self who dwelleth eternally in the hearts of men, is discernible by the heart, by the soul, by the mind. Who knoweth that gaineth immortality? When the light hath dawned, then is there neither day nor night, neither being nor not being. 4. Two things are eternal, in the infinite, supreme Brahman contained, knowing and not knowing. Perishable is not knowing, eternal knowing, yet he who is Lord controlleth them is the other. 5. In the heart of this creature is concealed the self, smaller than the small, greater than the great. By the grace of the Creator, a man freed from desires and released from affliction, beholdeth the majesty of the self. Though sitting still, he wandereth far, he extendeth over all, yet lieth in one place. Who is there, beside myself, able to know this God, who rejoiceth, yet rejoiceth not? Footnote 5. Dusan here translates, He sitteth, yet wandereth further. He lieth, yet everywhere hovereth. Concerning the swaying hither and thither of God, who understandeth save myself? Katka Upanishad, 1, 2, 20. End of footnote 5. 6. 
One there is, without stirring and yet swift as thought, speeding hence, not even overtaken by the gods. Standing still, it surpasseth all the runners, the wind god, wove among the strands of its being the primordial water. Resting, it is yet ever restless, it is distant, and yet so near, it is indwelling in all things, yet it is outside everything. 7. Like as a falcon or an eagle tiring after wide circuits in the windy spaces of heaven, foldeth his wings and droppeth to quiet cover, so urgeth the spirit toward that state whose repose no desire troubleth, nor delusion entereth. That is its true being, from yearnings, from evil, and from fear delivered, like unto a man in the embrace of a beloved wife, unaware of things without or things within, is the spirit that is embraced by the all-discerning self, Brahman. Footnote 1. This describes the resolution of the subject-object antithesis. End of footnote 1. This one second is an ocean, free from duality. This, O king, is the world of Brahman. Thus Yalnavalkya taught him. This is his highest goal. This is his dearest success. This his greatest world, and this his supreme rapture. 8. What is agile, flying, and yet standing still? What breatheth, yet draweth no breath? What closeth the eyes? What beareth the whole manifold earth, and bringeth all together in unity? These quotations show that Brahman is the reconciliation and dissolution of the opposites, hence standing beyond them as an irrational factor. 4. Hence Brahman is quite beyond knowledge and comprehension. End of footnote 4. It is a divine essence as well as the self, in a lesser degree of course than the analogous Atman concept. It is also a definite psychological state, characterized by detachment from emotional fluctuations. Since suffering is an affect, the release from affects means deliverance. Release from the fluctuations of affects, which means from the tension of opposites, is synonymous with the way of redemption that gradually leads to the state of Brahman. In a certain sense, therefore, Brahman is not only a state, but also a process, a dere creatrice. It is therefore not surprising that the symbolical expression of this Brahman concept in the Upanishads makes use of all those symbols which I have termed libido symbols. The following are a few appropriate examples. End of chapter 5.3a The Brahmanic Conception of the Problem of the Opposites Recording by Avian X. Section number 21 of Psychological Types or the Psychology of Individuation This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Benjamin Herman. Psychological Types or the Psychology of Individuation by Carl Gustav Jung Translated by Helton Godwin Baines, 1882 to 1943, section 21. Following example from the Ayurveda. The disciple of Brahman advanceth, reanimating both worlds. In him all the gods are unanimous. He containeth and upholdeth the earth and the heavens. He even feedeth the master with his tapas. To the Brahman disciple there come to visit him, fathers and gods, singly and in multitudes, and he nourisheth all the gods by his tapas. The Brahman disciple himself is an incarnation of Brahman, from which the identity of the Brahman essence with definite psychological state is clearly established. Prompted by the gods, the sun burneth in their splendour unsurpassed. From him proceedeth Brahman force, Supreme Brahman, yea, even all the gods, and what maketh doth not the Brahman disciple upholdeth, Brahman resplendent interwoven in him are the hosts of the gods. Brahman is also prana, breath of life, and the cosmic life principle. Brahman is also vayu wind, which is referred to in the Brahmana Impanasht as the cosmic and psychic life principle. 
He who is this Brahman in man and the one who is that Brahman in the sun are both one. Prayer of one dying. In countenance of truth, Brahman is covered by a golden disc. Open this, O Pushan, Savita son, that we may hold the nature of truth. Unfold and assemble thy holy rays, O Pushan, thou art seer Yama Sura son, son of Parajapati. I behold the light, thy lovely assemblance, what he is, I am, i.e., the man in the sun. And this light, which spreadeth over this heaven, higher than all, higher even than those in the highest world, above and beyond which there are no more worlds, this is the same light that burneth in the inner world of man, whereof we have this visible token, only to feel the warmth and perceive bodies, as a grain of rice or barley or millet, yea, even like a kernel unto a millet seed is the spirit in the inner self, golden like a flame without smoke, and it is greater than the heavens, vaster than space, greater than this earth, surpassing all beings. It is the soul of life, it is my own soul, departing hence into this soul shall I enter." In the Adveda, Brahman is conceived as the vitalistic principle, the life force, which fashions all the organs and their retrospective instincts. Who planted the seed within him that he might ever spin the thread of generation? Who assembled within him the powers of mind that gave him voice and play of features? Even the power of man originates in Brahman. From these examples, whose number could be multiplied indefinitely, it clearly follows that by virtue of its attributes and symbols, the Brahman concept is in full harmony with that idea of dynamic or creative element, which I have named libido. The word Brahman means prayer, incantation, sacred speech, sacred knowledge, Veda, holy life, the absolute, the sacred caste, the Brahmins, Dushan stresses the prayer significance of being especially characteristic. Brahman is derived from bark, for seer, swelling. I.e. prayer is conceived of as the upward urging will of man striving towards the holy, the divine. A certain psychological state is indicated in this derivation, namely a specific concentration of libido, which through overflowing innovations produces a general state of tension and hence is associated with the feeling of swelling. Thus, in colloquial references to such a state, images of overflowing, e.g. one cannot restrain oneself, bursting, etc., are frequently used. What filleth the heart goeth out by the mouth. Indian practice seeks to accomplish this state of damming or heaping up of libido by systematically drawing the attention, libido-like objects, from the psychic state, in a word, from the opposites. This elimination of sense perception and blotting out of conscious contents leads inevitably to a lowering of consciousness in general, just as in hypnosis whereby unconscious contents, i.e. the primordial images, which possess a cosmic superhuman character on account of their universality and immense antiquity, become activated. Those age-old allegories of sun, fire, flame, wind, breath, etc., from which earliest time have symbolized the begetting, world-moving, creative power, have come about this way. Since I've made a special study of these libido images in another work, I will not further expand this theme here. The idea of a creative world principle is a projected perception of a living essence in man himself. In order to preclude all vitalistic misunderstandings, one is well advised to make an abstract conception of this essence as energy. But on the other hand, that hypostasizing of the energy concept in the fashion of modern energetics must of course be firmly rejected. Since energetic current necessarily presupposes the existence of an opposition, i.e. two states of differing potential, without which no current can take place, the concept of opposition is also associated with the energy concept. Every energetic phenomenon 
and there are no phenomena that are not energic, manifests both beginning and end, upper and lower, hot and cold, earlier and later, cause and effect, etc., i.e. pairs of opposites. This inseparability of the energy concept from the concept of opposition also involves the libido concept. Hence, libido symbols of a mythological or philosophical speculative character are either represented by a direct antithesis or become immediately broken up into opposites. In a former work, I've already referred to this inner splitting of the libido, therefore provoking a certain opposition, though not justifiably. So it seems to me, since the immediate association of a libido symbol with the concept of opposition is sufficient justification. We also find this association in the Brahman concept or symbol. The character of Brahman as prayer, at the same time as a primordial creative force, the latter being resolved into the opposition of sexes, is remarkably presented in the hymn of the Rigveda. And ever unfolding this prayer of the singer became a cow which was before the world existed. Dwelling together in the womb of God, fledglings of the same brood are the gods. What hath been wood and was the tree, out of which earth and heavens were hewn, the twain, changeless and eternally helpful? When days vanished and the dawn's first flush came not, greater than he nothing existeth. He is the bull upholding the earth and heaven. The cloud sieve he griddeth like a fleece. When he, the Lord, driveth like Surya his cream horses, as an arrow of the sun he irradiateth the wide earth. As the wind scattereth the mist, he stormeth through creatures. When he cometh as Mitra, as Varun chasing around, as Agni in the forest, he distributeth glowing light. When driven to him the cow brought forth, moved freely pasturing the unmoved thing she created. She bore the son, the one who was older than the parents. That the idea of opposition is closely bound up with the world creator is presented in another form in Katapatha Brahmanan. In the beginning was Parajapati. Alone he meditated. How can I propagate myself? So he travelled and practised tapas. Then he begat Agni, fire, out of his mouth. Because he begat him out of his mouth, therefore Agni is food devourer. Parajapati reflected, As food devourer, I have created this Agni out of myself, but there existeth here nothing else beside myself that he may devour. For at that time the earth was quite barren, neither herbs nor trees were there, and this thought was heavy upon him. Then turned upon him Agni with now gaping more, thus spake unto him, his own greatness. Sacrifice then, new Parachapati. This is my own greatness has spoken unto me. And he sacrificed. Thereupon he ascended, and burneth yonder the sun. Thereupon he rose. He that purifieth here the wind. Because Parajapati sacrificed in this wise, he propagated himself, and because death in the form of Agni would have devoured him, he also saved himself from death. The sacrifice is always the reunication of the valuable part. The sacrificer thus avoids being eaten up. This does not mean a transformation into the opposite, but a unification and adjustment from which there arises a new libido direction or attitude to life. Sun and wind are generated. It is stated in another place in the Karapatha Brahmanam that one half of Parajapati is mortal and the other immortal. Similar to the way Parajapati divides himself into bull and cow is his division into the two principles manas, mind, and vak, speech. This world was Parajapati alone. Vak was his self and vak was his second self, his alter ego. Thus he meditated, this vak I will send forth. She will go hence and pervade all things. Then he sent forth vak and she went and filled the universe. This passage is of special interest inasmuch as speech here is conceived as a creative, extroverted libido movement, as a distal in goth sense. There is a further parallel in the following passage. In truth, Parajapati was in the world, with him was Vak in his second self, 
With her did he beget life. She conceived, whereupon she went forth out of him, and made these creatures once again entered into Parajapati. In the Karapatha Brahmanan, the share attributed to Vak is a prestigious one. Truly, Vak is the wise Vikvakarman, for through Vak was this whole world made. However, in Katap, the question of precedence between Manas and Vak is decided differently. Upon a time, it came to pass that mind and speech strove for priority with one another. Mind said, I am better than thou, for thou speakest nothing that I have not first discerned. Then, said speech, I am better than thou, since I announce what thou hast discerned and make it known. To Parajapati they went for the question to be judged. Parajapati decreed for mind, saying, Truly mind is better than thou, for thou dost copy what mind doeth, and runneth in his tracks. Moreover, it is the inferior who is wont to imitate his betters. These passages show that the world creator can also divide himself into Manas and Vak, who are themselves mutually opposed. As Dusen points out, both principles are first contained within Parajapati, the world creator, this appears in the following text. Parajapati yearned, I wish to be many, I will multiply myself. Then silently he meditated in his manas. What was in his mana fashioned Krihat. Then he pondered, This lieth in me as a fruit of my body. Through Vak I will bring it to birth. Thereupon he made Vak, etc. This passage shows the two principles in their character of psychological functions, namely manas as introversion of the libido with the creation of an inner product, vak as the divesting function or extroversion, which in this explanation we can now understand a further text relating to the Brahman. Brahman made two worlds. When he had come into this other world, he pondered, how can I reach again into the world? Twofold he did extend himself into the world, through form and through name. These twain are the two great monsters of Brahman. Whosoever knoweth these two great monsters of Brahman becometh like unto them. These twain are two mighty aspects of Brahman. A little later, form is explained as manas. Manas is form, for man knoweth through manas what form is. And name is shown to be vak, for through vak man seetheth the name. Thus, the two monsters of the Brahman emerge as Manas and Vak, hence two psychic functions, which the Brahman can extend himself into two worlds, clearly signifying the function of the relation. The form of things is conceived or taken in by introverting through Manas names which are given to things by extroverting through Vak. Both are bound up with the relations and adaptations or assimilations of things. The two monsters are also evidently regarded as personifications. An indication of this lies in their other title, aspects equals yaksha. Since yaksha is equivalent of daemon or superhuman being, Psychologically, personification always signifies a relative independence, autonomy of the personified contents, i.e. a relative splitting off from the psychic hierarchy. A content of this kind is not obedient to voluntary reproduction, but either reproduces itself spontaneously or in some similar way becomes insulated from consciousness. For instance, when an incompatibility exists between ego and a certain complex, such a cleavage is produced. As is well known, one frequently observes this dissociation between the ego and the sexual complex. But other complexes may also become split off. The power complex, for instance, corresponding with the sum of all those aspirations and ideas which aim at the acquisition of personal power. There is, however, another sort of cleavage, namely the splitting off of the conscious ego together with a selected function from the remaining components of the personality. This cleavage may be defined as an identification of the ego with a certain function or group of functions, 
A disassociation of this kind is very often seen in men who are too deeply immersed in one of their psychic functions, thereby differentiating it as their only conscious function of adaptation. A good literary example of such a man is provided by Faust at the beginning of the tragedy. The remaining elements of the personality approach in the form of the poodle and later as Mistopheles. According to my view, we should not be justified in interpreting Mistopheles as a split-off complex, as represented sexual energy, for instance. In spite of the fact which is undoubtedly borne out by many associations that Mistopheles also represents the sexual complex... This explanation is too limited for Mistopheles, is more than mere sexuality. He's also power. With the exception of thinking and research, he is practically the whole life of Faust. The result of the pact with the devil shows this most distinctly. What undreamed of possibilities do not unfold themselves to the rejuvenated Faust? The correct view, therefore, would seem to be that Faust identifies himself with the one function and therewith becomes split off from the personality as a whole. Subsequently, the thinker in the form of Wagner also becomes split off from Faust. Conscious capacity for one-sidedness is a sign of the highest culture, but involuntary one-sidedness is an inability to be anything but one-sided, is a sign of barbarism. Hence, we find among half-savage peoples the most one-sided differentiations, as, for instance, certain aspects of Christian aestheticism, which are an affront to good taste, and paralleled phenomena among the yogis and Tibetan Buddhists. For the barbarian, this tendency to fall victim to one-sidedness in one way or another, thereby losing sight of his whole personality, is a great and constant danger. The Gilgamesh epic, for example, begins with this conflict. In the barbarian, the one-sided libido movement breaks out with a demonical compulsion. It possesses the character of the berserker rage and run amok. The barbaric one-sidedness presupposes a certain stunting of instinct. This is lacking in the primitive because in general he is still free from the one-sidedness of the semi-civilised barbarian. Identification with one definite function at once produces a tension between the opposites. The more compulsive the one-sidedness, i.e. the more untamed the libido, which urges to one side, the more demonical its quality. When a man is carried away by his uncontrolled, undomesticated libido, he speaks of demonic possession or magical effect. In this way, Manus and Vak are indeed potent demons, since they can work mightily upon men. All things that exercise powerful effects were regarded as either gods or demons. Thus, in Gnosis, Manus became personified as the serpent, like Nous, Vak as Logos. Vak bears the same relation to Parajapati as Logos to God. The sort of demons that introversion and extroversion may become for us is an everyday experience. With what irresistible persuasion and force of the libido streams within or without, with what unshakable tendency an introverted or extroverted attitude can take root, we see in our patients and we can feel in ourselves the description of Manas and Vak as monsters of Brahman is in complete harmony with the psychological fact that in the instant of its appearance, the libido divides into two streams, which as a rule alternate periodically, but at times may also appear simultaneously, in the form of a conflict, namely an outward stream, opposing an inward stream. The demonic quality of these two movements lies in their ungovernable nature and superior power. These qualities are, of course, in evidence only when the instinct of the primitive is already so cultivated that the natural and appropriate counter-movement against his one-sidedness is prevented. And where that culture which might assist him so far as to tame his libido, as to be able voluntarily and deliberately to participate in introverting and extroverting tides is not yet sufficiently advanced. Recognising the symbol as the principle of dynamic regulation. 
In the foregoing passages from Indian sources, we have followed the development of the redeeming principle from pairs of opposites and have traced the origin of pairs of opposites to the same creative principle, thereby gaining an insight into the law-determined psychological occurrence which is found to be easily reconcilable with the concept of our modern psychology. This impression of a law-determined event is also conveyed to us from Indian sources, since they recognise Brahman with Rita. What then is Rita? Rita signifies established order, regulation, direction, determination, sacred custom, statute, divine law, right, truth. According to etymological evidence, its root meaning is ordinance, right way, direction, course to be followed. That which is ordained by Rita fills the whole world, but the particular manifestations of Rita are those natural processes which always remain constant and inevitably arouse the idea of regulated reoccurrence. By Rita's ordinance, the heavens born dawn was lightened. In obedience to Rita, the ancient ones who order the world made the sun to mount. End of section 21. Section number 22 of Psychological Types or the Psychology of Individuation. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Benjamin John Herman. Psychological Types or the Psychology of Individuation by Carl Gustav Jung, translated by Helton Godwin Baines, 1882 to 1943, section 22. The description of Manas and Vak as monsters of Brahmin is in complete harmony with the psychological fact that in the instant of its appearance the libido divides into two streams, which as a rule alternate periodically but at times may also appear simultaneously in the form of conflict, namely the outward stream opposing an inward stream. The demonic quality of the two movements lies in their ungovernable nature and superior power. These qualities are of course evident only when in the instinct of the primitive is already so curtailed that a natural and appropriate counter-movement against his one-sidedness is prevented. And where that culture which might assist him so far as to tame his libido as to be able voluntarily and deliberately to participate in its introverting and extroverting tides is not yet sufficiently advanced. The reconciling symbol as the principle of dynamic regulation. In the foregoing passages from Indian sources, we have followed the development of the redeeming principle from the pairs of opposites and have traced the origin of the pairs of opposites to the same creative principle, thereby gaining insight into the law-determined psychological occurrence which is found to be easily reconcilable with the concepts of our modern psychology. This impression of a law-determined event is also conveyed to us from Indian sources since they identify Brahman with Rita. What then is Rita? Rita signifies established order, regulation, direction, determination, sacred custom, statute, divine law, right, truth. According to etymological evidence, its root meaning is ordinance, right way, direction, course to be followed. That which is ordained by Rita fills the whole world, but the particular manifestations of Rita are in those nature processes which always remain constant and inevitably arouse the idea of regulated reoccurrence. By Rita's ordinance, the heaven-born dawn was lightened. In obedience to Rita, the ancient ones who order the world made the sun to mount the heavens who himself is the burning countenance of Rita. 
Around the heavens circles the year, the twelve-spoked wheel of Rita which never ages. Agni is called the offspring of Rita. In the doings of man, Rita operates as the moral law which adjoins truth and the straight way. Whosoever followeth Rita findeth a thornless path and a fair to walk in. Insofar as they represent a magical repetition or reproduction of cosmic events, Rita also appears in religious rites, as the streams flow in obedience to Rita and the crimson dawn is set ablaze, so under the harness of Rita is the sacrifice kindled. Upon the path of Rita, Agni brings the sacrifice to the gods. Pure of magic, I invoke the gods. With Rita, I do my work and shape my thought, are the words of the sacrificer. Although the Rita concept does not appear personified in the Veda, yet according to Begain, a certain tinge of concrete being undoubtedly clings to it. Since Rita expresses an ordering of events, we find paths of Rita, charioteers, and ships of Rita. On occasion, the gods appear as parallels. The same attribute, for instance, is given to Rita as to Varun. Mitra, also the ancient sun god, is brought into relation with Rita as above. Concerning Agni, we read, Thou shalt become Varun, if thou strivest after Rita. The gods are guardians of Rita. I have selected a group of essential references. Rita is Mitra, for Mitra is Brahman, and Rita is Brahman. In giving the cow to the Brahmins, man gaineth all the worlds, for in her is Brahman contained in Rita and Tapas also. Parijapati is called firstborn of Rita. The gods followed the laws of Rita. He who saw the hidden one, Agni, and drew nigh to the streams of Rita. The boring refers to the worship of Agni, to whom this hymn is dedicated. Agni is here called the Red Bull of Rita. In the worship of Agni, fire obtained by boring is used as a magical symbol of the reincarnation of life. Here, clearly the boring of the streams of Rita bears the same significance, namely the streams of life rise again to the surface, libido is freed from its bonds, the effect produced by the ritual fire boring or through the recital of hymns is naturally regarded by the believers as the magical effect of the object. In reality, however, it is an enchantment of the subject, namely an intensification of the vital feeling, a release and propagation of life force, a restoration of psychic potential. Thus we find, through he, Agni, creepeth away, yet unto him straightway goeth the prayer. They, the prayers, have led forth the following streams of Rita. The revival of living feeling, of this sense of streaming energy, is generally likened to a spring gushing from its source, to the melting of the iron-bound ice of winter in springtime, or the breaking of a long drought by rain. The following passage is in harmony with this theme. With udders full the lowing milk cows of Rita were overflowing, the streams which implored the favour of the gods from afar have broken through the mountain rock with their floods. This imagery clearly sustains a tension of energy, a damming up of libido and its release. Rita here appears as the possessor of blessing, of lowing milk cows, and as the ultimate source of the released energy. Corresponding with the image of rain as a symbol of the release of libido, we find the following passage. The mists fly, the clouds thunder, when he who is swollen with the milk of Rita is led upon the straightest path of Rita. The Araman, Mitra and Varun, 
He who transformeth the earth, fill the leathern sack, the clouds, in the womb of the lower atmosphere. It is Agni who, swollen with the milk of Rita, is likened here to the force of lightning that bursts forth from massed clouds heavy with rain. Here, Rita appears again as the actual source of energy, whence Agni is also born. This is explicitly mentioned in the Vedic hymns. Rita is also path, i.e. regulated process. With acclamations have they greeted the stream of Rita, which lay hidden by the birthplace of God, nigh unto his throne. There did he drink, when still divided he dwelt in the womb of the waters. This passage confirms what was just said about Rita as the source of libido, in which God dwells and whence he is brought forth in the sacred ceremonies. Agni is the positive appearance of hitherto latent libido. He is the accomplisher or fulfiller of Rita, its charioteer. See above. He harnesses the two long-maned red mares of Rita. He even holds Rita like a horse by the bridle. He brings the gods to mankind. He brings their force and their blessing. They represent definite psychological states in which the feeling and the energy of life flow greater freedom and joy where pent ice is broken. Nietzsche catches this state in that wonderful verse, Thou who with spear of flame dissolveth the ice of my soul, storming now she hasteneth towards the sea of her highest hopes. The following invocations are in harmony with this theme. Let the divine gates, the multipliers of Rita, be flung wide. Open the much desired gates that the gods may come forth. Let the night and morning, the young mothers of Rita, be seated together upon the ritual grass, etc. The analogy with the rising sun is unmistakable. Rita appears as the sun, since out of night and twilight is the new sun born. Open ye for our succour, O divine doors easy of access, ever more and more fill the sacrifice with blessedness, with prayers. We draw nigh unto night and morning, the multipliers of living power, the two young mothers of Rita. There is no need, I think, for further examples to show that the concept of Rita, like sun and wind, etc., is a libido symbol. Only the Rita concept is less concretistic and contains the abstract element of established direction and lawfulness, i.e. the determined and ordered path or process. Already, therefore, it is a philosophical libido symbol which can be directly compared with the Stoic concept of hymarmonine. With the Stoics, hymarmonine had, of course, the significance of creative primordial heat and at the same time a determined regulated process, hence also its meaning compulsion by the stars. It is self-evident that libido as a psychological energy concept corresponds with these attributes, since a process always proceeds from a higher potential to a lower. The energy concept includes the idea of a determined, directed process, io ipso. It's the same with the libido concept, which merely signifies the energy of the process of life. Its laws are the laws of vital energy, Libido as an energy concept is a quantitative formula for the phenomena of life, which are naturally of varying intensity. Like physical energy, libido passes through every conceivable transformation. We find ample evidence of this in the fantasies of the unconscious and the myths. These fantasies are primarily self-representations of the energy transformation process, which follow their natural and established laws, their determined way of evolution. 
This way signifies both the line or curve of the optimum of energetic discharge, as well as the corresponding result in work. Hence, this way is simply an expression of the flowing and self-manifesting energy. The way is Rita, the right way, the flow of vital energy or libido, the determined course upon which every renewing process is possible. This way is also destiny insofar as destiny is dependent upon our psychology. It is the way of our vocation and our law. It would be quite wrong to assert that such a name is merely naturalism, by which one means a complete surrender to one's instincts. An assumption is herewith involved that the instincts have a constant downward tendency, and that naturalism is a non-ethical reshoot upon an inclined plane. I have nothing against such an interpretation of naturalism, but I am bound to observe that the man who is left to his own devices and has therefore every opportunity for backsliding, as for instance the primitive, not only has a morality and a legislation, but one which in the severity of its demands is often considerably more exacting than our civilised morality. Whether for the primitive good and evil have value which differs from ours has nothing to do with this case. His naturalism leads to legalisation that is our chief point. Morality is no misconception conceived by an ambitious Moses upon Sinai, but something inherent in the laws of life and fashioned like a house or a ship or any other cultural instrument in the normal process of life. The natural flow of libido, this very middle path, involves a complete obedience to the fundamental laws of human nature, and there can positively be no higher moral principle than that harmony with the natural laws whose accord gives the libido the direction in which life's optimum lies. The optimum of life is not to be found upon the line of crude egoism, since man, whose fundamental makeup discerns an absolutely indispensable meaning in the happiness he brings to his neighbour, can never win his life's optimum upon the line of egoism. An unbridled craving for individual preeminence is equally unfitted to achieve this optimum, since the collective element is so strongly rooted in man that his yearning for fellowship destroys all pleasure in naked egoism. The optimum of life can be gained only by obedience to the tidal laws of the libido, by which systole alternates with distole, laws which provide happiness and the necessary limitations even setting the life tasks of the individual nature, without whose accomplishment life's optimum can never be achieved. If the attainment of this way consisted in mere surrender to instinct, which is what is really meant by the bewailer of naturalism, the profoundest philosophical speculation and the whole history of the human mind would have no sort of raison d'etre. Yet, as we study the unpanached philosophy, the expression grows on us that attainment of path is not just the simplest of tasks. Our Western air of superiority in the presence of Indian understanding is a part of our essential barbarism, for which any true perception of the quite extraordinary depth of those ideas and their amazing psychological accuracy is still but a remote possibility. In fact, we are still so uneducated that we actually need laws from without and a taskmaster or father above to show us what is good and right as a thing to do. It is because we are still so barbarous that faith in the laws of human nature and the human path appears a dangerous and non-ethical naturalism. Why is this? 
Because under the barbarism's thin skin of culture, the wildest beast lurks in readiness, amply justifying his fear. But the beast that is caged is not thereby conquered. There's no morality without freedom. When a barbarian loosens the animal within him, he is not free, but bound. Barbarism must first be vanquished before freedom can be won. Theoretically, this takes place whenever the individual perceives and feels the basic root and motive power of his own morality as an inherent element of his own nature and not as external prohibitions. But how else is man to attain this realization and insight but through the conflict of the opposites? The reconciling symbol in Chinese philosophy. The idea of a middle path that lies between the opposites is also found in China in the form of the Tao. The idea of the Tao is usually associated with the name of the philosopher Lao Tzu, born before Christ, 604. But this concept is older than the philosophy of Lao Tzu since it is bound up with certain ideas belonging to the ancient national religion of the Tao, the Celestial Way. This concept corresponds with the Vedic Rita. The meaning of Tao are as follows. Way, method, principle, nature force or life force, the regulated process of nature, the idea of the world, the primal cause of all phenomena the right, the good, the eternal, moral law. Some translators even translate Tayo as God. End of section 22. Recording by Benjamin John Herman. Section 23 of Psychological Types, or the Psychology of Individuation. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Avian X. Psychological Types, or The Psychology of Individuation, by Carl Gustav Jung. Translated by Helton Godwin Baines, 1882 to 1943. Chapter 5.3d, The Reconciling Symbol in Chinese Philosophy. The idea of a middle path that lies between the opposites is also to be found in China in the form of Tao. The idea of Tao is usually associated with the name of the philosopher Lao Tzu, born in 604 BC. But this concept is older than the philosophy of Lao Tzu, since it is bound up with certain ideas belonging to the ancient national religion of the Tao, the Celestial Way. This concept corresponds with the Vedic Ritta. The meanings of Tao are as follows. 1. Way. 2. Method. 3. Principle. 4. Nature force or life force. 5. The regulated processes of nature. 6. The idea of the world. 7. The primal cause of all phenomena. 8. The right. 9. The good. And 10. The eternal moral law. Some translators even translate Tao as God, not without a certain right, since Tao, like Ritta, has a certain admixture of concrete sustainability. I will give a few illustrations from the Tao Te Ching, the classical book of Lao Tzu. 1. I do not know whose son it, Tao, is. It seems to have existed before God. 2. A being there is, indefinable, imperfected, that existed before heaven and earth. How still it was formless, alone, unchanging, embracing all, and inexhaustible. It would seem to be the mother of all things. I know not its name, but I call it Tao. 3. In order to characterize its essential quality, Lao Tzu likens it to water. The blessing of water is shown in this. It doeth good to all and seeketh at once the lowliest place, which all men shun. It hath in it something of Tao. The idea of the energetic process could not surely be better expressed. And four, dwelling without desire, one perceiveth its essence, 
clinging to desire, one seeth only its outer form. The kinship with the basic Brahmanic ideas is unmistakable, which does not necessarily imply direct contact. Lao Tzu was an entirely original thinker, and the primordial image underlying both the Rita Brahman Atman and the Tao conceptions is as universal as man, appearing in every age and among all peoples, whether as a primitive energy concept, as a soul force, or however else it may be designated. 5. He who knoweth the eternal is comprehensive. Comprehensive, therefore just. Just, therefore a king. King, therefore celestial. Celestial, therefore in Tao. In Tao, therefore enduring. Without hurt, he suffereth the loss of the body. The knowledge of Tao has therefore the same redeeming and uplifting effect as the knowing of Brahman. Man becomes one with Tao, with the unending durée créatrice. Thus, to range this latest philosophical concept appropriately, by the side of its older kindred, since Tao is also the stream of time. 6. Tao is an irrational, hence a wholly inconceivable fact. Tao is essence, but unseizable, incomprehensible. 7. Tao is also non-existing. From it, the existence, all things under heaven have their source. But the being of this existing, one arose in its turn from it as the non-existing. Tao is hidden nameless. Clearly, Tao is an irrational union of the opposites, therefore a symbol which is and is not. 8. The spirit of the valley is immortal. It is called the deep feminine. The gateway of the deep feminine is called root of heaven and earth. Tao is the creative essence, as father begetting and as mother bringing forth. It is the beginning and end of all creatures. 9. He whose actions are in harmony with Tao, becometh one with Tao. Therefore the complete is freed from the opposites whose intimate connection and alternating appearance he is aware of. Thus in chapter 9 he says, To withdraw oneself is the celestial way. 10. Therefore is he, the complete one, inaccessible to intimacy, inaccessible to estrangement, inaccessible to profit inaccessible to injury, inaccessible to honor, inaccessible to disgrace. 11. Being one with Tao resembles the spiritual condition of a child. This is, admittedly, the psychological attitude which is an essential condition of the inheritance of the Christian kingdom of heaven, and this, in spite of all rational interpretations, is the central, irrational essence, the basic image and symbol whence proceeds the redeeming effect. The Christian symbol merely has a more social, civil character than the allied Eastern conceptions. These latter are more directly rooted in eternally existing dynamistic conceptions, such as the image of magical power, issuing from things and men, and on a higher level from gods, or a principle. 12. According to the ideas of the Taoistic religion, Tao is divided into a principal pair of opposites, yang and yin. Yang is warmth, light, masculinity. Yin is cold, darkness, femininity. Yang is also heaven, yin earth. From the yang force arises shen, the celestial portion of the human soul, and from the yin force arises kui, the earthly part. As a microcosm, man is also in some degree a reconciler of the pairs of opposites. Heaven, man, and earth form the three chief elements of the world, the sansai. This image is an altogether primordial idea, which we find elsewhere in similar forms, as for instance in the West African myth where the Abatala and the Odidua, the first parents, heaven and earth, lie together in the Kalabash, until the sun, man, arises between them. Hence, as a microcosm uniting in himself the world opposites, man corresponds with the irrational symbol which reconciles psychological antitheses. The division of the human soul into a Shen or Huan soul and a kuai or po soul is a great psychological truth. This Chinese presentation also suggests the familiar passage in Faust. Two souls, alas, within my bosom dwell, one would from the other sever. The one in full delight of love clings with clutching organs to the world, 
The other, mightily, from earthly dust, would mount on high to the ancestral fields. The existence of two mutually contending tendencies, both striving to drag man into extreme attitudes and entangle him in the world, whether upon the spiritual or material side, thereby setting him at variance with himself, demands the existence of a counterweight, which is just this irrational fact, Tao. Hence the believer's anxious effort to live in harmony with Tao, lest he fall into the conflict of the opposites. Since Tao is an irrational fact, it cannot be deliberately achieved, a fact which Lao Tzu frequently emphasizes. Wu Wei, another specifically Chinese concept, owes its particular significance to this condition. It signifies doing nothing, but as Allah pertinently explains, it should be rendered not doing, and not doing nothing. The rational desire to bring it about, which is the greatness and evil of our own epoch, does not lead to Tao. Thus, the aim of the Taoistic ethic sets out to find deliverance from that tension of the opposite which is an inherent property of the universe, by a return to Tao. In this connection, we must also remember the sage of Omi, Neketoju, the distinguished Japanese philosopher of the 17th century. Based upon the teaching of the Chuhai school, which had migrated from China, he established two principles, Ri and Ki. Ri is the world soul, Ki is world matter. Ri and Ki are, however, one and the same, inasmuch as they are attributes of God, hence only existing in and through him. God is their union. Similarly, the soul embraces Ri and Ki. Concerning God, Toju says, At the essence of the world, God enfoldeth the world, but at the same time he is also in our midst, and even in our bodies. For him, God is a universal self, while the individual self is heaven in us, an immaterial divine essence that is called Ryochi. Ryochi is God in us and dwells in each individual. It is the true self. For Toju distinguishes a true from a false self, the false self is an acquired personality arising from perverted beliefs. We might freely describe this false self as persona, i.e. that general idea of our nature which we have built up from experiencing our effect upon the world around and its effect upon us. The persona expresses the personality as it appears to oneself in one's world, but not what one is, to use the words of Schopenhauer. What one is is one's individual self, according to Toju, one's true self, or Ryochi. Ryochi is also called alone being, or alone knowing, clearly because it is a condition related to the essence of the self, a state existing beyond all personal judgments that are determined by outer experience. Toju conceives Ryochi as the summum bonum, as bliss. Brahman is Ananda, bliss. Ryochi is the light which pervades the world, a further parallel with Brahman, according to Inui. Ryochi is human love, immortal, all-knowing good. Evil comes from willing, the Schopenhauer. It is the self-regulating function, the mediator and reconciler of the pairs of opposites, Ri and Ki. It is in fullest harmony with the Indian idea of the ancient wise one who dwelleth in thy heart. Or, as Wang Yang Ming, the Chinese father of Japanese philosophy says, in every heart there dwelleth a sajin, sage. Only man will not steadfastly believe it, therefore hath the whole remained buried. From the point we have now reached, the primordial image which contributed to the solution of the problem in Wagner's Parsifal is no longer hard to understand. The suffering proceeds from the tension of the opposites, represented by the grail and the power of Klingzor, the latter consisting in the possession of the Holy Spear. Beneath the spell of Klingzor is Kundry, the instinctive nature-cleaving life force which Amfortus lacks. Parsifal delivers the libido from the state of restless compulsion, because in the first place he does not succumb to her power, but in the second because he himself is detached from the grail. Amfortus is with the grail, whereby he suffers because he lacks the other. Parsifal possesses not of either. He is Nirvanva, free from the opposites. Hence, he is also the deliverer, the bestower of healing and renewed life force, the reconciler of the opposites, i.e. the light celestial feminine of the grail, and the dark earthly masculine of the spear. The death of Kundry may be freely interpreted as the release of the libido from the nature-clinging undomesticated form, the form of the bull, compare above, which falls from her as a lifeless mold, 
while energy burst forth as newly streaming life in the glowing of the grail. Through his partly involuntary abstentation from the opposites, Parseval causes the damming up by which the new fall, i.e. the new manifestation of energy, is made possible. One might easily be misled by the unmistakably sexual language into a one-sided interpretation, by which the union of the spear and the vessel of the grail would merely signify a liberation of sexuality. That it is not merely a question of sexuality, the fate of Amfortus makes clear, since it was precisely his reshoot into a nature-bound brutish attitude which was the cause of his suffering and brought about the loss of his power. His seduction by Kundry has the value of a symbolic act, which would signify that it is not sexuality that deals such wounds so much as an attitude of nature-clinging compulsion, an irresolute yielding to biological temptation. This attitude is equivalent to the supremacy of the animal part of our psyche. The sacrificial wound that is destined for the beast strikes the man who is overcome by the beast, for the sake of man's further development. The fundamental problem, as I have already pointed out in my book Psychology of the Unconscious, is not sexuality per se, but the domestication of the libido, which concerns sexuality only insofar as it is one of the most important and most dangerous forms of libido expression. If, in the case of Amfortus and the union of the spear and grail, only the sexual problem is discerned, we reach an insoluble contradiction, since the thing that harms is also the remedy that heals. But only when we see the opposites as reconciled upon a higher plane is such a paradox either true or permissible. A realization, namely, that it is not a question of sexuality, either in this form or that, but purely a question of the attitude by which every activity, including the sexual, is regulated. Once again, I must stress my view that the practical problem of analytical psychology lies deeper than sexuality and its repression. Such a viewpoint is doubtless valuable in explaining that infantile and therefore morbid part of the soul, but as a principle for interpretation for the totality of the human soul, it is inadequate. What stands behind sexuality, or the instinct to power, is the attitude to sexuality and power. Insofar as attitude is not merely an intuitive phenomenon, i.e. unconscious and spontaneous, but also a conscious function, it is, in the main, one's view of life. Our views in regard to all problematical things are enormously influenced, sometimes consciously but more often unconsciously, by certain collective ideas which mold our mental atmosphere. These collective ideas are intimately bound up with the view of life or world philosophy of the past hundred or thousand years. Whether or not we are conscious of this dependence has nothing to do with the case, since we are influenced by these ideas through the very atmosphere we breathe. Such collective ideas have always a religious character, and a philosophical idea acquires a religious character only when it expresses a primordial image, i.e. a collective root image. The religious character of these ideas proceeds from the fact that they express the realities of collective unconscious, hence they also have the power of releasing the latent energies of the unconscious. The great problems of life, sexuality of course among others, are always related to the primordial images of the collective unconscious. These images are really balancing or compensating factors which correspond with the problems life presents in actuality. This is not to be marveled at since these images are deposits, representing the accumulated experience of thousands of years of struggle for adaptation and existence. Every great experience in life, every profound conflict, evokes the treasured wealth of these images and brings them to inner perception. As such, they become accessible to consciousness only in the presence of that degree of self-awareness and power of understanding, which enables a man also to think what he experiences, instead of just living it blindly. In the latter case, he actually lives the myth and the symbol without knowing it. End of chapter 5.3d, The Reconciling Symbol in Chinese Philosophy. Recording by Avian X. Section 24 of Psychological Types, or The Psychology of Individuation. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Vincent Moraldo. 
The service of God is the Christian principle which reconciles the opposites. With Buddhism, it is service of the self, self-development. While the principle of solution suggested by Goethe and Spittler is service of the soul, symbolized in the service of woman. Contained herein is the principle of modern individualism on the one hand, and on the other, a primitive polydemonism, which assigns not merely to every race, but to every tribe, every family, even to every individual, its own religious principle. The medieval material in Faust possesses its quite extraordinary importance, because it is actually a medieval element which stands at the cradle of modern individualism. Individualism seems to have begun with the service of woman, thereby affecting a most important reinforcement of man's soul as a psychological factor, since service of woman means service of the soul. This is nowhere more beautifully and perfectly expressed than in Dante's Divina Commedia. Dante is the spiritual knight of his lady. He undertakes the adventure of the upper and nether worlds for her sake, and in this heroic labor her image is exalted into that heavenly, mystical figure of the Mother of God, a figure in which its complete detachment from the object has become a personification of a purely psychological entity, i.e., that unconscious content whose personification I have termed the anima or soul. Canto 33 of the Paradiso contains this crowning of Dante's spiritual development in the prayer of St. Bernard. Quote, O Virgin Mother, daughter of thy Son, more lovely, more sublime than any creature, of the Lord of the Eternal Throne, the chosen goal, Thou hast so ennobled the nature of man, that he who created the highest good hath chosen in thee to become creature. End quote. Concerning Dante's development, we have verses 22 ff. Quote, he who appeared from the deepest gorge of the universe, who with ghostly art and being, from realm to realm probing and inquiring, passed, he entreateth with thee for thy strength that he may lift up his eyes and consecrate his vision to the highest grace. End quote. Verses 31 ff. Quote, may every cloud of his mortality be banished through thy prayer, unfolded now for him the highest bliss and joy eternal. End quote. Verses 37 ff. Quote, Let him withstand the earthly emotions. Behold, Beatrice, so many glorious ones, intercede for me with folded hands." End quote. The fact that Dante here speaks through the mouth of St. Bernard points to the transformation and exaltation of his own being. The same successive transformation is also seen in Faust, who ascends from Margaret to Helen, from Helen to the Mother of God. His nature is altered through repeated figurative deaths until he finally attains the highest goal as Dr. Marianus. As such, Faust utters his prayer to the Virgin Mother. Quote, Supreme and sovereign mistress of the world, in the azure outstretched dome of heaven, let me behold thy secret, the strong and tender motions of man's breast, that with holy passion of love ascend to thee, graciously approve. Unconquerable our courage burns under thy celestial guidance. Suddenly our passions cool in thine assuaging calm. O virgin in highest sense most pure, O mother worthy of all worship, our chosen queen equal with the gods. End quote. And, quote, Gaze upon her saving glance, all ye frail and penitent. With grace accept your holy fate, for when ye think ye prosper, better seemeth every wish to her service given, Virgin Mother, Sovereign Queen, Goddess ever gracious. End quote. In this connection, the significant symbol attributes of the Virgin in the Litany of Laredo must also be mentioned. Mater Amabilis translates to Thou Beloved Mother. Mater Admirabilis translates to Thou Wonderful Mother. Mater Boni Concili translates to Thou Mother of Good Counsel. Speculum 
Justadai translates to the mirror of justice. Sedis Sapiente translates to thou seat of wisdom. Casa Nostre Latite translates to thou source of our joy. Vas Spirituale translates to thou spiritual vessel. Vas Honorabile translates to thou venerable vessel. Vas Insigne Devotionis translates to thou surpassing the vessel of devotion. Rosa Mystica translates to thou mystical rose. Turis Davidica translates to thou tower of David. Turis Ibernia translates to thou tower of ivory. Domus Aurea translates to thou house of gold. Photoris Arca translates to thou ark of the covenant. Janua Coeli translates to thou gate of heaven. Stella Matutina translates to thou star of the morning parentheses missal romanum and parentheses these attributes show the functional importance of the image of the virgin mother they demonstrate how the soul image affects the conscious attitude namely a vessel of devotion as solid form as source of wisdom and renewed life in a most concise and comprehensive form we find this characteristic transition from the service of woman to the service of the soul in an early Christian writing, the shepherd of Hermas, who wrote about A.D. 140. This book, written in Greek, consists of a number of visions and revelations which symbolically represent the consolidation of the new faith. The book, long regarded as canonical, was nevertheless rejected by the Muratorian canon. It begins as follows, quote, The man who reared me, sold me to a certain Rhoda in Rome. After many years, I met with her again and began to love her like a sister. On a day, a little while after, I saw her bathing in the Tiber and gave her my hand and helped her out of the river. As I beheld her beauty, I had thought this in my heart. Happy would I be had I a wife of such beauty and such distinction. That was my sole wish and nothing more. End quote. This experience was the starting point for the visionary episode that followed. Hermas had apparently served Rhoda as a slave, then, as often happened, he obtained his freedom and subsequently encountered her again, when, probably as much from gratitude as from pleasure, a feeling of love was stirred in his heart, which, however, so far as he was aware, had merely the character of brotherly love. Hermas was a Christian, and moreover, as the text subsequently reveals, he was at the time already the father of a family. Circumstances which render the repression of the erotic element easily understandable. Yet the peculiar situation, doubtless provocative of many problems, was all the more favorable for bringing the erotic wish to consciousness. It is, in fact, quite clearly expressed in the thought that he would have liked Rhoda for a wife, although it is definitely confined to this unqualified appreciation, as Hermas is at pains to emphasize, since naturally the implied and more direct issue at once incurred a moral prohibition. It is abundantly clear from what follows that this repressed libido evoked a powerful transformation in his unconscious, for it imbued the soul image with life, thus bringing it to spontaneous efficacy. Let us now follow the text further. Quote, After a certain time, as I journeyed into Kume, praising God's creation in its immensity, beauty, and power, in my going I grew heavy with sleep, and a spirit caught me up, and led me away through a pathless region where a man may not go. For it was a place full of crevices and torn by water courses. I made my passage over the river and came upon even ground, where I threw myself upon my knees and prayed to God, confessing my sins. While I thus prayed, the heavens opened up, and I beheld that lady for whom I yearned, who greeted me from heaven and said, Hail to thee, Hermas. While my eyes dwelt upon her, I spake and said, Mistress, what dost thou there? And she answered, I was taken up in order to charge thee with thy sins before the Lord. I said unto her, Dost thou now accuse me? No, said she. Yet hearken now unto the words which I spoke unto thee. For God, who dwelleth in heaven, and hath created the existing out of the non-existing, and hath magnified it and brought it to increase for the sake of his holy church, is wroth with thee, because thou hast sinned against me. I answered and spake unto her, 
How have I sinned against thee? When and where spake I ever an evil word unto thee? Have I not looked upon thee as a goddess? Have I not ever treated thee like a sister? Wherefore, O lady, dost thou falsely charge me with such evil and unclean things? She smiled and said unto me, The desire of sin arose in thy heart. Or is it not indeed a sin in thine eyes for a just man to cherish a sinful desire in his heart? Verily, is it a sin? said she, and a great one. For the just man striveth after what is just. End quote. Solitary wanderings are, as we know, conducive to daydreaming and reverie. Probably Hermas, on his way to Kume, was pondering on his mistress. While thus engaged, the repressed erotic fantasy gradually withdrew his libido into the unconscious. Sleep overcame him as a result of this lowering of the intensity of consciousness, and he fell into a somnambulant or ecstatic state, which is merely a fantasy of great intensity that altogether captivates the conscious. It is significant that what comes to him is no erotic fantasy, but he is transported, as it were, to another land, represented in fantasy as the crossing of a river and a journey through a pathless country. The unconscious appears to him as an opposite or overworld in which events take place and men move about as in reality. His mistress appears before him not in an erotic fantasy, but in divine form, seeming to him like a goddess in the heavens. This fact indicates that the repressed erotic impression in the unconscious has activated the latent primordial image of the goddess, which is, in fact, the archetypal soul image. The erotic impression has evidently become united in the collective unconscious with those archaic residues which, from primordial time, have held the imprints of vivid impressions of woman's nature. Woman as mother, and woman as desirable maid. Such impressions have immense power, since they release forces both in the child and the man, which, in their irresistible and absolutely compelling nature, merit the attribute divine. The recognition of these forces as demonic powers can scarcely be due to moral repression, but rather to a self-regulation of the psychic organism which seeks by this orientation to protect itself from loss of equilibrium. For if, against the wholly overwhelming power of passion which casts a man unconditionally in the path of another, the psyche succeeds in erecting a counterposition, whereby, at the summit of passion, it severs the idol from the utterly desired object and forces the man to his knees before the divine image. It is thereby delivered him from the curse of the object's spell. He is restored again to himself. He is even forced upon himself, thus coming once more into his own way between gods and men and subject to his own laws. The awful dread which haunts the primitive, that dread of every impressive phenomenon which he at once senses as magic, as though things were charged with magical power, preserves him in a practical way against the most dreaded possibility, the loss of the soul, with its inevitable sequel of disease or death. The loss of a soul corresponds with the tearing loose of an essential part of one's nature. It is the disappearance and emancipation of a complex which therewith becomes a tyrannical usurper of consciousness, oppressing the whole man. It throws him out of his course, and constrains him to actions whose blind one-sidedness has self-destruction as its inevitable issue. The primitives are notoriously subject to such phenomena as running amok, berserker rage, possessions, and the like. An intuitive knowledge of the demonic character of this power supplies an effective guard, for such an insight at once deprives the object of its strongest spell, shifting its source to the world of daemons, i.e. to the unconscious, whence the force of passion actually springs. Exercising rites, whose aim is to bring back the soul and release the enchantment, also affects this backflow of libido into the unconscious. This mechanism is clearly effective in the case of Hermas, the transformation of Rhoda into the Divine Mistress deprives the actual object of her provocative and destructive power, and brings Hermas under the law of his own soul and its collective determinants. By virtue of his ability, he doubtless took an important share in the spiritual movements of his age. At that very time, his brother Pius, 
occupied the Episcopal See at Rome. Hermas, therefore, was called to collaborate in the great tasks of his time in a higher degree than he, as a former slave, may have consciously realized. No able mind of that time could for long have withstood the contemporary task of spreading Christianity unless the limitations and conditions of race naturally assigned to him another function in the great process of spiritual transformation. Just as external conditions of life constrain a man to social functions, the soul also contains collective determinants which constrain him to the socializing of opinions and convictions, through the conversion of a possible social trespass and a probable passional self-injury to the service of the soul, Hermas is guided to the accomplishment of a social task of a spiritual nature, which for that time was assuredly of no small importance. In order to fit him for this task, it is clearly necessary that his soul shall destroy the last possibility of an erotic bondage to the object. For this last possibility means dishonesty towards himself. That he may consciously forswear the erotic desire, Hermas merely demonstrates that it would be more agreeable to him if the erotic desire did not exist, but he gives no kind of evidence that he actually has no erotic intentions and fantasies. Therefore, his sovereign lady, the soul, mercilessly reveals to him the existence of his sin, thus releasing him from his sacred bondage to the object. As a vessel of devotion, she therewith receives that passion which was on the point of being fruitlessly lavished upon the object. The last vestige of this passion had to be eradicated in order that the contemporary task might be accomplished. This lay in the crying need of mankind for a severance from sensual bondage, i.e. the state of primitive participation mystique. To the man of that age, this subjection has become intolerable. Clearly, a differentiation of this spiritual function had to take place in order to re-establish the psychic equilibrium. Every one of those philosophical attempts to restore psychic poise or equanimity which largely emanated from the Stoic teaching, founded upon their rationalism. Reason can provide this desired equilibrium only to the man whose reason is already an organ of balance. But for how many individuals and at what period of history has this actually been the case? As a general rule, a man must also acquire the opposite of his own condition before he finds himself willy-nilly in the middle way. For the sake of mere reason, he can never forego the appealing sensuousness of the immediate situation. Against the power and temptation of the temporal, therefore he must set the joy of the internal, and against the passion of the sensual, the ecstasy of the spiritual. As real as the one is for him, must the other be compellingly effective. Through insight into the actual existence of his erotic desire, it is possible for Hermas to reach a realization of this metaphysical reality, which means that the soul image also acquires that sensual libido which has hitherto adhered to the concrete object. Henceforth, this libido bestows upon the image, the idol, that reality which from all time the sense object has exclusively claimed as its own. Thus, the soul is able to speak with effect and successfully enforce her claims. After the talk with Rhoda recorded above, her image vanishes and the heavens close. In her stead, there now appears an old woman in shining garments, who informs Hermas that his erotic desire is a sinful and foolish undertaking against a venerable spirit, but that God is wroth with him not so much on that account, but because he, Hermas, tolerates the sins of his family. In this adroit way, the libido is entirely withdrawn from the erotic wish and is directed in its next swing into the social task. An especial refinement lies in the fact that the soul has discarded the image of Rhoda and has taken on the aspect of an old woman, thus allowing the erotic element to recede as far as possible into the background. It is later revealed to Hermas that this old woman is the church, whereby the concrete and personal is dissolved into an abstraction and the ideal gains an actuality and a reality which it had never before possessed. Thereupon, the old woman reads to him from a mysterious book, directed in general against the heathen and apostates, 
but whose exact meaning he is unable to seize. Subsequently, we learn that the book contains a mission. Thus, the Sovereign Lady represents him with his task, which, as her knight, he needs must accomplish. The trial of virtue is also not lacking, for not long after, Hermas has a vision in which the old lady appears, promising to return about the fifth hour in order to explain the revelation. Whereupon Hermas betook himself into the country to the appointed place, where he found a couch of ivory set with a pillow and a cover of fine linen. Quote, As I beheld these things lying there, writes Hermas, I was sore amazed, and a quaking fell upon me, and my hair stood on end, and a dreadful fear befell me, because I was alone in that place. But when I came once more to myself, I remembered the glory of God and took new courage. I knelt down and again confessed my sins unto God, as I had done before. Then she drew near with six young men, the which also I had seen before, and stood beside me and listened while I prayed and confessed my sins unto God. And she touched me and said, Hermas, have done with all thy prayers and the reciting of thy sins. Pray also for righteousness, whereby thou mayest bear some of it with thee to thy house. And she raised me up by the hand, and led me to the couch, and said unto the young men, Go and build. And when the youths were gone, and we were alone, she said unto me, Sit thee here. I said unto her, Mistress, let the aged first be seated. She said, Do as I said unto thee, and be thou seated. But when I made as though to seat myself upon her right hand, she motioned me with a gesture of the hand to be seated upon her left. As I wondered thereat, and was troubled, that I might not sit on the right side, she said unto me, Why art thou grieved, Harmas? The seat upon the right is for those who are already well-pleasing to God, and have suffered for the name. But to thee there lacketh much before thou canst sit with them. Yet remain as heretofore in thy simplicity, and thou shalt surely sit with them. And thus shall it be for all who shall have accomplished the work which those wrought, and endured what they suffered. End quote. The erratic misunderstanding of the situation was indeed very possible for Hermas. The rendezvous has at once the feeling of a trysting place in a beautiful and sequestered spot, as he puts it. The rich couch waiting there is a fatal reminder of Eros, and makes the fear which overcomes Hermas at this spectacle seem very intelligible. Clearly he must vigorously combat the erotic association lest he fall into a profane mood. He certainly does not appear to have recognized the temptation, unless perhaps this recognition is taken as self-evident in the description of his dread, an honesty which was far more possible to a man of that time than to a man of today. For in that age, man was more nearly in touch with his whole nature than are we. Hence, he was all the more likely to have a direct perception of his natural reactions and to appreciate them correctly. In this case, his confession of sin may have aroused forthwith the perception of a profane feeling. In any case, the question arising at this juncture as to whether he shall sit on the right hand or the left leads to a moral reprimand at the hands of his mistress. In spite of the fact that signs coming from the left were regarded as favorable in the Roman auguries, the left side, both with the Greeks and the Romans, was on the whole inauspicious. Allusion to this is found in the double meaning of the word sinister. But the question here raised of right and left, as an immediately ensuing passage shows, has nothing to do with popular superstitions. It is clearly of biblical origins, referring to Matthew 25:33. Quote, he shall set the sheep on his right hand, but the goats on the left. End quote. Sheep, by virtue of their harmless and gentle nature, are an allegory for the good, while the unruly and salacious character of goats provides a suitable image of evil. His mistress, therefore, by assigning to him the seat on the left, figuratively reveals to him her understanding of his psychology. When Hermas has taken his seat upon the left, rather sadly, as he records, his sole mistress further reveals to him a visionary scene which unrolls itself before his eyes. He beholds how the youths, assisted by ten thousand other men, build a mighty tower whose stones fit one into the other without joints. This jointless tower, hence by its very nature of indestructible solidity, symbolizes the church, so Hermas understands. The mistress is the church, and so is the tower. In the attributes of the Loretian litany, we have already seen how the Virgin is characterized as Turis Davidica and Turis Eburnia, Tower of Ivory. 
it would seem as though identical or similar association were concerned here. The tower undoubtedly has the meaning of something steadfast and secure, suggesting the reference in Psalms 56, 4, quote, For thou hast been a shelter for me, and a strong tower from the enemy, end quote. A certain resemblance to the Tower of Babel can, I think, be excluded from our interpretation on the strength of a strong internal counter-evidence. Nonetheless, it may have chimed in, since Hermas, in company with every other thinking mind of that epoch, must have suffered much from the depressing spectacle of the ceaseless schisms and heretical strifes of the early church. Such an impression might also have provided the essential motive for the writing of this book, an interference to which we are all the more entitled by the fact that the revealed book is directed against heathens and apostates. That same confusion of tongues which frustrated the Tower of Babel almost completely dominated the Christian church in the first century, demanding desperate exertions on the part of the faithful to overcome the confusion. Since Christendom at that time was far from being one flock under one shepherd, it was only natural that Hermas longed to find the mighty shepherd. Psychological Types or The Psychology of Individuation by Carl Gustav Jung Translated by Helton Godwin Baines, 1882-1943 Section 24, Chapter 5.4 The Relativity of the Symbol A. The Service of Woman and the Service of the Soul Part 1 End of Section 24「Section 25 of Psychological Types, or the Psychology of Individuation. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Psychological Types, or the Psychology of Individuation, by Carl Gustav Jung. Translated by Helton Godwin Baines. Section 25. Chapter 5.4. The Service of Woman and the Service of the Soul, Part 2. Thonic craving, sensuality in all its manifold forms, with its eager hold upon the enticements of the world, and its incessant dissipation of psychic energy in the world's prodigal variety, is a crowning hindrance to the development of a coherent and purposive attitude. Hence, the elimination of this obstacle must have been the most important task of that time. It is therefore not surprising that in the poimen of Hermas, it is the vanquishing of this very obstacle that is unfolded before our eyes. We've already seen how the original erotic stimulus and the energy thereby released became translated into the personification of the unconscious complex, that is, the figure of Ecclesia, as the old woman, who, in her visionary appearances, demonstrates the spontaneity of the underlying complex. We learn, moreover, at this point, that the old woman, the church, becomes the tower, as it were, since the tower is also the church. This transition is unexpected, for the connection between the tower and the old woman is not immediately evident. The attributes of the Virgin in the Lauretian litany, however, will help us upon the right track, because there we find, as already mentioned, the attribute tower associated with the Virgin Mother. This attribute has its source in the Song of Songs, chapter 4, verse 4. Sicuturus David, column tuum, que edificata est cum pro pugnaculis. Thy neck is like the Tower of David, builded for an armory. And again, in chapter 7, verse 4, column tuum sicuturus eburnia. Thy neck is as a tower of ivory. Similarly, in chapter 8, verse 10, igumurus et ubera Mia Sicuturis, I am a wall, and my breasts like towers. The Song of Songs, as is well known, was originally a secular love poem, perhaps a wedding song, which was actually denied canonical recognition by Jewish scholars until quite recently. Mystical interpretation, however, always loved to conceive the bride as Israel and the bridegroom as Jehovah, and indeed from a right instinct, since the aim of this conception is a translation of the erotic emotion into a national relationship with God. From the same motives, Christianity also possessed itself of the Song of Songs in order to conceive the bridegroom as Christ and the bride as the Church. 
To the psychology of the Middle Ages, this analogy had an extraordinary appeal, and it inspired the perfectly frank Christian eroticism of medieval mysticism, of which Mechtild von Magdeburg is one of the most shining examples. In this spirit was the Lauretian litany conceived. It derives certain attributes of the Virgin directly from the Song of Songs. We've already shown this in connection with the tower symbol. The rose is already employed by the Greek fathers as an attribute of Mary. So, too, is the lily. These are also related to the Song of Songs. Chapter 2, verse 1. Ego flos campi et lilium convalium. Sicut lilium inter spinas, sic amica mia inter filius. I am the rose of Sharon, and the lily of the valleys. As the lily among the thorns, so is my love among the daughters. An image much used in the medieval hymns to Mary is the enclosed garden from the Song of Songs, chapter 4, verse 12. Hortus conclusus, soro mia sponsa. A garden enclosed is my sister, my spouse. And the sealed fountain from Song of Songs, chapter 4, verse 12, fon signitus, a spring shut up, a fountain sealed. The unmistakably erotic nature of this simile in the Song of Songs is explicitly accepted as such by the fathers. Thus, for example, St. Ambrosius interprets the hortus conclusus as virginity. In the same way, St. Ambrosius compares Mary with Moses' basket of rushes. Per fiscalem serpium, bieta vergo designata est, mater ergo fiscalem serpium, in qua Moses ponibatur, preparavit qua sapientia dei, que est filius dei, Bieta Mariam Virginim Elegit Utero Hominim, qui per unitatem personae conjugaritur formavit. Like a basket of rushes is the Blessed Virgin designated. Therefore the mother prepared the basket in which Moses was laid, because the wisdom of God, which is the Son of God, chose the Blessed Virgin Mary, in whose womb he fashioned himself man, and with whom, by unity of person, he became united. St. Augustine employs the simile, frequently used later, of the thalamus, bridal chamber, for Mary, again with an express implication of the anatomical meaning. Elegit sibi thalamum castum, ubi conjugator sponsis sponsae. He chose for himself the chaste bridal chamber, where, as spouse, he could be joined to spouse, and processit de thalamo suo, id ist de utero virginale. He issued forth out of the bridal chamber, that is, from the virginal womb. The interpretation of vas as uterus may accordingly be taken as certain when, parallel with the just quoted passage from St. Augustine, we have St. Ambrosius saying, Non de terra, sed de quello vas sibi hoc, per quod descenderet, elegit et sacravit templum pudoris. Not of earth, but of heaven, did he choose this vessel for himself, through which he should descend and sanctify the temple of shame. Similarly with the Greek fathers, the designation, skuos, is not infrequent. Here, too, the derivation from the erotic allegory of the Song of Songs is not improbable, for, although the designation vas does not appear in the Vulgate text, we come upon the image of the goblet and of drinking, umbilicus tuis, crater tunatalis, nunquam indigus poculis, venter tuis sicut acervis tritisi, valitis lilius. Thy navel is like a round goblet, wherein no mingled wine is wanting. Thy belly is like a heap of wheat set about with lilies. The Song of Songs, chapter 7, verse 2. Parallel with the meaning of the first sentence, we find Mary compared with the cruise of oil of the widow of Sarepta in the Meisterlieder of the Colmar Manuscript. In translation, Sarepta in the Sidonian land, whither Elias was sent to a widow who should nourish him. My body is meetly compared with hers, for God sent the prophet unto me to change for us our time of famine. Parallel with the second sentence, St. Ambrosius says, In quo virginis utero, simul acervis tritisi, et lili flores gratia germanibat, quoniam et granum tritisi generabat et lilum, and so forth. In the womb of the virgin, grace increased like a heap of wheat, 
and the flowers of the lily, just as it also generated the grain of wheat and the lily. Very remote passages are also enlisted by Catholic authorities in the quest of this vessel symbolism, as, for instance, the Song of Songs, chapter 1, verse 1, Osculator me, osculo ora sui, qua meliora sunt ubera tua vino. Let him kiss me with the kisses of his mouth, for thy love is better than wine. Note, what is translated as love is literally breasts. And even from the book of Exodus, chapter 16, verse 33, And Moses said unto Aaron, Take a pot, and put an omer full of manna therein, and lay it up before the Lord, to be kept for your generations. These artificial associations tell against, rather than for, the biblical origin of the vessel symbolism. In favor of the possibility of an extra-biblical origin, we have the undeniable fact that the medieval hymn to Mary boldly borrows its similes from everywhere, and practically everything that is any way precious is associated with the Virgin. The fact that the vessel symbol is certainly very ancient, it springs from the period of the 3rd and 4th centuries, does not argue against its worldly origin, since even the fathers inclined towards extra-biblical, heathenish, similes, for, as for instance, Tertullian, St. Augustine, and others, who compared the virgin with the earth still undefiled and the unplowed field, certainly not without an obvious side-glance towards Corre of the mysteries. Such comparisons were molded upon pagan models, just as Cumont has shown in the early medieval ecclesiastical book illustration, in the case of Elijah's ascension into heaven, which holds closely to an antique Mithraic prototype. Its usages innumerable, of which not the least is the translation of Christ's birth to the Natalis Solis Invicti, birthday of the invincible son, the church followed the pagan model. Thus, St. Hieronymus compares the Virgin with the Son as the mother of light. These designations of an extra-biblical nature can have had their source only in the pagan conceptions still current at that time. It is therefore only just, when considering the vessel symbol, to call to mind the well-known and widely spread Gnostic vessel symbolism of that time. A great number of contemporary gems have been preserved which bear the symbol of a vessel, or cruise, with the remarkable winged bands, at once recalling the uterus with the ligamenta lata. This vessel, according to matter, is termed the vase of sin, in contrast with the hymn to Mary, in which the virgin is extolled as vas virtutum. King, in The Gnostics and Their Remains, rejects such an idea as arbitrary, and agrees with Kohler's view that the cameo image, principally Egyptian, refers to the pitcher of the Persian wheel which pumps the Nile water over the fields, and that this also explains the peculiar bands which clearly served for fastening the pitcher to the wheel. The fertilizing activity of the pitcher was, as King notes, expressed in antique phraseology as the impregnation of Isis by the seed of Osiris. One frequently finds upon the vessel a winnowing basket, probably with reference to the Mystica Vanus Yaki, the mystical winnowing basket of Yakos, or Lichnon, the figurative birthplace of the grain of wheat and symbol of the god of fertility. There used to be a Greek marriage ceremony in which a winnowing basket filled with fruit was laid upon the head of the bride, a manifest fertility charm. This conception approaches the ancient Egyptian idea that everything originated from the primeval water, Nu or Nut, which is identified either with the Nile or the ocean. Nu is written with three pots, three watermarks, and the sign of heaven. In a hymn to Tan Tenen, we find, quote, Maker of grain, which cometh forth from him in his name, knew the aged, who maketh the water appear on the mountains, to give life unto man and woman. End quote. Sir Wallace Budge drew my attention to the fact that the uterus symbolism also exists today in the southern Egyptian hinterland in the form of rain and fertility charms. Occasionally, it still happens that the natives in the bush kill a woman and take out her uterus in order to make use of this organ in magical rites. When one bears in mind how powerfully the fathers of the Church were influenced by Gnostic ideas, in spite of the strongest resistance to such heresies, it is not unthinkable that in this very symbolism of the vessel, a pagan relic which proved adaptable to Christianity should have crept in. All the more easily, in fact, since the virgin worship is itself a vestige of paganism, by which the Christian Church secured the entail of the Magna Mater, 
Isis, and others. The image of the Vas Sapiente also recalls a Gnostic prototype, that is to say, Sophia, an immensely significant symbol for the Gnosis. I have lingered rather longer upon the vessel symbolism than my readers might have expected. I have done this, however, for a definite reason, because, to my mind, this legend of the Grail, so essentially characteristic of the early Middle Ages, contains considerable psychological enlightenment in its relation to the service of woman. The central religious idea of this infinitely varied legendary material is the holy vessel, which, as everyone must see, is a thoroughly non-Christian image whose origin is to be sought in other than canonical sources. On the strength of the foregoing arguments, I believe it to be a genuine piece of the Gnosis, which either survived the rooting out of heresies by means of secret tradition, or owed its resurrection to an unconscious reaction against the dominion of official Christianity. The survival, or unconscious revivification, of the vessel symbol indicates a strengthening of the feminine principle in the masculine psychology of that time. This symbolization, by means of a mysterious image, must be interpreted as a spiritualizing of the erotic motive evoked by the service of woman. But the spiritual transformation always means the holding back of a sum of libido, which would otherwise be immediately squandered in sexuality. Experience shows that, when the sum of libido is thus retained, one part of it flows into the spiritualized expression, while the remainder sinks into the unconscious, where it affects a certain activation of corresponding images, of which this vessel symbolism is the expression. The symbol lives through the holding back of certain libido forms, and then, in its turn, becomes an effective control of these libido tendencies. The dissolution of the symbol is synonymous with a dispersal of libido along the immediate path, or at least with an almost irresistible urge towards direct application. But the living symbol exercises this peril. A symbol loses its magical, or, if one prefers it, its redeeming power, as soon as its dissolubility is recognized. An effective symbol, therefore, must have a nature that is unimpeachable. It must be the best possible expression of the existing world philosophy, a container of meaning which cannot be surpassed. Its form must also be sufficiently remote from comprehension as to frustrate every attempt of the critical intellect to give any satisfactory account of it. And finally, its ascetic appearance must have such a convincing appeal to feeling that no sort of argument can be raised against it on that score. For a certain period, the grail symbol clearly fulfilled these demands, and to this circumstance its living efficacy was due, which, as the example of Wagner shows, is even today not exhausted, although our age and our psychology are urgent for its solution. Official Christianity, therefore, absorbs certain Gnostic elements which were manifesting themselves in the psychology of the service of woman, and found a place for them in an intensified worship of Mary. From an abundance of equally interesting material, I have selected the Loretian Litany as a familiar example of this assimilation process. This assimilation into the general Christian symbol dealt a death blow to the service of woman, which was really a swelling bud in the process of soul culture for man. His soul, which expressed itself in the image of the chosen mistress, lost its individual expression in this translation into the general symbol. Consequently, the possibility of an individual differentiation was also lost. It was inevitably repressed by the collective expression. Such deprivations always tend to have bad results, and in this case they soon became apparent. For, insofar as the soul relation to woman was expressed in the collective virgin worship, the image of woman lost a value to which human nature has a certain natural claim. This value, for which only individual choice can provide a natural expression, relapses into the unconscious when the individual is replaced by a collective expression. In the unconscious, the image of woman now receives an energetic value which in its turn activates certain infantile archaic dominance. The relative depreciation of the real woman is thus compensated by demonic impulses since all unconscious contents, insofar as they are activated by split-off sums of libido, appear projected upon the object. In a certain sense, man loves woman less as a result of this relative depreciation. Hence, she appears as a persecutor 
that is, a witch. Thus the delusion about witches, that ineradicable blot upon the later Middle Ages, developed along with, and indeed as a result of, the intensified worship of the Virgin. But this was not the only consequence. Through the splitting off and repression of an important progressive tendency, a certain general activation of the unconscious came about. This activation could find no satisfying outlet in the general Christian symbol, since adequate expression at once demands individual forms of expression. Thus the way was paved for heresies and schisms, against which a conscious Christian orientation must fanatically defend itself. The frenzy of the Inquisition was the product of overcompensated doubt, which came crowding up from the unconscious, and its final result was one of the greatest schisms of the Church, that is to say, the Reformation. From this rather lengthy discussion, the following insight is gained. We set out from that vision of Hermas, in which he had shown how a tower was to be built. The old woman, who had at first been interpreted as the Church, now explains that the tower is the symbol of the Church, whereby her significance is transferred to the tower, with which the further text of the poemen is wholly taken up. Henceforth, his principal concern is with the tower, no longer with the old woman, and least of all with the real Rhoda. The detachment of the libido from the real object, its translation into the symbol and conversion into a symbolic function, is thus completed. Henceforth, the idea of a universal and undivided church, expressed in the symbol of a jointless and immovable tower, becomes an unshakable reality in the mind of Hermas. There is a displacement of libido away from the object into the subject, whereby the unconscious images are activated. These images are archaic forms of expression which become symbols and appear in their turn as equivalents for relatively depreciated objects. This process is, in any case, as old as mankind. Symbols appear among the relics of prehistoric man, just as they abound among the lowest living types of today. Clearly, therefore, a biological function of supreme importance must also be concerned in this symbol-forming process. Since the symbol can come to life only at the expense of a relative depreciation of the object, it follows that its purpose is also concerned with object depreciation. If the object had an unconditional value, it would also be absolutely determining for the subject, thereby entirely prohibiting all subjective freedom of action, since even a relative freedom could no longer exist in the presence of unconditional determination by the object. The condition of absolute relatedness to the object is synonymous with a complete externalization of the process of consciousness, that is, with an identification of subject and object, whereby every possibility of cognition is destroyed. In attenuated form, this condition still exists today among the primitives, the so-called projections, that are familiar enough in our analytical practice, are also mere residua of this original identity of subject and object. The prohibition and exclusion of all cognition and conscious experience, which results from such a state, means a considerable sacrifice of the power of adaptation, and this weights the scales heavily against man, who is already handicapped by his natural defenselessness and by a progeny which for many years has a relative inferiority to that of other animals. But the cognitionless state also means a dangerous inferiority from the standpoint of affectivity, because an identity of feeling with the object possesses the following disadvantages. Firstly, any object whatsoever can affect the subject to any degree, and secondly, any sort of affect on the part of the subject also immediately compromises and violates the object. An episode from the life of a bushman may illustrate what I mean. A bushman had a little son, upon whom he lavished the characteristic doting fondness of the primitives. It is obvious that, psychologically, such a love is wholly autoerotic, that is, the subject loves himself in the object. In a sense, the object serves as an erotic mirror. One day the bushman came home in a rage. He had been fishing and had caught nothing. As usual, the little fellow ran eagerly to meet him. But the father seized him and wrung his neck upon the spot. Subsequently, of course, he mourned for the dead boy with the same abandon and lack of comprehension as had before made him strangle him. This case is a good example of the identity of the object with the affect of the moment. Clearly, such a mentality is a very serious hindrance to every protective organization of the tribe. From the standpoint of the propagation and extension of the species, it is an unfavorable factor. 
Hence, in a species with strong vitality, it must be repressed and transformed. This is the purpose the symbol serves, and for this end it came into being, since it withdraws a certain sum of libido from the object, which is thereby relatively depreciated, bestowing the libido surplus upon the subject. But this surplus operates within the unconscious of the subject, who now finds himself between an inner and an outer determinant, whence arises the possibility of choice and a relative subjective freedom. The symbol is always derived from archaic residues, or imprints, engraven on the very stem of the race, about whose age and origin one can speculate much, although nothing definite can be determined. It would certainly be quite wrong to look for personal sources for the source of the symbol, as, for instance, repressed sexuality. At best, such a repression could only furnish the libido sum which activates the archaic imprint. The imprint, engram, corresponds with a functional inheritance whose existence is not contingent upon ordinary sexual repression, but proceeds from instinct differentiation in general. Differentiation of instinct is an essential biological measure. It is not something peculiar to the human species, for it finds an even more dramatic manifestation in the sexual deprivation of the working bee. In the foregoing instances of the vessel symbol, I have demonstrated the source of the symbol in archaic ideas. Since we find the primitive notion of the uterus at the root of this symbol, a similar origin might be surmised in connection with the tower symbol. The tower may well belong to that category of symbols, fundamentally phallic, in which the history of symbols is so rich. It is hardly to be wondered at that the moment which reveals to Hermas the alluring couch, thus demanding the repression of erotic fantasy, should also evoke a phallic symbol, which presumably corresponds with erection. We saw that other symbolic attributes of the Virgin Church have also an undoubted erotic origin, already confirmed as such by their derivation from the Song of Songs, and moreover expressly so interpreted by the Fathers. The tower symbol of the Loretian litany springs from the same source and may, therefore, have a similar root meaning. The attribute ivory, given to the tower, is doubtless of an erotic nature, since it refers to the tint and texture of skin. In the Song of Songs, chapter 5, verse 14, his belly is as bright ivory. But the tower itself is also found in an unmistakably erotic connection in the Song of Songs, chapter 8, verse 10. I am a wall, and my breasts like towers which surely refers to the prominence of the breasts with their full and elastic consistency, as in the similar passage, his legs are as pillars of marble, chapter 5, verse 15. In further unison we find, thy neck is as a tower of ivory, and thy nose is as the tower of Lebanon, chapter 7, verse 5, an obvious allusion to something slender and projecting. These attributes originate in tactile and organic sensations, which are transferred into the object. Just as a gloomy mood seems gray, and a joyous one bright and colored, the sense of touch is likewise under the influence of subjective sexual sensations, in this case the sensation of erection, whose quality is transferred to the object. The erotic psychology of the Song of Songs effects an enhancement of value in the object by directing upon it the images awakened in the subject. Ecclesiastical psychology employs these same images in order to pilot the libido upon the figurative object, while the psychology of Hermas raised the unconscious awakening image to an aim in itself, wherein to embody ideas which held a supreme importance for the mentality of that time, namely the consolidation and organization of the newly won Christian attitude and view of life. End of section 25「Section 26 of Psychological Types, or The Psychology of Individuation. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Olivia. Psychological Types, or The Psychology of Individuation by Carl Gustav Jung. Translated by Helton Godwin Baines. Section 26, Chapter 5.4b. The Relativity of the Idea of God in Meister Eckhart, Part 1. The process which Hermas passed through represents on a small scale what took place in early medieval psychology, namely, a new revelation of woman and the flowering of the feminine grail symbol. Hermas saw Rhoda in a new light, while the sum of libido thereby released 
became unconsciously transformed into the accomplishments of the social task of his time. It is, I think, characteristic of our psychology that the present epoch was, as it were, ushered in by two minds who were destined to have immense influence upon the hearts and minds of the younger generation. Wagner, the advocate of love, who in his music sounds the whole scale of feeling from Tristan down to incestuous passion, and from Tristan up to the loftiest spirituality of the grail, and Nietzsche, the advocate of power and of the victorious will of the individuality. In his last and loftiest utterance, Wagner took hold of the grail legend, as Goethe selected Dante, while Nietzsche chose the image of a lordly caste and a lordly morality, an image which had found its embodiment in many a fair-haired, heroic, and knightly figure of the Middle Ages. Wagner breaks the bounds that stifle love, while Nietzsche shatters the tables of value that cramp the individuality. They both strive after similar goals, while at the same time creating irremediable discord. For, where love is, individual power can never prevail, while the dominating power of the individual precludes the reign of love. The fact that three of the greatest of German minds should fasten upon early medieval psychology in their most important works is, in my view, proof enough that there is still an unanswered problem surviving from that age. It may be well, therefore, to try and gain a nearer view of this question. For I have a strong impression that the mysterious something which sprang to life in certain knightly orders of that time, the Templars, for instance, and which seems to have found its expression in the legend of the Grail, may possibly contain a shoot or bud of a new orientation to life, in other words, a new symbol. The non-Christian or Gnostic character of the Grail symbol takes us back to those early Christian heresies those almost grandiose foundations which conceal so great an abundance of daring and brilliant ideas. Now the Gnosis displays unconscious psychology in full flower, perhaps in an almost perverse luxuriance. It reveals, therefore, that very element which most stoutly resists the regula fidei, that Promethean and creative spirit which will submit only to the soul and to no collective ruling. Although in a crude form, we find in the Gnosis that belief in the power of individual revelation and of individual discernment, which was absent in the later centuries. This belief had its source in that proud feeling of individual relationship with God, which is subject to no human statute, and which may even constrain the gods by the sheer might of understanding. Within the Gnosis lay the beginning of that way which led to the intuitions of German mysticism with their immense psychological significance, which was actually in its flower at the time of which we are speaking. The focusing of the question now before us immediately brings to our mind the greatest thinker of that time, Meister Eckhart. Just as signs of a new orientation became perceptible in chivalry, so in Eckhart new thoughts confront us thoughts belonging to that same psychic orientation which prompted Dante to follow the image of Beatrice into the underworld of the unconscious, and which inspired the singers who sang the rune of the grail. Nothing is known, unfortunately, of Eckhart's personal life which could shed light upon the way which led him to his knowledge of the soul, but it is with a deep sense of contemplation that he observes in his discourse upon repentance, and still today one findeth rarely that people come to great things without they first go somewhat astray. This permits us to conclude that he wrote from personal experience. Strangely appealing is Eckhart's feeling of the inner relation with God when contrasted with the Christian feeling of sinfulness. We feel ourselves transported into the atmosphere of the Upanishads. A quite extraordinary enhancement of the soul's value must have taken place in Eckhart, that is, a magnified sense of his own inner being that enabled him to rise to a, so to speak, purely psychological, hence relative, conception of God and of his relation with man. The discovery and circumstantial formulation of the relativity of God to man and his soul is, in my view, one of the most important steps upon the way to a psychological understanding of the religious phenomenon. It is the dawning possibility of a liberation of the religious function from the stifling limitations of intellectual criticism, though this criticism has, of course, an equal right to existence. We now come to the real task of this chapter, namely the discussion of the relativity of the symbol. To my mind, the relativity of God denotes a point of view which ceases to regard God as an absolute, that is, removed from the human subject and existing outside all human conditions, but as, in a certain sense, dependent upon the human subject. 
It also involves the existence of a reciprocal and indispensable relation between man and God, whereby man is not merely regarded as a function of God, but God also becomes a psychological function of man. To our analytical psychology, which from the human standpoint must be regarded as an empirical science, the image of God is the symbolic expression of a certain psychological state or function which has the character of absolute superiority to the conscious will of the subject. Hence, it can enforce or bring about a standard of accomplishment that would be unattainable to conscious effort. This overwhelming impulse, insofar as the divine function is manifested in action, or this inspiration that transcends all conscious understanding, proceeds from a heaping up of energy in the unconscious. This libido accumulation animates images which the collective unconscious contains as latent possibilities. Here is the source of the god Imagio, that imprint which from the beginning of time has been the collective expression of the most powerful and absolute operation of unconscious libido concentration upon consciousness. Hence, for our psychology, which as a science must confine itself to the empirical within the limits set by our cognition, God is not even relative but a function of the unconscious, namely the manifestation of a split-off sum of libido, which has activated the god Imagio. To the orthodox view, God is, of course, absolute, that is, existing in himself. Such a conception implies a complete severance from the unconscious, which means, psychologically, a complete unawareness of the fact that the divine effect springs from one's own inner self. But the standpoint of the relativity of God signifies that a not inconsiderable part of the unconscious processes is discerned, at least by inference, as a psychological content. Such an insight, of course, can only take place when the soul is granted a more than ordinary attention, when, in fact, the unconscious contents are withdrawn from their projections into objects, and a certain awareness is granted them, the contents, so that they now appear as belonging to and conditioned by the subject. This was the case with the mystics, not that this was the first appearance of the idea of the relativity of God in general, for there exists, both naturally and fundamentally, a relativity of God among the primitives, Almost universally, on the lower human levels, the idea of God has a purely dynamic character. That is, God is a divine force, related to health, to the soul, to medicine, to riches, to the chief, a force which certain procedures can procure and turn to the making of things essential to the life and health of man, as also upon occasion to the production of magical and malevolent effects. The primitive feels this force as much outside him as within, that is, it is just as much his own life force as it is the medicine in his amulet or the influence emanating from his chief. This is the first demonstrable conception of a permeating and imbuing spiritual force. Psychologically, the power of the fetish or the prestige of the medicine man is an unconscious subjective evaluation of these objects. Fundamentally, therefore, it is a question of the libido, which is present in the subject's unconscious and is perceived in the object because whenever unconscious contents are activated, they appear projected. The relativity of God of medieval mysticism is, therefore, a harking back to a primitive condition. Whereas the kindred Eastern conceptions of the individual and supra-individual Atman are not so much a regression to the primitive as a constantly unfolding development away from the primitive, in harmony with the Eastern way, though still retaining principles already clearly present and effective among the primitives, this harking back to the primitive is not at all surprising, in view of the fact that every vital form of religion, either in its ceremonials or its ethics, embodies one or more primitive tendency, whence indeed proceed these mysterious instinctive forces which promote the perfecting of human nature in the religious process. This recourse to, or interrupted connection with, the primitive, as in the Indian, means a contact with Mother Earth, the original source of all power. Every point of view which is differentiated to rational or ethical standards must sense these instinctive forces as impure. But life itself flows from clear and muddy springs. Hence, every too great purity also lacks vitality. Every renewal of life emerges through the muddy towards the clear. A constant effort towards clarity and differentiation involves a proportionate lack of vital intensity because of the very exclusion of muddy elements. The process of development needs the muddy as well as the clear. This was clearly perceived by the great relativist Meister Eckhart when he says, Therefore suffereth God willingly the mischief of sins, and much hath he suffered. 
Moreover, those hath he burdened most, whom he chose to lead to great things. Behold, who were more near and dear to our Lord than the apostles? None there was who fell not into deadly sins. All were mortal sinners. Thus hath he shown in the old and new covenants, which he made, with those who afterwards he loved the most. And still today, one rarely findeth people coming to great things, who first go not somewhat astray both on account of his psychological penetration and his religious feeling and thought meister eckhart is the most brilliant representative of that critical movement in the church at the close of the thirteenth century i would like therefore to cite a few of his sayings which throw light upon his relativistic conception of god for man is truly god and god truly man again whereas who holdeth not god as such an inner possession but with every means must fetch him from without either in this thing or in that where he seeketh him insufficiently with every manner of deeds people or places verily such a man hath him not and easily something cometh to trouble him and it is not only evil company which troubleth him but also the good not only the street but also the church not only evil words and deeds but even the good for the hindrance lieth within himself to him god hath not yet become the world were he that to him then he would feel at ease in all places and secure with all people always possessing god this passage is of special psychological interest, for it shows a trait of the primitive idea of God which we sketched above. With every means fetching God from without is synonymous with the primitive view that the tondai is to be procured from without. With Eckhart, of course, it may be merely a figure of speech through which the original meaning still glimmers. In any case, Eckhart clearly understands God as a psychological value. This is proved by the following sentence. Who fetcheth God from without troubled is he by objects for when god is without he is necessarily projected on to the object whereby the object acquires an excessive valuation but whenever this is the case the object also gains a supreme influence over the subject holding him in a certain slavish dependence eckhart is evidently referring to this familiar subjection to the object which makes the world appear in the role of god that is as an absolutely determining factor hence for such a one god has not yet become the world says eckhart since for him the world has taken the place of god such a man has not succeeded in detaching and introverting the surplus value from the object thus converting it into an inner possession were he to possess it in himself he would have god the same value continually as object or world whereby god would become the world in the same portion eckhart says whoever is right in his feeling findeth things fitting in all places and with all people whereas he that is wrong findeth nothing right wherever or with whom he may be for a man of right feeling hath god with him a man who has this value in himself is everywhere well disposed he is not dependent upon objects that is he is not forever needing and hoping from the object what he himself lacks it should be sufficiently evident from these considerations that for eckhart god is a psychological or more accurately psychodynamic state again must ye understand the soul as the kingdom of god for the soul is of like nature with divinity all that was here spoken of god's kingdom so far as god himself is this kingdom may be truly said in like manner of the soul all things must come to pass through him saith st john this must be understood of the soul since the soul is the all such it is as an image of god but such it is also the kingdom of god so deeply saith one master is god in the soul that his whole divine nature resteth upon it that god is in the soul is a higher estate than that the soul is in god when the soul is in god it is not blessed therein but blessed indeed is the soul which god inhabits of this be ye certain god is himself blessed in the soul the soul that ambiguous and variously interpreted concept corresponds historically with a psychological content to which a certain independence must belong within the limits of consciousness for if this were not the case man would never have arrived at the notion of ascribing an independent nature to the soul as though it were an objectively discernible thing like every autonomous complex it must be a content to which spontaneity and hence a partial unconsciousness necessarily belongs the primitive as we know usually possesses several souls that is several autonomous complexes with a considerable degree of independence which gives them the appearance of having a separate existence as in certain mental disorders ascending to the higher human levels we find the number of souls decreasing until the highest level of culture shows us the soul quite dispersed in the consciousness of all psychic activities 
and only granted a further existence as a term for the totality of psychic processes. This absorption of the soul into consciousness is just as much a characteristic of Eastern as it is of Western culture. In Buddhism, everything is dissolved into consciousness. Even the samskaras, the unconscious constructive forces, must be possessed and transformed through religious self-development. To this quite universal historic development of the soul concept, the view of analytical psychology stands definitely opposed, since the analytical idea of the soul does not coincide with the totality of psychic functions. On the one hand, we define the soul as the relation to the unconscious, while, on the other, it is the personification of unconscious contents. From the standpoint of culture, it may seem deplorable that personification of unconscious contents still exist, such as an education and differentiated consciousness might well lament the existence of contents that are still unconscious. Since, however, analytical psychology is concerned with man as he is, and not with the hypothetical man which certain views would like to make him, we have to admit that those same phenomena which persuade the primitive to speak of souls are in fact constantly happening, just as there are still innumerable people among civilized European nations who believe in ghosts. In spite of our carefully wrought theory affirming the unity of the self, according to which autonomous complexes cannot exist, nature does not appear in the least concerned about such intelligent notions. If we regard the soul as a personification of unconscious contents, so God, according to our previous definition, is also an unconscious content, a personification, insofar as he is personally conceived, an image or expression, when regarded as purely or chiefly dynamic. God, therefore, is essentially the same as the soul, insofar as it is regarded as the personification of unconscious contents. Hence, Meister Eckhart's conception is purely psychological. So long as the soul, as he says, is only in God, it is not blessed. If by blessedness one understands an especially intense and harmonious vital condition, such a state, according to Eckhart, cannot exist so long as the dynamis, which is termed God, that is, the libido, is concealed in objects. For as long as the chief value, or God, after Eckhart, does not reside in the soul, power is without, and therefore in objects. God, that is, the chief value, must be withdrawn from objects and brought into the soul, which signifies a higher estate, and for God, blessedness. Psychologically, this means that the libido appertaining to God, that is, the projected overvalue, becomes recognized as projection. Through such recognition, objects fade in significance, whereby the surplus value is accredited to the individuality, giving rise to an intensified vital feeling, that is, a new potential. God, that is, the highest intensity of life, then resides in the soul, in the unconscious. But this does not mean that God becomes completely unconscious in the sense that the idea of him also vanishes from consciousness. It is as though the chief value were shifted elsewhere, so that it is now found within and not without. Objects are no longer autonomous factors, but God has become an autonomous psychological complex. But an autonomous complex is always only partially conscious, since it is only conditionally associated with the ego, that is, never to such an extent that the ego could wholly embrace it, in which case it would no longer be autonomous. From this moment, the overvalued object is no longer the determining factor, but the unconscious. The determining influences now proceed from the unconscious, that is, one feels and knows them as coming from the unconscious, a knowledge which produces a unity of feeling, as Eckhart said, that is, a relation between conscious and unconscious, in which, of course, the unconscious predominates. We should now ask ourselves, whence comes this blessedness or wonder of love, anianda, as the Indians call the state of Brahman? In this state, the superior value lies in the unconscious, involving a fall of potential in the consciousness, which means to say that the unconscious appears as the determining factor, while the self of the reality consciousness practically disappears. This state is strongly reminiscent of the state of the child on one hand, and of the primitive on the other, who likewise is immensely under the influence of the unconscious. One might conclusively say that the restoration of the earlier paradisical state is the cause of this blessedness, but we have still to understand why this original state is so particularly blissful. This feeling of bliss accompanies all those moments which have the character of flowing life, moments, therefore, or states, when what was dammed up can freely flow, when we have no longer to satisfy this or that condition, or seek around with conscious effort in order to find a way or effect a result. We have all known situations or moods when all goes of itself, 
when there is no longer any need to manufacture all sorts of wearisome conditions by which joy or pleasure might be stimulated the age of childhood is the unforgettable token of this joy which undismayed by things without streams all-embracing from within childlikeness is therefore a symbol for the unique inner condition which accompanies blessedness to be like unto a child means to possess a treasury of constantly accessible libido the libido of the child flows into things in this way he gains the world then by degrees loses himself in the world to use the language of religion through a gradual overvaluation of things whence arises the dependence upon things entailing the necessity of sacrifice that is the drawing away of libido the severance of ties this is the way by which the intuitive doctrine of the religious system attempts to reassemble the wasted energy indeed this harvesting process is actually represented in its symbols the overvaluation of the object as contrasted with the inferiority of the subject results in a retrogressive current which would bring the libido quite naturally back to the subject were it not for the obstructing power of consciousness everywhere with the primitives we find religious practice harmonizing with nature since the primitive is able to follow his instincts without difficulty first in one direction and then in another the practice of religion enables him to recreate the needful magic force or to recover the soul that was lost during the night the objective of the great religions is contained in the injunction not of this world which suggests the inward subjective movement of the libido into the unconscious the general withdrawing and introversion of the libido creates an unconscious libido concentration which is symbolized as a treasure as in the parables of the costly pearl and the treasure in the field eckhart also uses the latter allegory which he interprets in the following way the kingdom of heaven is like unto a treasure which is hid in a field saith christ this field is a soul wherein the treasure of the kingdom of god lieth hidden in a soul therefore are god and all creatures blessed this interpretation agrees with our psychological principles the soul is the personification of the unconscious wherein lies the treasure that is the libido which is submerged or absorbed in introversion it is this sum of libido which is described as the kingdom of god this signifies a constant unity or reconciliation with god a living in his kingdom that is in that state in which a paramount libido accumulation lies in the unconscious by which the conscious life is determined the libido concentrated in the unconscious comes from objects from the world whose former ascendancy it conditioned god was then without whereas now he works from within as that hidden treasure which is conceived as god's kingdom this clearly contains the idea that the libido assembled in the soul represents a relation to god god's kingdom now when meister eckhart reaches the conclusion that the soul is itself the kingdom of god he conceives it as a relation to god and god as the power working within the soul and perceived by it eckhart even calls the soul the image of god ethnological and historical ways of regarding the soul make it abundantly clear that it represents a content which belongs partly to the subject but partly also to the world of spirits that is to the unconscious hence the soul has always an earthly as well as a rather ghostly quality it is the same with the magic power the divine force of the primitives whereas the point of view of the higher cultural levels definitely severs god from man finally exalting him to the heights of pure ideality but the soul never foregoes its middle station hence its claim to be regarded as a function between the conscious subject and these to the subject inaccessible depths of the unconscious the determining force god which operates from these depths is reflected by the soul that is it creates symbols and images and is itself only an image through these images it transfers the forces of the unconscious into the conscious so that it is both receiver and transmitter a perceptive organ in fact for the unconscious contents what it perceives are symbols but symbols are shaped energies or forces that is determining ideas whose spiritual value is just as great as their affective power as eckhart says when the soul is in god it is not yet blessed that is when this function of perception is entirely flooded by the dynamis it is by no means a happy state but when god is in the soul that is when the soul as perception comprehends the unconscious and takes on the imagined form or symbol of it this is a truly happy state we perceive and realize that the happy state is a creative state end of section 26 recording by olivia section 27 of psychological types or the psychology of individuation this is a librivox recording 
All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Olivia. Psychological Types, or The Psychology of Individuation, by Carl Gustav Jung. Translated by Helton Godwin Bynes. Section 27, Chapter 5.4, Continuing, The Relativity of the Idea of God in Meister Eckhart, Part 2. Meister Eckhart utters these noble words, quote, If one asketh me, wherefore do we pray? Wherefore fast? Wherefore do we perform all manner of good works? Wherefore are we baptized? Wherefore did God become man? I would answer, for that God might be born in the soul, and the soul again in God. Therefore is the Holy Script written. Therefore hath God created the whole world, that God might be born in the soul, and the soul again in God. The innermost nature of all corn meaneth wheat, and of all metal gold, and of all birth man. End quote. Here Eckhart frankly affirms that God's existence is dependent upon the soul, and in the same breath, that the soul is the birthplace of God. This latter sentence can readily be understood in the light of our previous reflections. The function of perception, the soul, apprehends the contents of the unconscious, and, as a creative function, brings the dynamis to birth in symbolic form. In the psychological sense, the soul brings to birth images which the general rational consciousness assumes to be worthless. Such images are certainly worthless, in the sense that they cannot immediately be turned to account in the objective world. The artistic is the foremost possibility for their application, insofar as such a means of expression lies in one's power. A second possibility is philosophical speculation. A third is the quasi-religious, which leads to heresies and the founding of sects. There remains the fourth possibility of employing the forces contained in the images in every form of licentiousness. The two latter forms were manifested in an especially marked form in the incratitic, abstinent, ascetic, and the antitactic, anarchical, schools of the Gnostics. As regards reality adaptation, there is, however, a certain indirect value in raising these images to consciousness, since the relation to the real world is thereby cleared of an admixture of fantasy. But the images possess their chief value in assuring subjective happiness and well-being irrespective of the changing aspects of outer conditions. To be adapted is certainly an ideal, yet adaptation is not always possible. There are situations in which the only correct adaptation is patient endurance. A passive adaptation of this kind is made possible and easy through a development of the fantasy images. I use the word development because at first the fantasies are merely raw material of doubtful value. In order to reach that form which is likely to yield the maximum value, they must be submitted to treatment. This treatment is a matter of technique, which it is hardly appropriate to discuss here. For the sake of clearness, I need only say that there are two possibilities of treatment, one, the reductive, and two, the synthetic method. The former traces everything back to primitive instincts. The latter develops a process from the given material, which aims at the differentiation of the personality. The reductive and synthetic methods are mutually complementary, for reduction to instinct leads to reality, in fact to the overvaluation of reality, and hence to the necessity of sacrifice. The synthetic method develops the symbolic fantasies resulting from the libido, which is introverted through sacrifice. Out of this development a new attitude towards the world arises, whose very difference guarantees a new potential. This transition to a new attitude I have termed transcendent function. In the regenerated attitude, the libido that was formerly submerged in the unconscious emerges in the form of positive achievement. It corresponds with a newly won and visible life whose image is the symbol of the divine birth. Conversely, when the libido is withdrawn from the outer object and sinks into the unconscious, the soul is born in God, because it is essentially a negative act as regards daily living and a symbolic descent to the deus absconditus, concealed God who possesses very different qualities from the god that shines by day, this is not a happy state, as Eckhart rightly observes. Eckhart speaks of the divine birth as of an oft-recurring process. Actually, the thing we are dealing with here is a psychological process which unconsciously repeats itself almost continually, but of which we are only relatively conscious in its most extreme fluctuations. Goethe's idea of systole and diastole certainly hit the mark intuitively. It may have to do with a vital rhythm or with fluctuations of vital forces, which, as a rule, take place unconsciously. 
This may also explain why the existing terminology for this process is either prevailingly religious or mythological, since such expressions or formula are primarily related to unconscious psychological facts and not, as scientific myth interpretation often asserts, to phases of the moon and other planetary events. And because it is preeminently a question of unconscious processes, we have, scientifically, the greatest possible difficulty so far to extricate ourselves from the language of metaphor as at least to attain the level of the figurative speech of other sciences. Veneration of the great natural mysteries, which religious language endeavors to express in symbols consecrated by their antiquity, significance, and beauty, will suffer no injury from the extension of psychology upon this terrain, to which science has hitherto found no access. We only shift the symbols back a little, thus shedding light upon a portion of their realm, but without embracing the error that by doing so we have created anything more than a new symbol for that same enigma which confronted all the ages before us. Our science is also a language of metaphor, but from the practical standpoint it succeeds better than the old mythological hypotheses, which expressed itself by concrete presentations, instead of, as we do, by conceptions. As we see from these citations, Eckhart distinguishes between God and the Godhead. The Godhead is the all, neither knowing nor possessing itself, whereas God appears as a function of the soul, just as a soul appears as a function of the Godhead. The Godhead is clearly the all-pervading creative power. Psychologically, it is the generating, producing instinct that neither knows nor possesses itself, comparable with Schopenhauer's conception of the will. But God appears as issuing forth from the Godhead and the soul. The soul as creature expresses him. He exists insofar as the soul is distinguished from the unconscious, and insofar as it perceives the forces and contents of the unconscious. He passes away as soon as the soul is immersed in the flood and source of unconscious energy. Thus Eckhart says in another place, As I came forth out of God, all things said, There is a God. That cannot now make me blessed, for therewith I conceive myself as creature. But in the breaking through, when I will to stand free in the will of God, and also free of God's will, and all his works, even of God himself, then I am more than all creatures. Then am I neither God nor creature. I am what I was, and what I shall remain, now and evermore. Then do I receive a push, which brings me up above all the angels. In this push, I am become so rich that God cannot be enough for me, even in all which as God he is, and in all his divine works. For in this breaking through, I receive what I and God have in common. Then I am what I was. Then I neither increase nor diminish, for I am something unmoved, which moveth all things. Here God findeth no more place in man, for here hath man conquered again, through his poverty, what eternally he hath been and ever will remain. Here is God taken into the Spirit. The coming forth signifies a becoming aware of the unconscious contents, and of unconscious energy in the form of an idea born of the soul. This is an act of conscious discrimination from the unconscious dynamis, a severance of the ego as subject from God, that is, the unconscious dynamis as object. In this way God becometh, when, through the breaking through, that is, through a cutting off of the ego from the world, and through an identification of the ego with the motivating dynamis of the unconscious, this severance is once more resolved. God disappears as object and becomes the subject, which is no longer distinguished from the ego. That is, the ego, as a relatively late product of differentiation, becomes once more united with the mystic, dynamic, universal participation, participation mystique of the primitives. This is the immersion in the flood and source. The numerous analogies with the ideas of the East are at once evident. Writers more competent than myself have already fully elaborated them. But in the absence of direct influence, this parallelism proves that Eckhart thinks from the depths of the collective psyche, which is common to East and West. This common basis, for which no common historical background can be made answerable, is the primordial foundation of primitive mentality, with its primitive energetic notion of God, in which the impelling dynamis is not yet crystallized into the abstract idea of God. This harking back to primeval nature, this religiously organized regression to psychic conditions of early times, is common to all religions which are in the deepest sense living, commencing with the identification backward of the totem ceremonies of the Australian Negro, continuing down to the ecstasies of the Christian mystics of our own age and civilization. This retrogressive process reestablishes an original state or attitude, 
that is, the improbability of the identity with God, and by virtue of this improbability, which has nevertheless become a supremely important experience, a new potential is produced, the world is created anew, because the individual's attitude to the object has been regenerated. When speaking of the relativity of the symbol of God, it is a duty of the historical conscience also to mention that a solitary poet who, as tragic fate willed it, could find no relation to his own vision, Angelius Cilicius, what Meister Eckhart labored to express with great effort of mind and often in hardly intelligible language, Cilicius sings in brief, touching, intimate verses, which reveal in their naive simplicity the same relativity of God that Meister Eckhart had already conceived. The few verses, I quote, will speak for themselves. I know that without me, God can no moment live. Were I to die, then he no longer could survive. God cannot without me a single worm create. Did I not share with him, destruction were its fate. I am as great as God, and he is small like me. He cannot be above, nor I below him be. In me is God a fire, and I in him its glow. In common is our life, apart we cannot grow. God loves me more than self. My love doth give his weight. Whate'er he gives to me, I must reciprocate. He's God and man to me. To him I'm both indeed. His thirst I satisfy. He helps me in my need. This God, who feels for us, is to us what we will. And woe to us if we, our part, do not fulfill. God is whate'er he is. I am what I must be. If you know one, in sooth, you know both him and me. I am not outside God, nor leave I him afar. I am his grace and light, and he my guiding star. I am the vine which he doth plant and cherish most. The fruit which grows in me is God, the Holy Ghost. I am God's child, his son, and he too is my child. We are the two in one, both son and father, mild. To illuminate my God, the sunshine I must be. My beams must radiate his calm and boundless sea. It would be ludicrous to assume that such thoughts as these, and those of Meister Eckhart, are nothing but the vain products of conscious speculation. Such thoughts are always significant historical phenomena, the yield of unconscious tides in the collective psyche. Thousands of other nameless ones are behind, standing with similar thoughts and feelings below the threshold of consciousness, ready to open the gates of a new age. In the boldness of these ideas speaks the imperturbable and immovable certainty of the unconscious mind, which will bring about, with the finality of a natural law, a spiritual transformation and renewal. With the Reformation, the current reached the general surface of conscious life. The Reformation, in a great measure, did away with the Church as the intermediary and dispenser of salvation, and established, once again, the personal relation with God. This was the culminating point in the objectification of the idea of God, and from this point, the concept of God again became increasingly subjective. The logical result of this subjectifying process is a splitting up into sects, and its most extreme outcome is individualism, representing a new form of remoteness whose immediate danger is submersion in the unconscious dynamis. The cult of the blonde beast springs from this development, besides much else that distinguishes our age from other ages. But whenever this reshoot into instinct takes place, an ever-growing resistance against the purely shapeless and chaotic character of sheer dynamis inevitably appears, the unquenchable need for form and law. The soul, which dives into the stream, must also create the symbol, which embraces, maintains, and expresses this energy. It is this process in the collective psyche which is either felt or intuitively sensed by those poets and artists whose chief creative source is the collective unconscious, that is, perceptions of unconscious contents, and whose intellectual horizon is sufficiently wide to apprehend the main problems of the age, at least in their outer aspects. Spittler's Prometheus marks a psychological turning point. He depicts the falling asunder of the pairs of opposites which were formerly together. Prometheus the artist, the sole server, disappears from human ken while human society, in obedience to a soulless moral routine, is delivered over to behemoth, the antagonistic, destructive outcome of an outlived ideal. At the right moment, Pandora, the soul, creates the saving jewel in the unconscious, which, however, does not reach mankind because men fail to understand it. The change for the better takes place 
only through the intervention of the Promethean tendency, which, by virtue of its insight and understanding, brings first a few, and then many, individuals to their senses. It can hardly be doubted that this work of Spittler has its roots in the intimate life of its creator, but if it consisted only in a poetic elaboration of this purely personal experience, it would to a large extent lack general validity and permanence. Yet, because it is not merely personal, but is largely concerned with the presentation of the collective problems of our time, as personally experienced, it achieves universal validity. Its first appearance was nonetheless certain to encounter the apathy of contemporaries, for contemporaries are in the great majority only fitted to maintain and appraise the immediate present, thus helping to bring about that same fatal issue whose confusion the divining creative mind had already sought to unravel. End of section 27 Recording by Olivia Section 28 of Psychological Types or the Psychology of Individuation This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Avian X. Psychological Types or the Psychology of Individuation by Carl Gustav Jung, translated by Helton Godwin Baines, 1882 to 1943. Chapter 5.5 The Nature of the Reconciling Symbol in Spitteler, Part 1. There still remains an important question to discuss, namely the character of this jewel or symbol of renewed life, which the poet divines as the vessel of joy and deliverance. We have compared a number of excerpts which substantiate the divine nature of the jewel. We find it more or less clearly stated that the symbol contains possibilities for new energic deliveries, i.e. the release of libido unconsciously bound. The symbol always says, In some such form as this will a new manifestation of life, a deliverance from the bondage and weariness of life, be found. The libido which is freed from the unconscious by means of the symbol is symbolized as a young or rejuvenated god. In Christianity, for instance, Jehovah achieved a transformation into the loving father, embracing an altogether higher and more spiritual morality. The motif of the god renewal is universal, and therefore presumably familiar. Referring to the redeeming power of the jewel, Pandora says, but lo, I have heard of a race of men, full of sorrow and deserving of pity. Therefore I have conceived a gift, with which, perchance, as thou grantest my petition, I may soothe and solace their many woes. The leaves of the tree which shelter the birth sing, for here abideth presence, blessedness, and grace. Love and joy is the message of the wonder child, the new symbol, hence a sort of paradisiacal state. This is parallel with the message that heralded the birth of Christ, while the greeting by the sun goddess and the miracle, wherein men at remote distances became good and blessed at the moment of the birth, are attributes of the birth of Buddha. Concerning the divine blessing, I wish to emphasize only this one significant passage. Those images return again to every man, whose rainbow-tinted, dreamlike fabric once painted his childhood's future. This is clearly a statement that childhood's fantasies tend to go to fulfillment, i.e. that these images are not lost, but come again in ripe manhood and should be fulfilled. Old Kuhl in Barlach's Der Tote Tag says, When I lay o' nights, and the pillows of darkness weigh me down, at times there presses about me a light that resounds, visible to mine eyes and audible to mine ears, and there about my bed stand the lovely forms of a better future. Stiff are they yet, but of radiant beauty, still sleeping, but he who shall awaken them would make for the world a fairer face. A hero would he be who could do it. What would those hearts be like which then might beat? Quite other hearts thrilling so differently from those that beat today. Of the images, they stand not in the sun. And nowhere are they lit by the sun, but they shall and must come once out of the night. That would be the masterwork, to bring them up into the sun. There they would live. Epimetheus also yearns for the image, the jewel. In his speech on the statue of Heracles, the hero, 
He says, This is the meaning of the image, and with the understanding of it our sole achievement shall be, that we seize and experience the opportunity, so that a jewel shall ripen above our head, a jewel that we must win. So too when the jewel, declined by Epimetheus, is brought to the priests, those sing in just the same strain as did Epimetheus in his former craving for the jewel. O come, O God with thy grace, only to repudiate and revile in the very next instant the heavenly jewel that is offered them. The beginning of the hymn sung by the priests is not difficult to recognize as the Protestant hymn. Living Spirit once again, come thou true eternal God, nor thy power descend in vain, make us ever thine abode. So shall spirit, joy, and light dwell in us where all was night. Spirit thou of strength and power, thou new spirit God hath given, aid us in temptation's hour, train and perfect us for heaven, etc. This hymn is a perfect parallel with our foregoing argument. It wholly corresponds with the rationalistic nature of Epimethean creatures that the same priests that sing this hymn should reject the new spirit of life, the newly created symbol. Reason must always seek the solution upon rational, sequential, logical ways, in which it is certainly justified in all normal situations and problems, but in the greatest and really decisive questions the reason proves inadequate. It is incapable of creating the image, the symbol, for the symbol is irrational. When the rational way has become a cul-de-sac, which is its inevitable and constant tendency, then, from the side where one least expects it, the solution comes. What good thing cometh out of Nazareth? Such, for instance, is the psychological underlying the messianic prophecies. The prophecies themselves are projections of the unconscious, which always foreshadows the future event. Because the solution is irrational, the appearance of the Redeemer is associated with an impossible, i.e. irrational condition, the pregnancy of the Virgin, Isaiah 7.14. This prophecy, like many another, has impossible conditions attaching to it, as for instance, Macbeth shall never vanquished be, until great Burnham Wood to High Dunsinane Hill shall come against him. Macbeth, Act 4, Scene 1. The birth of the Savior, i.e. the rise of the symbol, happens in that very place where one is least expecting it, whence indeed a solution is of all things the most improbable. Thus Isaiah says, 53.1, Who hath believed our report? And to whom is the arm of the Lord revealed? For he grew up before him as a tender plant, and as a root out of the dry ground, he hath no form nor comeliness. And when we shall see him, there is no beauty that we should desire him. He is despised and rejected of men, a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief and we hid, as it were, our faces from him. He was despised, and we esteemed him not. Not only does the redeeming power spring where nothing is expected, but it also reveals itself, as this passage shows, in a form which to the Epimethean judgment contains no special value. In Spitteler's description of the symbol's rejection, there can hardly have been any conscious reference to the biblical model, or one would certainly be able to trace it in his words. It is much more likely that he too created from those same depths, whence prophets and creative minds call up the redeeming symbol. The appearance of the Savior signifies a reconciliation of the opposites. The wolf also shall dwell with the lamb, and the leopard shall lie down with the kid, and the calf and the young lion and the fatling together, and a little child shall lead them. And the cow and the bear shall feed, their young ones shall lie down together and the lion shall eat straw like the ox, and the suckling child shall play on the hole of the asp, and the weaned child shall put his hand on the cockatrice's den. Isaiah 11.6 The nature of the redeeming symbol is that of a child, the wonder child of Spitteler, i.e. childlikeness or an attitude which assumes nothing is of the very nature of the symbol and its function. This childlike attitude carries with it the condition eo ipso that in place of self-will and rational purposiveness, another guiding principle shall have effect whose divinity is synonymous 
with superior power. The guiding principle is of an irrational nature, wherefore it appears in a miraculous guise. Isaiah gives this character very beautifully. For unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given, and the government shall be upon his shoulder, and his name shall be called Wonderful, Counselor, the Mighty God, the Everlasting Father, the Prince of Peace. Isaiah 9, 5. These conditions give the essential qualities of the redeeming symbol, which we have already established above. The criterion of the divine effect is the irresistible force of the unconscious impulse. The hero is always a figure endowed with magical power, who makes the impossible possible. The symbol is the middle way, upon which the opposites unite towards a new movement, a watercourse that pours forth fertility after long drought. The tension that precedes the release is likened to a pregnancy. Like as a woman with child, that draweth near the time of her delivery, is in pain and crieth out in her pangs. So have we been in thy sight, O Lord. We have been with child, we have been in pain. We have, as it were, brought forth wind. We have not wrought any deliverance in the earth, neither have the inhabitants of the world fallen. Thy dead shall live, my dead body shall arise. Isaiah 26.17 In the act of redemption, what was inanimate and dead comes to life, i.e., psychologically, those functions which have lain fallow and unfertile, psychic elements that were unused, repressed, despised, undervalued, etc., suddenly burst forth and begin to live. It is precisely the less valued function, whose life was threatened with extinction by the differentiated function, that continues. This motif recurs in the New Testament idea of restoration for all, or reintegration, which is a higher evolutionary form of that worldwide version of the hero myth in which the hero, on his exit from the belly of the whale, brings with him not only his parents, but a whole company of those previously swallowed by the monster, what Frobenius calls the universal hatching out. This association with the hero myth is also confirmed by Isaiah in the two verses, In that day the Lord, with his sore and great and strong sword, shall punish Leviathan the piercing serpent, even Leviathan that crooked serpent, and he shall slay the dragon that is in the sea. Isaiah 27, 1. With the birth of the symbol, the regression of the libido into the unconscious ceases. Regression is converted into progression, damming up gives place to flowing, whereupon the absorbing power of the primeval is broken. Thus, Kuhl says in Barlach's drama Der Tote Tag, And there about my bed stand the lovely forms of a better future. Stiff are they yet, but of radiant beauty, still sleeping, but he who shall awaken them would make for the world a fairer face. A hero would be he who could do it. Mother. An heroic life in misery and dire need. Kuhl. But perchance there might be one. Mother. He must first bury his mother. I have abundantly illustrated the motif of the mother dragon in an earlier work, so I may spare myself a repetition of it here the dawn of a new life and fruitfulness in the direction where nothing could be expected, is also sung by Isaiah. Then the eyes of the blind shall be opened, and the ears of the deaf shall be unstopped. Then shall the lame man leap as an art, and the tongue of the dumb sing. For in the wilderness shall waters break out, and streams in the desert, and the parched ground shall become a pool, and the thirsty land springs of water, and the habitation of jackals where each lay, shall be grass with reeds and rushes, and an eyeway shall be there, and a way, and it shall be called the way of holiness. The unclean shall not pass over it, but it shall be for those, the wayfaring men, ye fools, shall not go astray therein. Isaiah 35, 5 The redeeming symbol is a highway a way upon which life can move forward without torment and compulsion. Holderlin says in Patmos, Near is God, and hard to seize. Wherever danger lurks, groweth a thing that saves. That sounds as though the nearness of God were a danger, i.e. as though the concentration of libido in the unconscious were a danger to the conscious life. 
And this is actually the case, for the more the libido is invested, or more accurately invests itself, in the unconscious, the greater becomes the influence or effective potentiality of the unconscious. Which means that all the rejected, thrown aside, outlived function possibilities, for which generations have been entirely lost, become reanimated and begin to exercise an increasing influence upon consciousness, notwithstanding often desperate resistance on the part of conscious insight. The saving factor is the symbol, which is able to reconcile the conscious with the unconscious and embrace them both. While the consciously disposed libido becomes gradually used up in the differentiated function, and is only restored again with constantly increasing difficulty, and while the symptoms of inner discord multiply, there is an ever-growing danger of a flooding and disintegration by unconscious contents. But all the time the symbol is developing which is fitted to resolve the conflict. But the symbol is so intimately bound up with the dangerous and threatening that it may either be confounded with it, or its appearance may actually call forth the evil and destructive. In every instance, the appearance of the redeeming factor is closely linked up with ruin and devastation. If the old were not ripe for death, nothing new would appear, and if the old were not injuriously blocking the way out for the new, it could not and need not be rooted out. This natural psychological association of the opposites is also found in Isaiah, where, 716, 714, we find that a virgin is to bear a son, who shall be called Emmanuel. Emmanuel significantly means God with us, i.e. union with the latent dynamis of the unconsciousness, which is assured in the redeeming symbol. In the verses which immediately follow, we see what this reconciliation pretends. For before the child shall know to refuse the evil and choose the good, the land whose two kings thou abhorrest shall be forsaken. 8.1 Moreover, the Lord said unto me, Take thee a great roll, and write in it with a man's pen, concerning Maher Shalal Hashbaz, Rob Soon, Hasten Booty. 8.3 And I went unto the prophetess, and she conceived and bare a son. Then said the Lord to me, Call his name Mahar Shalal Hashbaz. For before the child shall have knowledge to cry, My father and my mother, the riches of Damascus, and the spoil of Samaria, shall be taken away before the king of Assyria. 8.6 For as much as this people refuseth the waters of Shiloh that go softly, behold, the Lord bringeth up upon them the waters of the river, strong and many, even the king of Assyria and all his glory. And he shall come up over all his channels, and go over all his banks. And he shall pass through Judah, he shall overflow and go over, and shall reach even to the neck. And the stretching out of his wings shall fill the breadth of thy land, O Emmanuel. I have already pointed out in my book, Psychology of the Unconscious, that the birth of the god is threatened by the dragon, the danger of inundation, and child murder. Psychologically, this means that the latent dynamis may burst forth and overwhelm consciousness. For Isaiah, this peril is the enemy king, who rules a hostile and powerful realm. The problem for Isaiah, of course, is not psychological, but concrete, on account of his complete projection. With Spitteler, on the contrary, the problem is already very psychological, and therefore detached from the concrete object. It is nevertheless expressed in forms that closely resemble those in Isaiah, although it is hardly necessary to assume a conscious derivation. End of chapter 5.5 The Nature of the Reconciling Symbol in Spitteler, Part 1 Recording by Avian X Section 29 of Psychological Types, or the Psychology of Individuation this is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Avian X. Psychological Types, or The Psychology of Individuation, by Carl Gustav Jung. Translated by Helton Godwin Baines, 1882 to 1943. Chapter 5.5 .5, The Nature of the Reconciling Symbol in Spitteler. Part 2. 
The birth of the Deliverer is equivalent to a great catastrophe, since a new and powerful life issues forth just where no life or force or new development was anticipated. It streams forth out of the unconscious, i.e. from that part of the psyche which, whether we desire it or not, is unknown and therefore treated as nothing by all rationalists. From this discredited and rejected region comes the new tributary of energy, the revivification of life. But what is this discredited and despised region? It is the sum of all those psychic contents which are repressed on account of their incompatibility with conscious values, hence the ugly, immoral, wrong, irrelevant, useless, etc., which means everything that at one time appeared so to the individual in question. Now herein lies the danger that the very force with which these things reappear, as well as their new and wonderful brilliance, may so intrigue the individual that he either forgets or repudiates all former values. What he formerly despised is now a supreme principle, and what was formerly truth now becomes error. This reversal of values is tantamount to a destruction of previously accepted values, hence it resembles the devastation of a country by floods. Thus, with Spitteler, Pandora's heavenly gift brings evil both to the country and to man, just as, in the classic saga, diseases stream from Pandora's box to flood and ravage the land, a similar evil is caused by the jewel. To grasp this, we must first probe into the nature of this symbol. The first to find the symbol are the peasants, and the shepherds are the first to greet the savior. They turn it about in their hands, first this way and that, until at length they are quite dumbfounded by its strange, immoral, unlawful appearance. When they brought it to the king, and he, to prove it, showed it to the conscience, demanding its yea or nay about it, stricken with terror, it sprang pell-mell from the wardrobe to the floor, where it ran and hid itself under the bed with impossible suspicions. Like a fleeing crab staring with venomous eyes and malevolently brandishing its twisted claws, the conscience peered from under the bed, and it came to pass that whenever Epimetheus nearer pushed the image, the further did the other recoil with gesticulations of disgust. And thus all silent it crouched, and never a word, nay not a syllable did it utter, however much the king might beg and entreat it and cajole it with every manner of speech. To the conscience evidently the new symbol was acutely unsympathetic. The king, therefore, bade the peasants bear the jewel to the priests. But hardly had Hiffelhoffel, the high priest, glanced at the face of the image than he began to shudder and sicken, and, raising his arms as though to guard his forehead from a blow, he cried and shouted, Away with this mockery, for in it is something opposed to God. Moreover, carnal is its heart, and insolence flashes from its eyes. Thereupon the peasants brought the jewel to the academy, but the professors of the university found that the image lacked feeling and soul, Moreover, it wanted in sincerity, and had in general no guiding thought. Finally, the goldsmith found the jewel to be spurious and of common metal. On the marketplace, where the peasants wished to get rid of the image, the police descended upon it. At sight of the image, the guardians of the law exclaimed, Dwells there no heart in your body, and shelters no conscience in your soul, that ye dare openly before all eyes expose this sheer, wanton, shameless nakedness? And now away with ye in haste, and woe upon you, if by any chance the sight of it hath polluted our stainless children and unsullied wives. The symbol is characterized as strange, immoral, unlawful opposed to moral sense, antagonizing our feeling and idea of the spiritual, as well as our conception of the divine. It appeals to sensuality, is shameless and liable to become a serious danger to public morality by the stimulation of sexual fantasies. Such attributes define an essence which is in frank opposition to our moral values, but is also opposed to our aesthetic judgment, since it lacks the higher feeling values. And finally, the absence of a guiding thought suggests an irrationality of its intellectual content. The verdict, opposed to God, might be rendered anti-Christian, since this history is localized neither in remote antiquity nor in China. This symbol, then, by reason of all its attributes, is a representative of the inferior function, hence the unrecognized psychic contents. It is obvious that the image represents, though it is nowhere stated, a naked human figure, in fact, living form. 
This form expresses complete freedom, which means to be just as one is. As also the duty to be just as one is, it accordingly stands for the highest possible attainment of aesthetic as well as moral beauty. It signifies man as he might be through nature, and not through some artificially prepared ideal form. Such an image, presented to the eyes of man as he is at present, can have no other effect than to release in him all that has laid bound in slumber and has not shared in life. If by chance he be only partly civilized, and still more than half barbarian, all his barbarism will be aroused at such a vision. For a man's hatred is always concentrated upon that which makes him conscious of his bad qualities. Hence the jewel's fate was sealed at the moment of its appearance in the world. The dumb shepherd lad who first found it is half cudgeled to death by the enraged peasants, then the peasants hurl the jewel upon the road. Thus the redeeming symbol ends its brief but typical course. The association with the Christian passion theme is unmistakable. The redeeming nature of the jewel is also revealed in the fact that it appears only once in a thousand years. It is a rare occurrence, this flowering of the treasure, this appearance of a savior, a saushiant, or a Buddha. The end of the jewel's career is mysterious. It falls into the hands of a wandering Jew. No Jew of this world was it, and strange to us beyond measure seemed his raiment. This particular Jew can only be a Hashvirosh, who did not accept the actual Redeemer, and here again steals, as it were, the redeeming image. The Ahasuerus legend is a medieval Christian saga, in which form it cannot be dated back earlier than the beginning of the 13th century. Psychologically, it springs from an element of the personality, or is some of the libido which finds no application in the Christian attitude to life in the world, and is accordingly represented. The Jews were always a symbol for this repressed portion, which accounts for the medieval delirium of persecution against the Jews. The ritual murder notion contains the idea of the rejection of the Redeemer in an acute form, for one sees the mote in one's own eye as a beam in the eye of one's brother. The ritual murder idea also plays a part in the Spitteler story, since the Jew steals the wonder child sent from heaven. This idea is a mythological projection of the unconscious perception that the redeeming effect is constantly being frustrated by the presence of an unredeemed element in the unconscious. This unredeemed, undomesticated, untrained, or barbaric portion, which can only be held on a chain not allowed to run free, is projected upon those who have never accepted Christianity. In reality, of course, it is an element in ourselves, which has always contrived to escape the Christian process of domestication. An unconscious perception of this resistant element, whose existence one would like to disavow, is certainly present, hence the projection. Restlessness is a concrete expression of this unredeemed state. The unredeemed element at once monopolizes the new light and the energy of the new symbol. This is another way of expressing the same thing that we have already indicated above when describing the effect of the symbol upon the collective psyche. The symbol intrigues all the repressed and unrecognized contents, as instanced by the guardians of the marketplace. Similarly with Hiffelhofel, who, because of his unconscious resistance against his own religion, immediately brings out and emphasizes the ungodliness and sensuality of the new symbol. The affect displayed in the rejection corresponds with the amount of repressed libido. It is in the moral degradation of the pure gift of heaven, in the sultry fantasy loom of these minds, that the ritual murder is accomplished. The appearance of this symbol nevertheless has its benign effect. Although not accepted in its pure form, it was greedily devoured by the archaic, undifferentiated forces, wherein conscious morality and aesthetic values continued to cooperate. Here the enantiodromia begins, the conversion of the hitherto valued into the worthless, the changing of the former good into the bad. The realm of the good, whose king is Epimetheus, had lived in age-long enmity with the kingdom of Behemoth, Behemoth and Leviathan are two familiar monsters of God from the book of Job. They are the symbolical expression of his force and power. As crude animal symbols, they portray psychologically allied forces in human nature. Thus, Jehovah says, Job 11.15, 
Behold now, Behemoth, which I made with thee. Lo now, his strength is in his loins, and his force is in the muscles of his belly. He moveth his tail like a cedar, and the sinews of his stones are wrapped together. He is the beginning of the ways of God. One must read these words attentively. This force is the beginning of the ways of God, i.e. of Jehovah, the Jewish God, who in the New Testament lays aside this form. There, he is no longer the nature God. This means, psychologically, that this crude, instinctive side of the libido accumulated in the unconscious is permanently held under in the Christian attitude. Thus, the divine half of the libido is repressed, or written down to man's debit account, and in the last resort is assigned to the domain of the devil. Hence, when the unconscious force begins to well up, when the ways of God begin, God comes in the shape of behemoth. One might say with equal truth that God presents himself in the devil's shape, but these moral valuations are optical delusions. The force of life is beyond the moral judgment. Meister Eckhart says, Said I therefore, God is good. It is not true. I am good. God is not good. I go still further. I am better than God. For only what is good can be better, and only what can become better can become the best. God is not good. Therefore can he not be better. And because not better, neither can he be best. Far away from God are these three conditions, good, better, best. He standeth above them all. Butner, Volume 1, page 165. The immediate effect of the redeeming symbol is the reconciliation of the pairs of opposites. Thus, the ideal realm of Epimetheus becomes reconciled with the kingdom of Behemoth, i.e. moral consciousness enters into a dangerous alliance with the unconscious contents, together with the libido belonging to, or identical with, these contents. Now the children of God have been entrusted to the care of Epimetheus, namely those highest goods of mankind, without which man is a mere animal. Through the reconciliation with his own unconscious opposite, the menace of disaster, flooding and devastation descend upon him, i.e. the values of the conscious are liable to become swamped in the energic values of the unconscious. If that image of natural beauty and morality had been really accepted and valued, instead of serving, merely by virtue of its innocent naturalness, as an incitement to all the filthiness hiding in the background of our moral civilization, then, notwithstanding the pact with Behemoth, the divine children would never have been jeopardized, for Epimetheus would always have been able to discriminate between the valuable and the worthless. But, because the symbol appears inacceptable to our one-sided, rationalistic, and therefore deformed mentality, every standard of value fails. When, in spite of it all, the reconciliation of the pairs of opposites transpires as a force majeure, the danger of inundation and disintegration necessarily follows, in a peculiarly characteristic way, since the dangerous counter-tendencies get smuggled in under the cloak of correct ideas. Even the evil and pernicious can be rationalized and made aesthetic. Thus, one after another, the divine children are handed over to Behemoth, i.e. conscious values are exchanged for sheer impulsiveness and stupidity. Conscious values are greedily devoured by crude and barbarous tendencies which were hitherto unconscious. Thus, Behemoth and Leviathan erect an invisible whale, the unconscious, as symbolizing their principle where the corresponding symbol of the Epimethean kingdom is the bird. The whale, as a denizen of the sea, is the universal symbol of the devouring unconscious. The bird, as a citizen of the luminous kingdom of the air, is a symbol of conscious thought. It also symbolizes the ideal, wings, and the Holy Spirit. The final extinction of good is prevented by the intervention of Prometheus. He rescues Messias, the last of the sons of God, out of the power of his enemy. Messias becomes the heir to the divine kingdom, where Prometheus and Epimetheus, the personifications of the severed opposites, become united in the seclusion of their native valley. Both are relieved of sovereignty, Epimetheus because he was forced to forego it, and Prometheus because he never strove for it. 
Which means, in psychological terms, that introversion and extroversion seek to dominate as one-sided lines of direction, and consequently the psychic dissociation also ceases. In their stead, a new function appears, symbolically represented by a child named Messias, who had long lain asleep. Messias is the mediator, the symbol of the new attitude that shall reconcile the opposites. He is a child, a boy, the pure Eternus of the immemorial prototype, heralding by his youth the resurrection and rebirth of what was lost, apocatastasis. That which Pandora brought to Earth as an image, and being rejected by men became the cause of their undoing, is fulfilled in Messias. This association of symbols corresponds with a frequent experience in the practice of analytical psychology. A symbol emerging in dreams is rejected for the very reasons detailed above, and even affects a counter-reaction, which corresponds with the invasion of Behemoth. The result of this conflict is a simplification of the personality, based upon individual characteristics which have been present since birth. This reintegration ensures a connection of the matured personality with the energy sources of childhood. In this transition, as Spittler shows, there is great danger that instead of the symbol, the archaic instincts thereby awakened shall become rationalistically accepted and sheltered among established views. The English mystic William Blake says, There are two classes of men, the prolific and the devouring. Footnote 2. The prolific equals the fruitful, who brings forth out of himself. End of footnote 2. Footnote 3. The devouring equals the man who swallows up and takes into himself. End of footnote 3. Religion is an endeavor to reconcile the two. With these words of Blake, which are a simple epitome of the fundamental ideas of Spittler and my elaborations thereon, I would like to close this chapter. If I have unduly expanded it, this came about, as in the discussion of the Schiller letters, through a wish to do justice to the profusion of ideas Spitzler awakens in his Prometheus and Epimetheus. I have, as far as possible, confined myself to the essentials. Indeed, I have deliberately omitted a whole group of problems which would claim attention in a full elaboration of this material. End of chapter 5.5 .5. The Nature of the Reconciling Symbol in Spitzler Part 2. Recording by Avian X. Section 6 of Psychological Types for the Psychology of Individuation. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Simona Perego. Physiological Types or the Psychology of Individuation by Carl Gustav Young, translated by Helton Goodwin Baines. Chapter 6 The Type Problem in Psychiatry, Part 1. We now come to the work of a psychiatrics who, from the bewildering multiplicity of so called psychopathic states, attempt to bring two definite types into relief. This very extensive group embraces all those psychopathic borderline states which can no longer be included under the heading of the psychosis proper. Hence, all the neurosis and degenerative states, e.g. intellectual, moral, affective, and such like physical inferiorities. This attempt was made in 92 by Otto Gross, who published a theoretical study entitled Die cerebral secundar function, and it was the basis hypothesis of this work that prompted him to the conception of two psychological types. Although the empirical material treated by Gross is taken from the domain of physical inferiority, this is no reason why the points of view thus obtained should not be transferred to the wider regions of normal psychology. Since the unbalanced physics states affords the investigator a very favorable opportunity of gaining an almost exaggeratedly distinct view of certain physical phenomena, which are often only dimly perceptible within the boundaries of the normal. Occasionally, the abnormal condition has the effect of a magnifying glass. 
as we shall uh, soon see, Gross himself, uh, in his final chapter, also extend his conclusions to the wider terrain. By secondary function, Gross understands a cerebral cell process that comes into action after the primary function has already taken place. The primary function would correspond to the actual performance of the cells, with the production of a positive physical process, let us say, a representation. This performance represents an energic process, presumably, the release of a chemical tension, i.e. a chemical decomposition. In the wake of this sudden discharge, turned by gross the primary function, the secondary function begins. It represents, therefore, a restitution, a rebuilding by means of assimilation. This function will occupy a shorter or longer interval in proportion to the intensity of the preceding expenditure of energy. During this time, the cell, as compared with its former condition, is in an altered state, with a state of stimulation, which cannot be without influence upon the further physical process. Processes that are especially highly toned and loaded with affect must entail an increased expenditure of energy, in a definitely prolonged period of restitution or secondary function. The effect of the secondary function upon the physical process is considered by Gross to be a specific and demonstrable influencing of the subsequent association sequence, with the particular effect of restricting the choice of associations to the thema represented in the primary function, the so-called leading idea. Not long after, as a matter of fact, I was able to show in my own experimental work, as likewise several of my pupils in corresponding investigations, phenomena of perseveration, following ideas with a high feeling tone. These phenomena are accessible to mathematical proof. My pupil, Dr. Eberswelling, in an investigation of speech phenomena, has demonstrated that the same phenomenon in assonances and agglutinations. Furthermore, we know from pathological experience how frequently perseverations occur in severe brain lesions, e.g. apoplexis, tumors, atrophing and other degenerative conditions. This may well be ascribed to this impeded restitution process. Thus, Gross's hypothesis has a good share of probability. It is only natural, therefore, to raise the question whether there may not be individuals or even types in whom the restitution period, the secondary function, persists longer than in others, and, if so, whether center peculiar psychologies may not eventually be traceable to this. A brief secondary function, clearly, influences fewer consecutive associations in a given length of time than a long one. Hence, in the former case, the primary function can occur much more frequently. The serological picture in such a case would show a constant and rapidly renewed readiness for action and reaction, hence a kind of capacity for deviation, a tendency to a superficiality of associative connections, and a lack of the deeper, more integrative connections, a certain incoherence, therefore, insofar as significance is expected of the association. On the other hand, many new themata crawl up in the unit of time, though not all deeply engaged or clearly focused, so that the heterogeneous idea of varying values appear, as it were on the same niveau, thus giving an impression of a leveling of ideas, Wernick. This rapid succession of ideas in the primary function excludes any real experience of the effective value of the thema per se. Hence, the effectivity cannot be anything but superficial. But, at the same time, rapid adaptations and changes of attitude and thereby render it possible. The real intellectual process, or better still, abstraction, naturally suffers from the abbreviation of the secondary function, since the process of abstraction demands a sustained contemplation of several initial ideas, plus their after effects, and therefore a longer secondary function. Without this, no intensification and abstraction of an idea or a group of ideas can take place. The more rapid recovery of the primary function produces a higher rigibility, not of course in the intensive, but in the extensive sense. Hence, it provides a prompt grasp of the immediate present, 
thought only of its surface, not of its deeper meaning. From this circumstance, we may easily gain the impression of an uncritical and open-minded disposition, as the case may be. We are struck by a certain competency and understanding, or we might find an unintelligible inconsiderateness, a crude tactlessness, or even brutality. The two facets gliding over the deeper meanings gives the impression of a certain blindness for everything not immediate and transparent or superficial. The quick regibility has also the appearance of so-called presence of mind, of audacity even to the point of full hardness. Thus, besides a lack of criticism, it also suggests an inability to realize danger. His rapidity of action looks like peaceiveness. It is more often blind impulse. This encroachment upon another province is almost a matter of course. This is facilitated by this ignorance of emotional value, of an idea or action, and its effect upon its fellow men. As a result of the rapid restoration of the state of liveness, the elaboration of perceptions and experiences is disturbed. A country memory is seriously handicapped, since, as a rule, only those associations are accessible to immediate reproduction, with which abundant connections are engaged. Relatively isolated contents are quickly submerged, for which reason it is infinitely more difficult to retain a series of meaningless, incoherent words than a poem. Quick inflammability, rapidly fading enthusiasms are further characteristics of this type. There is also a certain want of taste, which arises from the too rapid succession of heterogeneous contents with a non-realization of their different emotional values. His thinking has a representative character. It tends more towards a quick representation and orderly arrangement of contents than toward abstraction and synthesis. In this outline of the type with the shorter secondary function, I have substantially followed Gross, with the addition of a few transcriptions into the normal. Gross called this type inferiority with shallow consciousness. But if the two unmitigated traits are turned down to a normal level, we get a general picture in which the reader will again easily recognize the less emotional type of Jordan, in other words, the extrovert. Full acknowledgement is due to Cross, since he was the first to establish a uniform and simple hypothesis for the production of this type. The type opposite to it is termed by Gross inferiority with contracted consciousness. In this type, the secondary function is particularly intensive and prolonged. By its prolongation, consecutive association is influenced to a greater extent than in the type mentioned above. Obviously, we may also assume an accentuated primary function in this case, and therefore a more extensive and complete self-performance that with the extrovert. A prolonged and reinforced secondary function would be the natural consequence of this. The prolonged secondary function causes a longer duration of the effect simulated by the initial idea. From this, we get that Gross terms a contractive effect, namely a specially directive choice, in the sense of the initial idea, of consecutive association. An extensive realization or approfondissement of the theme is thereby obtained. The idea has an enduring effect, the impression goes deep. One disadvantage of this is a certain limitation within a narrow range, whereby thinking suffers both in variety and abundance. Synthesis, notwithstanding, is essentially assistance, since the elements to be composed remain constellated long enough to render their adaptation possible. Moreover, this restriction to one team undoubtedly affects an enrichment of the relevant associations and the firm inner cohesion and integration of the complex. At the same time, however, the complex is shut off from all extraneous material and thus attains an associative isolation, a phenomenon which Gross, in support of Wernick's concept, term C-junction. A result of the C-junction of the complex is an accumulation of groups of ideas or complexes which have no mutual connection or only quite a loose one. 
Outwardly, such a condition reveals itself as its harmonious or, as Gross called it, a C-junctive personality. The isolated complexes exist side by side without any reciprocal influence. Accordingly, they do not interpret mutually leveling and correcting each other. In the selfies, they are strictly and logically integrated, but they are deprived of the correcting influence of different orientated complexes. Hence, it may easily come about that an especially strong and therefore particularly shut off and uninfluenced complex becomes an excessively valued idea, i.e., it becomes a dominant, defining every criticism and enjoining complete autonomy, until finally it comes to be an uncontrollable factor, in other words, clean. In pathological cases, we find it as a compulsive or paranoic idea i.e. it becomes an absolutely insurmountable factor, coercing the whole life of the individual into its service. As a result, the entire mentality becomes differently orientated, the standpoint becomes deranged. From this conception of the genesis of a paranoic idea, the fact may also be explained that, in certain incipient conditions, the paranoic idea can be corrected by means of an appropriate psychotherapeutic procedure. Namely, when the latter succeed in combining it with other broadening and therefore correcting complexes. There is also an undoubted awareness, uh, even an anxiety, connected with the reintegration of severed complexes. The things must remain clean and sundered. The bridges between the complexes must be, as far as possible, broken down by a strict and rigid formulation of the complex content. Gross calls these tendencies association fear. The strict inner seclusiveness of such a complex hampers every attempt at an external influence. Such an attempt has a prospect of success only when it succeeds in combining either the premises and or the conclusion of the complex, just as strictly and logically with another complex as they are themselves mutually bound. The accumulation of insufficiently connected complexes naturally affects a rigid seclusion from the outer world and, as we would say, a powerful heaping up of libido within. Hence, we regularly find an extraordinary concentration upon the inner processes, directed in accordance with the nature of the subject, either upon physical sensations in one preferentially oriented by sensation, or upon mental processes in the more intellectual subject. The personality seems arrested, absorbed, dispersed, sunk in thought, intellectually one-sided or hypochondriacal. In every case, there is only a meager participation in external life and a distinct inclination to an unsociable and solitary existence, which often finds compensation in a special love for plants or animals. The inner processes enjoy innate and activity, because from time to time, complexes which hitherto had only a slight connection, or even none at all, suddenly collide. This again gives rise to an intensive primary function which, in its turn, releases a long secondary function that amalgamates the two complexes. One might imagine that all the complexes would, at some time or other, collide in this way thus producing a general uniformity and integration on physical contents. Naturally, this wholesome result could take place only if, in the meantime, one were to arrest all change in the external life. But, since this is impossible, fresh stimuli are continually arriving and making new secondary functions, which intersect and confuse the inner lines. Consequently, this type has a decided tendency to hold external stimuli at a distance, to keep out of the path of change, to maintain life when possible, in its constant daily stream, until every interior amalgamation shall have been affected. In a diseased subject, this tendency is also clearly in evidence. He gets away from people as far as possible and endeavors to lead the life of a recluse. All in slightest cases, however, will the remedy be found in this way. In all the more severe cases, there is nothing for it but to reduce the intensity of the primary function, which problem, however, in a chapter in itself, and one which we have already attacked in the discussion of the Schiller letters. It is now clear that this type is distinguished by quite a defined affect phenomena, 
We have already seen how the subject realizes the association belonging to the initial presentation. It carries out a full and coherent association of the material relevant to the theme, insofar, that is, as there is no question of material already linked up with another complex. When a stimulus hits upon such material, i.e. upon a complex, the result is either a violent reaction and an affective explosion, or when the isolation of the complex precludes all contact and target negative. But when a realization takes place, all the affective values are released. A powerful emotional reaction occurs, which leaves a long after effect. Frequently, this remains outwardly unobserved, but actually it bores in all the deeper. These reverberations of the affect engross the individual's attention, incapacitating him from receiving new stimuli until the affect has faded away. An accumulation of stimuli becomes unbearable, when violent defense reactions appear. Wherever a strong complex accumulation occurs, a chronic attitude of defense usually develops, which may proceed to general distrust and, in pathological cases, to delusions of persecution. Sudden affective explosions alternating with taciturnity and defense often give such a bizarre appearance to the personality that these persons become quite enigmatic to their entourage. Their impaired realness due to inner absorption leaves them deficient whenever presence of mind or promptness of action is demanded. Accordingly, embarrassing situations frequently occur for which no remedy is at hand. One reason the more for the further seclusion from company. True, the occasional explosions confusion is created in one's relations to others, and the very presence of these perplexities and embarrassment incapacities one from restoring one's relations upon the right lines. This faulty adaptation leads to a series of untoward experiences, which unfairly beget a feeling of inferiority or bitterness, if not of actual animosity, that is really directed against those who were actually or ostensibly the originators of one's misfortune. The effective inner life is very intense, and the manifold emotional reverberations develop an extremely fine gradation and perception of feeling tones. There is a peculiar emotional sensibility, revealing in itself to the outer world in a peculiar timidity and uneasiest in the presence of emotional stimuli, or before every situation where such impressions might be possible. This touchness or irritation is specifically directed against the emotional conditions of the environment. Hence, from brusque expressions of opinion, assertions charged with affect, attempts to influence feeling, etc., there is an immediate and indistinctive defense proceeding, of course, from this very fear of the subject's own emotion, which might again release a reverberating impression whose force might overmaster him. From such sensitiveness, time may well develop a certain melancholy, due to a sense of being shut off from life. In another place, melancholy is mentioned by Gross as a special characteristic of this type. In the same passage, he also points out that the realization of the affective value easily leads to excessive emotional valuation, or to taking things too seriously. The strong relief given in this picture to the inner processes and the emotional life at once reveals the introvert. The description given by Gross is much fuller than Jordan's outline of the impassionated type, which must, however, in its main characters, be identical with the type pictured by Gross. In chapter 5 of his work, Gross observes that, within normal limits, both the inferiority types he describes present physiological differences of individuality. The shell of extensive or the nerve of intense consciousness is therefore distinctive of the whole character. According to Gross, the type of extensive consciousness is preferably practical because it is quick adaptation to the environment. The inner life does not predominate since it has no great part to play in the formation of great idea complexes. They are energetic propagandists of their own personality and, on a higher level, they also work for the great ideas already handed down. Gross asserts that the feeling life of this type is primitive. Taught in the higher representatives, it becomes organized 
through the taking over of ready-made ideals from without. His activity, therefore, with respect to the feeling life, can, as Gross says, become heroic. Yet, it is always banal. Heroic and banal scarcely seem compatible attributes. But Gross shows us at once what he means. In this type, there is not a sufficiently rich or developed connection between the erotic complex and the remaining caution content, i.e. with the remaining complexes, aesthetical, ethical, physiological and religious. At this point, Freud would speak of the repression of the erotic element. The distinct presence of this connection is regarded by Gross as a true sign of the superior nature. Page 61. For the sound formation of this connection, a prolonged secondary function is indispensable, since only through the approfondissement and prolonged consciousness of the necessary elements can such a synthesis be brought about. Sexuality can certainly be pressed into the paths of social utility, through the agency of accepted ideas, but it never mounts above the limits of triviality. These somewhat harsh judgments related to a circumstance rendered easily intelligible, in the light of the extraverted characters. The extrovert is exclusively orientated by external data, and it is always his preoccupation with the this wherein the principal bias of his physical activity lies. Hence, he has nothing at his command for the ordering of his inner affairs. They have to be subordinated, as a matter of course, to determinants accepted from without. Under such circumstances, no true connection between the more hidden and the less developed function can take place. For this demands a great expense of time and trouble. It is a lengthy and difficult labor of self-education which cannot possibly be achieved without introversion. But for this, the extravert lacks both time and inclination. Moreover, where he is so inclined, he is hampered by that same avoid distrust with which he envisaged his inner world, or the introvert the outer world. End of chapter 6, part 1. Section 6 of Psychological Types for the psychology of individuation. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Simona Perego. Physiological Types or the Psychology of Individuation by Carl Gustav Young. Translated by Helton Goodwin Baines. Chapter 6. The Type Problem in Psychiatry. Part 2. One should not imagine, however, that the introvert, thanks to his greater synthetic capacity and his greater ability for the realization of affective values, is thereby immediately fitted to carry out the synthesis of his own individuality, i.e. to establish the once and for all a harmonious association between the higher and the lower functions. I prefer this formulation to gross conception, which holds that the sole question is one of sexuality, since, in my view, it's not purely a question of sexuality, but of other instincts as well. Sexuality is, of course, a very frequent form of expression for undomesticated raw instincts, but the struggle for power in all its manifold aspects is an equally crude instinctive expression. Gross has invented the expression subjunctive personality for the introvert, by which he singles out the peculiar difficulty with which this type obtains any cohesion or connection between his several complexes. The synthetic capacity of the introvert merely serves to build complexes, as far as possible, isolated from each other. But such complexes are a direct hindrance of the development of the higher unity. Thus, in the introvert, also the complex of sexuality, or the egotistic striving for power, or the search for enjoyment, remains as far as possible isolated and sharply divorced from other complexes. For example, I remember an introverted and highly intellectual neurotic who wasted his time alternating between the loftiest flights of transcendental idealisms and the most squalid suburban brothers, without any conscious admission of the existence of a moral or aesthetic conflict. 
The two things were utterly distinct as thought belonging to different spheres. The result, naturally, was an acute compulsion neurosis. We must bear this criticism in mind when following gross elaboration of the type with intensive consciousness. Deepened consciousness is, as Gross says, the basis for the deepening of, of individuality. As a consequence of the strong contractive effect, external stimuli are always regarded from the standpoint of an idea. In place of the instinct for practical life, in so-called reality, there is an impelling tendency to approfondisment. Things are not conceived as individual phenomena, but as a partial ideas or constituents of a great idea complex. This conception of gross accurately coincides with our former reflection, a proposed discussion of the nominalistic and realistic standpoints with their antecedent representatives in the Platonic, Megaric and Cynic schools. In the light of gross conception, one may easily discern wherein the difference between the two standpoints exists. The man with the short secondary function as in a unit of time many and only loses connected the primary functions. Hence, he is specially held by the individual phenomenon and the individual case. For such a man, the universalia are only nominal and are deprived of reality. Whereas for the man with a long secondary function, the inner facts, abstract ideas or universalia are always in the foreground. They are to him the real and actual, to which he must relate all individual phenomena. He is, therefore, by nature a realist, in the scholastic sense. Since, for the introvert, a manner of thinking always takes precedence over perception of externals, he is inclined to be a relativist. Gross, page 63. Harmony in his surroundings gives him a special pleasure. Page 64. It corresponds with his inner pressure towards the harmonizing of his isolated complexes. He shuns every sort of unrestrained demeanor, for it may easily lead to disturbing stimuli. Cases of affect explosion must, of course, be expected. Social consideration, as a result of his absorption by inner processes, irritates Miller. The strong predominance of his own ideas does not favor an acceptance of the ideas or ideas of others. The intense inner elaboration of the complexes gives them a pronounced individual character. The feeling life is frequently unserviceable socially, but is always individual. Page 65. This statement of the author must be submitted to searching criticism, for it contains a problem which, in my experience, always gives occasion for the greatest misunderstandings between the types. The introverted intellectual, whom Gross clearly has uh, here in mind, thought outwardly showing as little feeling as possible, manifests logically correct views and actions, not least because in the first place he has a natural distaste for any parade or feeling, and secondly because he is fearful lest, by incorrect behavior, he should excite disturbing stimuli i.e. the affects of his fellow men. He is fearful of disagreeable effects in others because he credits others with his own sensitiveness. Furthermore, he has always been distressed by the quickness and apparent fitfulness of the extrovert. He represses his feeling, hence in his inner depths it occasionally swells to passion when only too clearly he perceives it. His tormenting emotions are well known to him. He compares them with the feelings shown by others, principally, of course, with those of the extroverted feeling type, and he finds that his feelings are quite different from those of other men. Hence, he embraces the idea that his feelings, or more correctly, emotions, are unique, i.e. individual. It is natural that they should differ from the feelings of the extroverted feeling type, since the latter are a differentiated instrument of, of adaptation, and are wanting, therefore, in the genuine passionateness which characterizes the deeper feelings of the introverted thinking type. But passion, as an elemental, instinctive force, possesses little that is individual, rather it's common to all men. Only what is differentiated can be individual. Hence, in the deepest affects, the distinctions of type are at once obliterated in favor of the universal or to human. In my view, the extroverted feeling type is really the chief claim to individualize feeling, because his feelings are differentiated. But where his thinking is concerned, he falls into a similar delusion. 
He has thoughts which torment him. He compares them with the ideas expressed in the world about him, i.e. ideas largely derived in the first place from the introverted thinking type. He discovers his thoughts have little in common with his ideas. He may therefore regard them as individual and himself, perhaps as an original thinker, or might he repress his thoughts altogether, since no one else thinks the same. In reality, however, his thoughts are common to all the words, although but seldom uttered. In my view, therefore, gross statement mentioned at both springs from a subjective deception, which, however, is also the general rule. The increased contractive power enables an absorption in things to which an immediate vital interest is no longer attached. Gross, page 65. Here, gross lights upon an essential trait of the introverted mentality. The introvert delights in developing ideas for their own own sake, quite apart from all external reality. Here he analyzes both the superiority and the danger. It is a great advantage to be able to develop an idea in an abstract sphere, where sense no longer intervenes. But there is a danger lest the train of thought should become removed for every practical application, and its value for life be proportionally diminished. Hence, the introvert is always somewhat in danger of getting too remote from life and of viewing things too much from their symbolical aspect. Gross also lays stress upon this character. The extrovert, however, is in no better plight, only for him matters are rather different. He has the capacity so to curtray his secondary function that he experiences almost nothing but the positive primary function, i.e. he no longer remains anchored to anything, but flies about reality in a sort of reasoning. Things are no longer seen and realized, but are merely used as stimulants. This capacity has a great advantage, for it enables one to maneuver oneself out of many difficult situations. Lost are told when thought thinkers of danger. Nietzsche. But it is also a great disadvantage, and catastrophe is its almost inevitable outcome, so often does it lead one into inextricable chaos. From the extraverted type, Gross produces the so-called civilizing genius and the so-called cultural genius from the introverted. The former corresponds with practical achievement, the latter with abstract invention. In conclusion, Gross expresses his conviction that our age stands in special need for the contracted, intensified consciousness, in contrast to former ages where consciousness was shallower and more extensive. Page 68. We delight in the ideal, the profound, the symbolical. Through simplicity to harmony, this is the art of the highest culture. Gross wrote this, to be sure, in the year 1902. And how is it now? If we were to express any opinion at all, we must confess that we manifestly need both civilization and culture, a shortening of the secondary function for the one and a prolongation for the other. For we cannot create the one without the other, and we are unhappily bound to admit that in humanity today there is a lack on either side. Or, let us say, where one is in excess, the other is deficient. Thus, to express ourselves more guardedly, for the continual harping upon progress has become untrustworthy and is under suspicious. In summing up, I would observe that the views of Gross coincide substantially with my own. Even my terms extraversion and introversion are justified from a standpoint of, of Gross conception. It only remains for us to make a critical examination of gross basis hypothesis, the concept of the secondary function. It is always a delicate matter. It is a framing of a physiological or organic hypothesis in connection with physiological processes. It will be familiar that, at the time of the great successes of brain research, a kind of mania prevailed for fabricating physiological hypotheses for psychological processes. Among these, the hypothesis that the cell processes withdrew during sleep is by no means the most absurd which received serious appreciation and scientific discussion. One was justified in speaking of a veritable brain mythology. But I have no desire to treat the gross hypothesis as a brain myth. Its working value is too important for that. 
It is an excellent working hypothesis, which was received repeated and well-deserved acknowledgement from other quarters. The idea of the secondary function is as simple as it is ingenious. This simple concept enables one to bring a very large number of complex physics phenomena into a satisfying formula. It deals, however, with phenomena whose diverse nature would have successfully withstood a simple reduction and classification by any other single hypothesis. With such a fortunate hypothesis, one is always tempted to overestimate its range and application. Such a possibility may well apply in this case, although in fact this hypothesis has unfortunately but limited range. Let us entirely disregard the fact that in itself the hypothesis is only a postulate, since no one has ever seen the secondary function of the brain cells, and no one could ever demonstrate why, theoretically, the secondary function should qualitatively have the same contractive effect upon the next association as the primary function, which, according to its definition, is essentially different from the secondary function. There is a further circumstance which, in my opinion, carries even greater weight, which, in one and the same individual, the habits of the psychological attitude can alter in a very short space of time. If the duration of the secondary function is of a physiological or organic character, it must surely be regarded as more or less permanent. It is not to be expected, then, that the duration of the secondary function should suddenly change. Such changes are never found in a physiological or organic character pathological changes, of course, accepted. But, as I have already emphasized more than once, introversion and extroversion are not characters at all, but mechanisms, which can, as it were, be inserted or disconnected at will. Only from their habitual predominance to the corresponding characters develop. There is an undoubted predilection depending upon a certain inborn disposition, which, however, is not always absolutely decisive for one or other mechanism. I have frequently found the milieu's influences to be almost equally important. On one occasion, a case actually came within my own experience, in which a man who had presented a marked extraverted demeanor while living in the closest proximity to an introvert changed his attitude and became quite introverted when subsequently closely involved with a pronounced extraverted personality. I have repeatedly observed in what a short space of time certain personal influences affect an essential alteration in the duration of the secondary function, even in a well-defined type, and how the former condition becomes re-established with the disappearance of the foreign influence. With such experiences in view, we should, I think, direct our interest more to the constitution of the primary function. Gross himself lays stress upon the special prolongation of the secondary function after strong effects, thus bringing the secondary function into a dependent relation upon the primary function. There exists, in fact, no sort of plausible ground where the theory of types should be based upon the duration of the secondary function. It might conceivably be grounded equally well upon the intensity of the primary function, since the duration of the secondary function is obviously dependent upon the intensity of energy consumption and cell performance. We might naturally rejoin that the duration of the secondary function depends upon the rapidity of restoration and that there may be individuals with a especially prompt cerebral assimilation, as opposite to others who are less favored. In this were the case, the brain of the extrovert must possess a higher restitution capacity than that of the introvert. To such a very improbable assumption, very basis of proof is lacking. What is known to us of the actual causes of the prolonged secondary function is limited to the fact that, leaving pathological conditions on one side, the special intensity of the primary function affects, quite logically, a prolongation of the secondary function. Hence, in accordance with the fact, the real problem would lie with the primary function and may be resolved into the question, whence comes it that in one the primary function is uh, as rule intensive, uh, while in other it is weak. If we must shift the problem up on the primary function, we have undertaken to explain the varying intensity and uh, the manifestly rapid alteration of intensity of the primary function. It is my belief that this is an energetic phenomenon dependent upon the general attitude. 
The intensity of the primary function seems to be directly related to the degree of tension involved in the state of readiness. Where a large amount of physical tension is present, the primary function will also have a special intensity with corresponding results. When with increasing fatigue, tension diminishes, a tendency to deviation and the superficiality of association appear, proceeding to fly of ideas, a condition, in fact, which is characterized by a weak primary and short secondary function. The general physical tension, apart from physiological causes such as relaxation, etc., is dependent upon extremely complex factors, such as mood, attention, expectation, etc., i.e. upon judgments of value, which in turn are again results of all the antecedent physical processes. By this, of course, I do not understand logical judgments only, but also feeling judgments. Technically, we should express the general tension in the energetic sense as a libido, while in the physiological sense relating to consciousness, we should refer to it as value. The intensive process is a charge with libido. In other words, it is a manifestation of libido, a high tension and energetic process. The intensive process is a physiological value, hence the associative combinations proceeding from it are termed valuable as opposite to those which are the result of slightly contractive effect. This we described as worthless or superficial. The tense attitude is essentially characteristic only for the introvert, while the relaxed, easy attitude denotes the extrovert, apart, of course, from exceptional conditions. Exceptions, however, are frequent even in one and the same individual. Give the introvert a totally congenial, harmonious milieu, and he relaxes and expands to complete extraversion, until one begins to wonder whether one may not be dealing with an extrovert. But transfer the extrovert into a dark and silent chamber, where every repressed complex can know at him, and he will be reduced to a state of tension, in which the faintest stimulus becomes a poignant realization. The changing situations of life can have a similar effect momentarily reversing the type, but the preferential attitude is not, as a rule, permanently altered, i.e. in spite of occasional extraversion, the introvert remains what he was before, and the extrovert likewise. To sum up, the primary function is, in my view, more important than the secondary. The intensity of the primary function is the decisive factor. It depends upon the general physical tension, i.e. upon the sum of accumulated and disposable libido. The factor that is conditioned by this accumulation is a complex matter and is the resultant of all the antecedent physical states. It may be characterized as mood, attention, emotional state, expectation, etc. Introversion is distinguished by general tension, intensive primary function, and the corresponding long secondary function. Extraversion is characterized by general relaxation, weak primary function, and the corresponding short secondary function. End of section 6, part 2. Section 32 of Psychological Types, or The Psychology of Individuation. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Psychological Types, or The Psychology of Individuation by Carl Gustav Jung. Translated by Helton Godwin Baines, 1882 to 1943. Section 32. Chapter 7. The Problem of Typical Attitudes in Aesthetics. It is, as it were, self-evident that every province of the human mind that is either directly or indirectly concerned with psychology should yield its contribution to the question we are here discussing. Now that we have listened to the philosopher, the poet, the physician, and the observer of men, let us hear what the representative of aesthetics has to say. Aesthetics has to deal not only with the aesthetic nature of things, but also, and in perhaps even higher degree, with the psychological question of the aesthetic attitude. Not for long could such a fundamental phenomenon as the opposition of introversion and extroversion escape the aesthetic standpoint, since the form and manner in which art and beauty are sensed and regarded by different individuals 
differ so widely that one could not but be struck by this opposition. Disregarding the many, more or less, sporadic and unique individual peculiarities of attitude, there exist two contrasting basic forms, which Waringer has described as feeling into empathy, footnote one, and abstraction, footnote two. Footnote one. There exists, unfortunately, no English equivalent for Einfühlung. Notwithstanding a certain unavoidable clumsiness such a term involves, I have preferred the literal feeling into to a more manageable, though inadequate, rendering such as empathy. Translator. End of footnote 1. Footnote 2. Warringer. Abstraktion und Einfühlung. Third edition. Munich, 1911. End of footnote 2. His definition of feeling into is derived principally from lips. For lips, feeling into is the objectification of my quality into an object distinct from myself, whether the quality objectified merits the term feeling or not. While I am in the act of apperceiving an object, I experience as though in it or issuing from it as something apperceived and present in it, an impetus towards a definite manner of inner behaviour. This appears as given through it, as though imparted to me by it. Footnote 1. Lips, Leitfaden der Psychologie. Second edition, 1906, page 193. End of footnote 1. Yodel, footnote 2, interprets it as follows. The sensuous appearance given by the artist is not merely an inducement which brings to our mind kindred experiences by the laws of association, but, since it is subordinated to the universal laws of externalization, footnote 3, and appears as something outside of ourselves, we also project into it those inner processes which it reproduces in our minds. Footnote 2, Jodel, Lehrbach de Psychologie, 1908, volume 2, page 436, end of footnote 2. Footnote 3. By externalization, Yodel understands the localizing of the sense perception in space. We neither hear tones in the ear, nor do we see colors in the eye, but in the spatially localized object. Loco citato, volume 2, page 247. End of footnote 3. We thereby give it aesthetic animation, an expression which may be preferred to the term feeling into. Because, in this introjection of one's own inner state into the picture, it is not feeling alone that is concerned, but every sort of inner process. By Wundt, feeling into is reckoned among the elementary assimilation processes. Footnote 4. Wundt, Grundzüge der Physiologischen Psychologie. 5th edition, volume 3, page 191. End of footnote 4. Feeling into, therefore, is a kind of perception process, distinguished by the fact that it transveys, through the agency of feeling, an essential psychic content into the object, whereby the object is introjected. This content, by virtue of its intimate relation with the subject, assimilates the object to the subject, and so links it up with the subject that the latter senses himself, so to speak, in the object. The subject, however, does not feel himself into the object, but the object felt into appears rather as though it were animated and expressing itself of its own accord. This peculiarity depends upon the fact that the projection transfers an unconscious content into the object, whence also the feeling into process is termed transference, Freud in analytical psychology. Feeling into, therefore, is an extraversion. Waringer defines the aesthetic experience in feeling into as follows. Aesthetic enjoyment is objectified pleasure in oneself. Loco citato, page 4. Consequently, only that form is beautiful into which one can feel oneself. Lip says, only so far as this feeling into extends are forms beautiful. Their beauty is simply this my ideal, 
freely living itself out in them. Aesthetic, page 247. The form into which one cannot feel oneself is, accordingly, ugly. Herein is also involved the limitation of the feeling into theory, since there exist art forms, as Waringer points out, whose products do not correspond with the attitude of feeling into. Specifically, one might mention the oriental and exotic art forms as being of this nature. But, with us in the West, long tradition has established natural beauty and truth to nature as the criterion of beauty and art, since it is also the criterion and essential character of Greco-Roman and Occidental art in general, with the exception, however, of certain medieval forms. For ages past, our general attitude to art has been one of feeling into, and we can describe as beautiful only a thing into which we can feel ourselves. If the artistic form of the object is opposed to life, inorganic or abstract, we cannot feel our life into it, whereas this naturally always takes place when we have a feeling into relationship with the object. What I feel myself into is life in general. Lips. We can feel ourselves only into organic form, form that is true to nature and has the will to live. And yet another art principle certainly exists, a style that is opposed to life, that denies the will to live, that is distinct from life and yet makes a claim to beauty. When artistic energy creates forms whose abstract, inorganic quality is opposed to life, there can no longer be any question of a creative will arising from the feeling into need. Rather is it a need to which feeling into is directly opposed, in other words, a tendency to suppress life. The impulse to abstraction would seem to be this counter-urge to the feeling into need. Warringer, Loco Citato, page 16. Concerning the psychology of this impulse to abstraction, Warringer says, What psychic suppositions are there for the impulse to abstraction? Among those peoples where it exists, we must look for them in their feeling towards the world, in their psychic behavior vis-a-vis -vis the cosmos. Whereas the feeling into impulse is conditioned by a happy, pantheistic, trustful relationship between man and the phenomena of the outer world, the impulse to abstraction is the result of a great inner uneasiness or fear of this phenomena, and in the religious connection corresponds with a strong transcendental coloring of every idea. Such a state might be called an immense spiritual agrophobia. When Tabulus says, Primum in mundo fecit Deus timorum, the first thing God made in the world was fear, this very feeling of dread is admitted as the primal root of artistic energy. This is literally true. Feeling into does presuppose a subjective attitude of readiness or trustfulness vis-a-vis -vis the object. It is a free movement of response, transveying a subjective content into the object, thus producing a subjective assimilation, which brings about a good understanding between subject and object, or at least simulates it. A passive object allows itself to be assimilated subjectively, but in doing so its real qualities are in no way altered, although through the transference they may become veiled, or even, conceivably, violated. Through the feeling into process, similarities and apparently common qualities may be created which have no real existence in themselves. It is quite understandable, therefore, that the possibility of another kind of aesthetic relation to the object must also exist, an attitude, namely, that neither responds nor advances to the object, but, on the contrary, seeks to withdraw from it and to ensure itself against any influence on the part of the object by creating a subjective psychic activity whose function it is to paralyze the effect of the object. To a certain extent, the feeling into attitude presupposes an emptiness of the object, which can thereupon be imbued with its own life. Abstraction, on the other hand, presupposes a certain living and operating force on the part of the object, hence it seeks to remove itself from the object's influence. Thus, the abstracting attitude is centripetal, it is introverted. Waringer's concept of abstraction, therefore, corresponds with the introverted attitude. It is significant that Waringer describes the influence of the object in terms of fear or dread. 
Thus, the abstracting attitude would have a posture vis-à-vis -vis the object suggesting that the latter had a threatening quality, it est an injurious or dangerous influence against which it must defend itself. Doubtless, this apparently a priori quality of the object is also a projection of transference, but a transference of a negative kind. We must, therefore, assume that the act of abstraction is preceded by an unconscious act of projection in which negatively stressed contents are transferred to the object. Since feeling into, like abstraction, is a conscious act, and since the latter is preceded by an unconscious projection, we may reasonably ask whether feeling into may not also be preceded by an unconscious act. Since the nature of feeling into is a projection of subjective contents, the antecedent unconscious act must be the opposite, videlicit a neutralizing of the object, it is making it inoperative. For by this means the object is, as it were, emptied, robbed of spontaneity, and thereby made a suitable receptacle for the subjective contents of the feeling into individual. The feeling into subject seeks to feel his life into the object, to experience in and through the object. Hence it is essential that the independence of the object and the difference between it and the subject be not too manifest. Through the unconscious act preceding the feeling into process, the independent power of the object is thus depotentiated or overcompensated because the subject forthwith unconsciously superordinates himself to the object. But this act of superordination can happen only unconsciously through an intensification of the importance of the subject. This may happen through an unconscious fantasy which either deprives the object forthwith of its value and force or enhances the value of the subject, placing him above the object. Only by such means can that difference of potential arise which the act of feeling into demands for the subjective contents to be transferred into the object. The man with the abstracting attitude finds himself in a terribly animated world which seeks to overpower and smother him. He therefore retires himself, so that in himself he may contrive that redeeming formula which can be relied upon to enhance his subjective value to a point where at least it shall be a match for the influence of the object. The man with the feeling into attitude finds himself, on the contrary, in a world that needs his subjective feeling to give it life and soul. Confidingly he bestows his animation upon it, while the abstracting individual retreats mistrustingly before the demons of objects and builds up a protective counterworld with abstract creations. If we recall our argument of the preceding chapter, we shall easily recognize the mechanism of extroversion in the feeling into attitude and that of introversion in the abstracting. The great inner uneasiness occasioned by the phenomena of the outer world is nothing but the stimulus fear of the introvert, who, as a result of his deeper sensibility and realization, has a real dread of too rapid or too powerful changes of stimuli. Through the agency of the general concept, his abstractions also serve a most definite aim, videlicit, to confine the changing and irregular within law-abiding limits. It is self-evident that this, at bottom, magical procedure is to be found in fullest flower among the primitives, whose geometrical signs are less valuable from the standpoint of beauty than for their magical properties. End of section 32. Recording by Rachel May Ferryman. Section 33 of Psychological Types, or the Psychology of Individuation. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Psychological Types, or the Psychology of Individuation, by Carl Gustav Jung. Translated by Helton Godwin Baines, 1882 to 1943. Section 33. Of the Orientals, Waringer rightly says, Tormented by the confused combination and changing play of external phenomena, such people were overtaken by an immense need of repose. The possibility of happiness which they sought in art consisted not so much in immersing themselves in the things of the outer world 
and seeking pleasure therein, as in the raising of the individual thing out of its arbitrary and seemingly accidental existence, with a view to immortalizing it within the sphere of abstract form, wherein to find a point of rest amid the ceaseless stream of phenomena. Loco Citato, page 18. These abstract, law-determined forms, therefore, are not merely the highest, but indeed the only forms wherein man may find repose in face of the monstrous confusion of the world spectacle. Loco Citato, page 21. As Waringer says, it is precisely the oriental religious and art forms which exhibit this abstracting attitude to the world. To the oriental, therefore, the world in general must appear very different from what it does to the occidental, who animates his object with the feeling into attitude. To the oriental, the object is imbued with life a priori and always tends to overwhelm him. Thus, he withdraws himself in order to abstract his impressions from it. An illuminating insight into the oriental attitude is offered by Buddha in the Fire Sermon, where he says, All is in flames. The eye and all the senses stand in flames kindled by the fire of love, by the fire of hate, by the fire of delusion. Through birth, ageing and death, through pain and lamentations, through sorrow, suffering and despair is the fire kindled. The whole world standeth in flames, the whole world is wrapped and shadowed in smoke, the whole world is devoured by fire, the whole world quaketh. It is this fearful and sorrowful vision of the world that forces the Buddhist into his abstracting attitude, as indeed, according to legend, Buddha also was brought to his life's quest through a similar impression of the world. The dynamic animation of the object as the fons et erigo of abstraction is strikingly expressed in Buddha's symbolic language. This animation is not dependent upon feeling into, but corresponds rather with an a priori unconscious projection, a projection actually existing from the beginning. The term projection hardly seems qualified to carry the real meaning of this phenomenon. Projection is really an act that transpires, and not a condition existing from the beginning, which is clearly what we are dealing with here. It seems to me that Levi Brühl's concept participation mystique is more descriptive of this condition, seeking as it does to formulate the primordial relationship of the primitive to his objects. For the primitive, objects have a dynamic animation, charged, as it were, with soul stuff or soul force, not absolutely soul endowed as is assumed by the animistic hypothesis, so that they have an immediate psychic effect upon the man, producing what is practically a dynamic identification with the object. Thus, in certain primitive languages, objects of personal use have a gender denoting alive, the suffix of the thing living. With the abstracting attitude, it is much the same, for here also the object has an a priori animation and independence. Far from needing any feeling into on the part of the subject, the object commands so strong an influence that introversion is almost forced upon one. The powerful unconscious libido charge of the object is dependent upon its participation mystique with the unconscious of the introverting subject. This is clearly implied in the words of Buddha. The world fire is identical with the subject's libido fire, the expression of his burning passion, which, however, appears objective to him because it is not yet differentiated into a subjectively disposable function. Abstraction, then, seems to be a function which is at war with the original state of participation mystique. Its effort is to part from the object, thus to put an end to the object's tyrannical hold. Its effect is either to lead to the creation of art forms or to the cognition of the object. Similarly, the function of feeling into is just as effective as an organ of artistic creation as it is of cognition but it can take place only upon a very different basis from that of abstraction. For, just as the latter is grounded upon the magical importance and power of the object, feeling into is rooted in the magical importance of the subject, whereby the object is secured by means of mystical identification. It is similar with the primitive, who, on the one hand, is magically influenced by the power of the fetish, and at the same time is also the magician, 
the accumulator of magical power who dispenses potency to the fetish. Confer the Turunga rites of the Australians. Footnote 1. Spencer and Gillen, the Northern Tribes of Central Australia, London, 1904. End of footnote 1. The unconscious depotentiation of the object, which results from the act of feeling into, means also a permanent, more moderate valuation of the object. For in this case, the unconscious contents of the feeling into subject are identical with the object, thus making it appear inanimate. Footnote 2. Because the unconscious contents of the feeling into subject are themselves relatively inanimate. End of footnote 2. For this reason, feeling into is necessary for the cognition of the nature of the object. One might speak in this case of a continually existing unconscious abstraction which presents the object as inanimate, for abstraction has always this effect. It kills the independent activity of the object insofar as this is magically related to the psyche of the subject. The abstracting attitude performs this consciously in order to protect itself from the magical influence of the object. From the a priori inanimateness of the object, there likewise proceeds that relation of trust which the feeling into subject has towards the world. There is nothing there that could inimically affect or oppress him, since he alone dispenses life and soul to the object, although to his conscious appreciation the converse would seem to be true. But to the man with the abstracting attitude, the world is filled with powerfully operating and therefore dangerous objects. These inspire him with fear and with a consciousness of his own impotence. He withdraws himself from too close contact with the world, thus to create those ideas and formulae with which he hopes to gain the upper hand. His, therefore, is the psychology of the oppressed, whilst the feeling into subject confronts the object with an a priori confidence. Its inanimateness has no dangers for him. This characterization is naturally schematic and makes no pretense to be a complete portrait of the extroverted or introverted attitude. It merely emphasizes certain nuances, which nevertheless have a not inconsiderable importance. Just as the feeling into subject is really taking unconscious delight in himself by way of the object, so the abstracting subject unwittingly sees himself while meditating upon the impression that reaches him from the object. For what the feeling into subject transveys into the object is himself, it is his own unconscious content. And what the abstracting man thinks concerning his impression of the object is really thoughts about his own feelings, which appear to him as though belonging to the object. It follows, therefore, that both functions are involved in a real understanding of the object, as indeed they are also essential to a real creativeness in art. Both functions are also constantly present in the individual, although for the most part unequally differentiated. In Waringer's view, the common root of these two basic forms of aesthetic experience is the need for self-divestiture. In abstraction, the effort of the subject is to be wholly delivered from the fortuitous in human affairs, the apparently arbitrary power of general organic existence, in the contemplation of something immovable and necessary. In face of the bewildering and impressive profusion of animated objects, the individual creates an abstraction. It is an abstract and general image, which conjures impressions into a law-abiding form. This image has the magical importance of a defense against the chaotic change of experience. He becomes so lost and submerged in this image that finally its abstract truth is set above the reality of life, and therewith life, which might disturb the enjoyment of abstract beauty, is wholly suppressed. He raises himself to an abstraction. He identifies himself with the eternal validity of his image, and therein congeals since it practically amounts to a redeeming formula. In this way, he divests himself of his real self and transfers his life into his abstraction, in which it is, so to speak, crystallized. But since the feeling into subject feels his activity, his life, into the object, he therewith also yields himself to the object, insofar as the felt into content represents an essential part of the subject. He becomes the object, he identifies himself with it and in this way gets rid of himself. Because he objectifies himself, he therefore desubjectifies himself. Waringer says, 
But since we feel this will to activity into another object, we are in the other object. We are released from our own individual being, just insofar as our urge for experience engrosses us in an outer object or an extrinsic form. In contrast to the limitless diversity of individual consciousness, we feel our individuality flowing, as it were, within fixed bounds. In this self-objectification, there lies a self-divestiture. At the same time, this affirmation of our individual need for activity represents a restriction of its illimitable possibilities, a negation of its irreconcilable diversities. We needs must rest with our inner urgings towards activity within the limits of this objectification. Loka Citato, page 27. As in the case of the abstracting individual, the abstract image represents a comprehensive formula, a bulwark against the disintegrating effects of the unconsciously animated object. Footnote 1. So for the feeling into subject, the transference to the object is a defense against the disintegration caused by inner subjective factors which consist in boundless fantasy possibilities and corresponding impulses to activity. Footnote 1. Friedrich Theodor Fischer, in his novel Auch Eine, gives an excellent picture of animated objects. End of footnote 1. Although, according to Adler, the introverted neurotic is held fast to a fictitious guiding line, the extroverted neurotic clings no less tenaciously to his transference to the object. The introvert has abstracted his guiding line from his good and evil experiences with objects, and he trusts himself to his formula as a means of defense against the unlimited possibilities of life. Feeling into and abstraction, extroversion and introversion, are mechanisms of adaptation and defense. Insofar as they make adaptation possible, they protect man from external dangers. Insofar as they are directed functions, footnote 2, they liberate him from fortuitous impulses. Moreover, they actually protect him, since they render self-divestiture possible for him. Footnote 2. Confer directed thinking. Jung, Psychology of the Unconscious, Chapter 1, Pages 13, Folio. As our daily psychological experience testifies, there are numbers of men who are wholly identified with their directed function, the valuable function, and among them are those very types we are here discussing. Identification with the directed function has the incontestable advantage that by so doing a man can best adapt himself to collective claims and expectations. Moreover, it also enables him to avoid his inferior, undifferentiated and undirected functions through self-divestiture. Besides, from the standpoint of social morality, unselfishness is always considered a particular virtue. But, upon the other side, we have to weigh the great disadvantage that inevitably accompanies this identification with the directed function. Videlicit, the degeneration of the individual. Man, doubtless, is capable of a very extensive reduction to the mechanical level, although never to the point of complete surrender without suffering gravest injury. For the more he is identified with the one function, the more does its overcharge of libido withdraw libido from the other functions. For a long period, maybe, they will endure even an extreme deprivation of libido, but in time they will inevitably react. The draining of libido involves their gradual relapse below the threshold of consciousness. Their associative connection with consciousness gets loosened until they sink by degrees into the unconscious. This is synonymous with a regressive development, namely a recession of the relatively developed function to an infantile and eventually archaic level. But since man has spent relatively only a few thousand years in a cultivated state, as opposed to many hundred thousand years in a state of savagery, the archaic function ways are correspondingly extraordinarily vigorous and easily reanimated. Hence, when certain functions become disintegrated through deprivation of libido, their archaic foundations begin to operate in the unconscious. This condition involves a dissociation of the personality, for, the archaic functions having no direct relation with consciousness, no practicable bridges exist between the conscious and the unconscious. It follows, therefore, that the further self-divestiture goes, the further do the atonic functions decline towards the archaic. Therewith, the importance of the unconscious also increases. 
it begins to provoke symptomatic disturbances of the directed function, thus producing that characteristic circulus vitiosus, which we encounter in so many neuroses. The patient seeks to compensate the unconsciously disturbing influence by means of special performances of the directed function. And so the chase continues, even on occasion to the point of nervous collapse. Conceivably, this possibility of self-divestiture through identification with the directed function depends not only upon a one-sided restriction to the one function, but also upon the fact that the nature of the directed function is a principle which actually demands self-divestiture. Thus, every directed function demands the strict exclusion of everything not suited to its nature. Thinking excludes every harassing feeling, just as feeling excludes each disturbing thought. Without the repression of everything that differs from itself, the directed function cannot operate at all. But on the other hand, the self-regulation of the living organism makes such a strong natural demand for the harmonizing of human nature that the consideration of the less favored functions forces itself to the front as a necessity of life and an unavoidable task in the education of the human race. End of section 33 Read by Rachel May Ferryman Section 34 of Psychological Types, or the Psychology of Individuation. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Avian X. Psychological Types, or the Psychology of Individuation, by Carl Gustav Jung. Translated by Helton Godwin Baines, 1882 to 1943. Chapter 8. The Problem of Types in Modern Philosophy. 1. William James's Types. The existence of the two types has also been revealed in modern pragmatic philosophy, particularly in the philosophy of William James. He says, The history of philosophy is, to a great extent, that of a certain clash of human temperaments, characterological dispositions, page 6, of whatever temperament a professional philosopher is, he tries, when philosophizing, to sink the fact of his temperament. Yet his temperament really gives him a stronger bias than any of his more strictly objective premises. It loads the evidence for him one way or the other, making for a more sentimental or a more hard-hearted view of the universe, just as this fact or that principle would. He trusts his temperament. Wanting a universe that suits it, he believes in any representation of the universe that does suit it. He feels men of the opposite temper to be out of key with the world's character, and in his heart considers them incompetent and not in it in the philosophical business, even though they may far excel him in dialectical ability. Yet in the forum he can make no claim, on the bare ground of his temperament, to superior discernment or authority. There arises thus a certain insincerity in our philosophic discussions, the potentest of all our premises never mentioned. Whereupon James proceeds to the characterization of the two temperaments. Just as in the province of manners and customs we find formalists and free and easy persons, in the political world authoritarians and anarchists, in literature purists or academicals and realists, in art classics and romantics, so in philosophy, according to James, there are also to be found two types, that is, the rationalist and the empiricist. The rationalist is your devotee to abstract and eternal principles. The empiricist is the lover of facts in all their crude variety. Although no man can dispense either with facts or with principles, yet entirely distinct points of view develop which correspond with the value given to either side. James makes rationalism synonymous with intellectualism, and empiricism with sensationalism. Although, in my opinion, this comparison is not sound, we will continue with James's line of thought, reserving our criticism for the time being. According to his view, an idealistic and optimistic tendency is associated with intellectualism, while empiricism inclines to materialism and a purely conditional and precarious optimism. Rationalism, intellectualism, is always monistic, it begins with the whole and the universal and unites things, 
whereas empiricism begins with the part and converts the whole into a collection. The latter, therefore, may be termed pluralistic. The rationalist is a man of feeling, while the empiricist is a hard-headed creature. The former is naturally disposed to a firm belief in free will, the latter to fatalism. The rationalist is readily dogmatic in his statements, whereas the empiricist is skeptical. Page 10. James describes the rationalist as tender-minded, the empiricist as tough-minded. His aim, clearly, is to characterize the peculiar quality of the two mentalities. We may take a further opportunity of examining this characterization rather more closely. It is interesting to hear what James has to say concerning the prejudices, which are mutually cherished by the two types. They have a low opinion of each other. Their antagonism, whenever as individuals their temperaments have been intense, has formed in all ages a part of the philosophic atmosphere of the time. It forms a part of the philosophic atmosphere of today. The tough think of the tender as sentimentalists and softheads. The tender feel the tough to be unrefined, callous, or brutal. Each type believes the other to be inferior to itself. Page 12. James catalogues the qualities of both types in two contrasting columns, thus. Tender-minded. Rationalistic, going by principles. Intellectualistic. Idealistic. Optimistic. Religious. Free willist, monistic, and dogmatical. Tough minded, empiricist, going by facts, sensationalistic, materialistic, pessimistic, irreligious, fatalistic, pluralistic, and skeptical. This comparison touches upon various problems we have met with already in the chapter upon nominalism and realism. The tender minded has certain traits in common with the realist and the tough-minded with the nominalist. As I have already pointed out, realism corresponds with the principle of introversion, nominalism with extroversion. Without doubt, the Universalia controversy also belongs, in the first place, to that historical clash of temperaments and philosophy to which James alludes. These associations prompt us to regard the tender-minded as introverted, and the tough-minded as extroverted. It devolves upon us, however, to redouble our scrutiny before deciding whether or not this combination is valid. From my naturally somewhat limited knowledge of James's writings, I have not succeeded in discovering any more detailed definitions or descriptions of the two types, although he frequently refers to these two kinds of thinking, and incidentally describes them as thin and thick. Flournoy interprets thin as mons, tenu, magre, chétif and thick as épais, solide, massif, cosul. James, on one occasion, also uses the expression soft-headed for the tender-minded. Both soft and tender suggest something delicate, mild, gentle, light, hence weak, subdued, and rather powerless, in contrast to thick and tough, which are resistant qualities, solid and hard to change, recalling the nature of matter and substance. Flournoy accordingly elucidates the two kinds of thinking as follows. It is the opposition between the abstractionist manner of thinking, in other words, the purely logical and dialectical fashion so dear to philosophers, which fails, however, to inspire James with any confidence, appearing to him as fragile, hollow chative, because too withdrawn from the contact of individual things and the concrete manner of thinking which is nourished on the facts of experience and never quits the earthy region of tortoise shells and other positive facts. Page 32. We should not, of course, conclude from this commentary that James has a one-sided approval of concrete thinking. He appreciates both standpoints. Facts are good, of course. Give us lots of facts. Principles are good. Give us plenty of principles. Admittedly, a fact never exists only as it is in itself, but also as we view it. If, therefore, James describes concrete thinking as thick or tough, he thereby demonstrates that for him this kind of thinking has something substantial and resistant, while abstract thinking appears as something weak, thin, and pallid, perhaps even, if we interpret with Flournoy, 
rather sickly and decrepit. Naturally, such a view is possible only for one who has made an a priori connection between substantiality and the concrete fact, and that, as we have already said, is just where the question of temperament comes in. If the empirical thinker attributes resistant substantiality to his concrete thinking, from the abstract standpoint he is deceiving himself, because substantiality, or hardness, belongs to the external fact and not to his empirical thinking. In fact, the latter turns out to be particularly weak and decrepit, for so little does it know how to maintain itself in the presence of the external fact, that it must always be running after, even depending on, sense-given facts, and, in consequence, can hardly be said to rise above the level of a mere classifying or presenting activity. From the thinking standpoint, therefore, there is something very frail and dependent about concrete thinking, because, instead of having stability in itself, it depends upon outer objects, which are superordinated to thought as determining values. Hence, this kind of thinking is characterized by a succession of sense-bound representations, which are set in motion not so much by an inner thought activity as by the changing stream of sense perceptions. A succession of concrete representations conditioned by sensuous perceptions is not precisely what the abstract thinker would term thinking, but at best only a passive apperception. The temperament that prefers concrete thinking and grants it substantially is distinguished, therefore, by a preponderance of sense-conditioned representations, as against active apperception, which springs from a subjective act of will, whose aim it is to command the sense-determined representations in accordance with the tendencies of an idea. To put it more briefly, more weight is given to the object in such a temperament. The object is felt into, it maintains a quasi-independent behavior in the idea world of the subject and carries comprehension along in its train. This is therefore an extroverting temperament. The thinking of the extrovert is concretistic. His soundness and stability do not lie in himself, but very largely outside of himself in the felt-into facts of experience, whence also James's qualification tough is derived. To the man who is always ranged upon the side of concrete thinking, i.e. upon the side of representations of facts, abstraction appears as something feeble and decrepit, something he is well able to dispense with in face of the solidarity of concrete, sense-established facts. But for the man who is on the side of abstraction, it is not the sense-conditioned representation, but the abstract idea, which is the decisive factor. According to the current conception, an idea is nothing but an abstraction of a sum of experiences. With such a notion, the human mind is readily conceived as a sort of tabula rasa that gradually gets covered with the perceptions and experiences of life. From this standpoint, which in the widest sense is the standpoint of our empirical science, the idea can be nothing at all but an epiphenomenal a posteriori abstraction from experiences hence feebler and more colorless than these. But we know that the mind cannot be a tabula rasa, since we have only to criticize our principles of thought to perceive that certain categories of our thinking are given an a priori, i.e. antecedent to all experience, and make a simultaneous appearance with the first act of thought being, in fact, its preformed conditions. For what Kant proved for logical thinking holds good for the psyche over a still wider range. At the beginning, the psyche is no more a tabula rasa than is the mind, the province of thought. To be sure, the concrete contents are lacking, but the contents, possibilities, are given a priori through the inherited and preformed functional disposition. The psyche is simply the product of brain functioning throughout our whole ancestral line, a precipitate of the adaptation efforts and experiences of the phylogenetic succession. Hence, the newly born brain or function system is an ancient instrument, prepared for quite definite ends. It is not merely a passive, apperceptive instrument, but is also an active command of experience outside itself, forcing certain conclusions or judgments. These adjustments are not merely accidental or arbitrary happenings, but adhere to strictly preformed conditions, which are not transmitted as our perception contents through experience, but are a priori conditions of apprehension. They are ideas, anti-rem, form determinants, 
basic lines engraven a priori, assigning a definite formation to the stuff of experience, so that we may regard them as images, as Plato also conceived them, as schemata as it were, or inherited function possibilities which, moreover, exclude other possibilities or, at all events, restrict them to a great extent. This explains why even fantasy, the freest activity of the mind, can never roam in the infinite, albeit so the poet senses it, but remains bound to the preformed possibilities, the primordial images or archetypes. In the similarity of their motives, the fairy tales of the most remote peoples show this binding connection to certain root images. The very images which underlie scientific theories reveal this inherent restrictiveness. For example, ether, energy, its transformations in its consistency, the atomic theory, affinity, and so forth. Just as the sense-given representation prevails in and gives direction to the concretely thinking mind, so the contentless and therefore unrepresentable archetype is paramount in the mind that thinks abstractly. It remains relatively inactive so long as the object is felt into and thus raised to the determining factor of thought. But when the object is not felt into and thus deprived of its priority in the mental process, the energy thus denied to it returns again to the subject. The subject is unconsciously felt into, whereupon the preformed images are awakened from their slumber, emerging as effective factors in the mental process, although in unrepresentable form, rather like invisible stage managers behind the scenes. Being merely activated function possibilities, they are without contents, therefore unimaginable. Accordingly, they strive towards realization. They draw the stuff of experience into their shape, presenting themselves in facts rather than presenting facts. They clothe themselves in facts, as it were. Hence, they are not a known starting point, like the empirical fact in concrete thinking, but only become experienceable through their unconscious shaping of the stuff of experience. Even the empiricist can arrange and shape the material of his experience. He nevertheless forms it as far as possible after a concrete idea which he has built up on the basis of past experience. The abstractionist, on the other hand, shapes an unconscious model, only gaining an a posteriori experience of the idea, which was his model, by a consideration of the phenomenon he has formed. The empiricist, working from his own psychology, is always inclined to assume that the abstractionist shapes the material of experience in a quite arbitrary fashion from certain pale, feeble, and inadequate premises, measuring as he does the mental process of the abstractionist by his own modus prescendendi. The actual premise, i.e. the idea or root image, is, however, just as unknown to the abstractionist as, in the case of the empiricist, is that theory which, after such and such experiments, he will subsequently build up out of experience. As was explained in an earlier chapter, the one sees the individual object and interests himself in its individual behavior, while the other has mainly in view the relations of similarity between objects and disregards the individuality of the fact. Amidst the disintegration of multiplicity, he finds more peace and comfort in what is uniform and coherent. To the former, however, the relation of similarity is frankly burdensome and harassing, something that may even hinder him from seizing the perception of the object's particularity. The further he is able to feel himself into the individual object, the more he discerns its peculiarity and the more the reality of a relation of similarity with another object vanishes from his view. But if he also knew how to feel himself into another object, he would be in a position to sense and understand the similarity of both objects to a far higher degree than the man who viewed them simply and solely from without. It is because he first feels himself into one object and then into the other that the concrete thinker comes only very slowly to the discernment of the connecting similarities, and for this reason his thinking appears torpid and sluggish. But his feeling into flows readily. The abstract thinker quickly seizes the similarity, replaces the individual object by general distinguishing marks, and shapes this material with his own inner thought activity, which, however, is just as powerfully influenced by the shadowy archetype as is the concrete thinker by the object.
The greater the influence the object has upon thinking, the more are its characters stamped upon the thought image. But the less the object operates in the mind, with all the more power will the a priori idea set to impress upon experience. Through the exaggerated importance of the empirical object, there has arisen in science a sort of specialist theory, as, for instance, that familiar brain mythology which appeared in psychiatry, wherein an attempt was made to explain a very large domain of experience from principles, which, although pertinent for the elucidation of certain constellations of facts within narrow limits, are wholly inadequate for every other function. But, on the other hand, Abstract thinking, which accepts one individual fact only because of its similarity with another, creates a universal hypothesis which, while bringing the idea to a more or less clear presentation, has just as much or as little to do with the nature of concrete facts as a myth. Both thought forms, therefore, in their extreme expressions, create a mythology, the one expressing it concretely with cells, atoms, vibrations, and so forth, the other with eternal ideas. Extreme empiricism has, at least, this advantage. It brings facts to the clearest possible presentation. But the advantage of extreme ideologism is that it reflects back the a priori forms, the ideas or archetypes, with the utmost purity. The theoretical results of the former are exhausted with their material. The practical results of the latter are confined to the presentation of the psychological idea. Because our present scientific mind adopts a one-sided, concrete, and purely empirical attitude, it has no standard by which to value the man who presents the idea, since, in the estimation of the empiricist, facts rank higher than the knowledge of those primordial forms in which human intelligence conceives them. This tacking towards the side of concretism is, as we know, a relatively recent acquisition, a relic from the Epoch of Enlightenment. The results of this development are astonishing, but they have led to an accumulation of empirical material whose very immensity gradually produces more confusion than clarity. It inevitably leads to a scientific separatism, and therewith to a specialist mythology, which spells death to universality. But the preponderance of empiricism not only means a smothering of active thinking, it also involves a danger to the laying down of sound theories within any branch of science. The absence of a general viewpoint favors mythical theory building, just as much as does the absence of an empirical point of view. In my view, therefore, James's tender-minded and tough-minded are manifestly but a one-sided terminology, and at bottom conceal a certain prejudice. But it should, at least, have become evident from this discussion that James's characterization deals with those same types which I have termed the introverted and the extroverted. End of chapter 8. The Problem of Types in Modern Philosophy. 1. William James's Types. Recording by Avian X. Section 35 of Psychological Types or the Psychology of Individuation. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Avian X. Psychological Types, or the Psychology of Individuation, by Carl Gustav Jung. Translated by Helton Godwin Baines, 1882 to 1943. Chapter 8.2, The Characteristic Pairs of Opposites in James's Types, Part 1. A. The first pair of opposites instanced by James as a distinguishing feature of the types is rationalism versus imperialism. As the reader will have remarked, I have already dealt with this antithesis in a previous chapter, conceiving it as the opposition between ideologism and empiricism. I have avoided the expression rationalism because concrete empirical thinking is just as rational as active ideological thinking. The ratio governs both forms. There exists, moreover, not merely a logical rationalism, but also a feeling rationalism, for rationalism is nothing but a general psychological attitude towards reasonableness of thought and feeling. With this understanding of the concept rationalism, I find myself in a definite and conscious opposition to the historical philosophical conception which understands rationalistic in the sense of ideological, thus conceiving rationalism as the supremacy of the idea. 
With the modern philosophers, however, the ratio has been stripped of its purely ideal character. It is even described as a capacity, instinct, intention, as a feeling even, or again, a method. At all events, considered psychologically, it is a certain attitude governed, as Lipp says, by the feeling of objectivity. Baldwin regards it as the constitutive regulative principle of the mind. Herbart interprets it as the capacity of reflection. Schopenhauer says of the reason that it has only one function, namely the shaping of the idea, and from this unique function all those above-mentioned manifestations, which distinguish the life of man from that of the animal, are very easily and completely explained, and in the application or non-application of that function, positively everything is meant which men in all places and of all times have called reasonable or unreasonable. The above-mentioned manifestations refer to certain properties of reason, instanced by Schopenhauer by way of example, namely, the command of affects and passions, the capacity for drawing conclusions and constructing general principles, the concerted action of several individuals, civilization, the state, also science and the preservation of previous experience, etc. If reason, as Schopenhauer asserts, has the function of forming ideas, it must also possess the character of that psychic attitude which is fitted to shape ideas through the activity of thought. It is entirely in this sense of an attitude that Jerusalem also conceives the reason, namely as a disposition of the will which enables us, in our decisions, to make use of our reason and control our passions. Reason, therefore, is the capacity to be reasonable, a definite attitude which enables thought, feeling, and action to correspond with objective values. From the standpoint of empiricism, this objective value is the yield of experience, but from the ideological standpoint, it is the result of a positive act of valuation on the part of the reason, which in the Kantian sense would be a faculty of judgment and action in accordance with basic principles. For, with Kant, the reason is the source of the idea, which is the reasoning concept whose object can positively not be encountered in experience, and which contains the primordial image of the use of the mind, as a regulative principle for the purpose of gaining general coherence in our empirical mental practice. Logic, page 140. This is a genuinely introverted view. In vivid contrast to this is the empiricistic view of want, who declares that the reason belongs to a group of complex intellectual functions, knit together into one general expression, together with their antecedent phases which yield them an indispensable sensuous substratum. It is self-evident that this concept, intellectual, is a survival of the faculty psychology, and suffers possibly even more than such old concepts as memory, mind, fantasy, etc., from confusion with logical points of view which have nothing to do with psychology. What is more natural, therefore, than that it should become all the more indefinite, and at the same time more arbitrary, the more manifold the psychic contents it embraces? If, to the standpoint of scientific psychology, there exists no memory, no mind, and no fantasy, but merely certain elementary psychic processes and their relations which, with rather arbitrary discrimination one includes under those names, still less, of course, can there exist an intelligence or an intellectual function, but merely a uniform, permanently restricted concept corresponding with matter-of-fact. Nevertheless, certain cases remain where it is useful to avail oneself of these borrowed concepts from the old inventory of the faculty psychology, even though one uses them in a sense modified by their psychological acceptation. Such cases arise whenever we consider complex phenomena of very variously mingled constituents, which, on account of the regularity of their combination, and above all on practical grounds, demand our consideration, or when individual consciousness, affords us definite tendencies of design and formation, and when, once again, the regularity of the combination challenges an analysis of such complex mental capacities. But in all these cases, it is naturally the task of psychological research not to remain rigidly adherent to the general concepts thus formed, but to reduce them, whenever possible, to their simple factors. This view is thoroughly extroverted. I have italicized the specially characteristic passages. Whereas, to the introverted point of view, general concepts such as reason, intellect, etc., are faculties, i.e. simple basic functions which embrace in a uniform sense the multiplicity of the psychic processes governed by them, 
To the standpoint of the extroverted empiricist, they are nothing more than secondary, derived concepts, elaborations of those elementary processes upon which the holders of this view lay the chief value. According to this standpoint, it is better that we should have no dealings with such concepts, but should, on principle, constantly reduce them to their simple factors. Obviously, for the empiricist, any other than reductive thinking in connection with general concepts is simply out of the question, since for him concepts are mere derivatives of experience. He can have no sort of knowledge of rational concepts or a priori ideas, since his passive, apperceptive thinking is oriented by sense-conditioned experience. As a result of this attitude, the object is always accentuated. It is, as it were, active necessitating perceptions and complicated reasonings, but these demand the existence of general concepts which, however, serve only to comprise certain groups of phenomena under one collective designation. Thus, the general concept is, naturally, a mere secondary factor which, apart from language, has no real existence. Science, therefore, can concede to reason, fantasy, etc., no right to independent existence, so long as it supports the view that only what is present as sense-accredited matter-of-fact, elementary factors, has any real existence. But when thinking, as in the case of the introvert, is oriented by active apperception, reason, intellect, fantasy, etc., have the value of basic functions, or faculties, i.e. powers or activities operating externally from within, this is because the accent of value for this standpoint is given to the concept, and not to the elementary process covered and comprised by the concept. Such a thinking is fundamentally synthetic. It is regulated in accordance with the schema of the concept, and employs the material of experience for the fulfillment of its ideas. The concept appears as the active principle just by reason of its own inner force, which seizes and shapes the material of experience. The extrovert assumes that the source of this force is mere arbitrary choice, or else an ill-considered generalization from limited experience. The introvert, who is unconscious of his own thought psychology, and may have even adopted the empiricism in vogue as his guiding principle, finds himself defenseless against this reproach. But the reproach itself is merely a projection of extroverted psychology. For the active thinking type derives the energy of his thought activity neither from arbitrary choice nor from experience, but from the idea, i.e. from the innate functional form which is activated through his introverted attitude. To him, this source is unconscious, since by reason of its a priori lack of content he can only become aware of the idea in an a posteriori formation, namely in the form which the material of experience assumes through its elaboration by thought. But, to the extrovert, the object and the elementary process are important and indispensable, because he has unconsciously projected the idea into the object. Hence, he is able to mount to the concept, and therewith to the idea, only through empirical accumulation and comparison. The two ways of thinking are mutually opposed in a remarkable way. The one shapes the material out of his own unconscious idea, and thus comes to experience. The other lets himself be guided by the material which contains his unconsciously projected ideas, and thus reaches the idea. There is something intrinsically irritating in this conflict of attitude, and, at bottom, this is the cause of the most heated and futile scientific discussions. I trust that this discussion sufficiently illustrates my view, that the ratio and its one-sided elevation to a principle, that is, rationalism, applies equally well both to empiricism and to ideologism. Instead of ideologism, we might have used the term idealism, but to this application of the word, its antithesis materialism stands opposed, and it would have been impossible to use ideological as opposed to materialistic, since the materialist, as the history of philosophy testifies, may be, and often is, just as much of an ideologist. For example, when he is not an empiricist, but thinks actively from the universal concept of matter. B. The second pair of opposites advanced by James is intellectualism versus sensationalism. Sensationalism is the expression that characterizes the nature of extreme empiricism. It postulates sense experience as the unique and exclusive source of cognition. The sensationalistic attitude is entirely oriented by the sense-given object. Its orientation, therefore, is outward. 
James evidently means an intellectual rather than an aesthetic sensationalism, but intellectualism even then scarcely seems its appropriate antithesis. Psychologically, intellectualism is an attitude that is distinguished by the fact that it gives the principal determining value to the intellect, i.e. to cognition upon a conceptual level. But with such an attitude I can also be a sensationalist. That is, I may engage my thinking with concrete concepts wholly derived from sense experience. Hence, the empiricist may also be intellectual. In philosophy, intellectualism and rationalism are employed almost promiscuously. Hence, ideologism must again be used as the antithesis to sensationalism, since, in its essence, sensationalism is only an extreme empiricism. C. James's third pair of opposites is idealism versus materialism. One may have already begun to wonder whether by sensationalism James merely intended an intensified empiricism, i.e. an intellectual sensationalism, or whether, in using the expression sensationalistic, he may conceivably have wished to bring out the quality pertaining to sensation as a function quite apart from the intellect. By pertaining to sensation, I mean true sensuousness, sinlichkeit, not of course as voluptus in the vulgar sense, but as a psychological attitude in which the orientating and determining factor is not so much the felt into object as the mere fact of a sense stimulation and sense perception. This might also be described as a reflexive attitude, i.e. an attitude based on reflex phenomena, since the whole mentality depends upon and culminates in sense perception. The object is neither realized abstractly, nor felt into, but operates through its natural form and manner of existence, the subject being exclusively oriented by sense impressions stimulated by contact with the object. This attitude would correspond with a primitive mentality. Its essential antithesis is the intuitive attitude, which is distinguished by an immediate sensing or apprehension that is neither intellectual nor feeling, but contains both an inseparable combination. Just as the sensuous object appears in perception, so the psychic content also appears in intuition, hence as quasi-illusionary or hallucinatory. That James should describe the tough-minded as both sensationalistic and materialistic, and further still as irreligious, encourages the doubt as to whether, in his description of the types, he is really in view the same type antithesis as I have. Materialism, as commonly understood, is an attitude whose orientation corresponds with material values, in other words, a kind of moral sensationalism. Hence, James's characterization would yield a very unfavorable portrait if we were to misconstrue these expressions in the sense of their common significance. But this must not be imputed to James, whose observations upon these types quoted above should prevent any such misunderstanding. We are almost justified, therefore, in assuming that James is principally concerned with the philosophical significance of the terms in question. Materialism, then, means an attitude naturally orientated by material values, not, however, by sensuous so much as fact values, wherein fact signifies something external and, in a sense, concrete. Its antithesis is idealism, in the philosophical sense of a supreme valuation of the idea. It cannot be a moral idealism that is meant here, for in that case we should have to assume, contrary to James's intentionalism, that his materialism means a moral sensationalism. But, if we assume that by materialism he means an attitude wherein the principal orientating value is given to actual reality, we are again in a position to trace an extroverted peculiarity in this attribute, whereat our original doubts vanish. We have already seen that philosophical idealism corresponds with introverted ideologism. A moral idealism would be in no way characteristic for the introvert, for the materialist can also be morally idealistic. End of chapter 8.2 The Characteristic Pairs of Opposites in James's Types, Part 1 Recording by Avian X Section 36 of Psychological Types, or the Psychology of Individuation. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Avian X. Psychological Types, or the Psychology of Individuation, 
by Carl Gustav Jung. Translated by Helden Godwin Baines, 1882 to 1943. Chapter 8.2 The Characteristic Pairs of Opposites in James's Types. Part 2. D. The fourth pair of opposites is optimism versus pessimism. I am extremely doubtful whether this familiar antithesis, by which, indeed, human temperaments can be differentiated, is really applicable to James's types. Is, for instance, the empiricism of Darwin also pessimistic? It is undoubtedly true of the man who, with an ideological view of the world, sees the other human types through the glasses of an unconscious feeling projection. But even the empiricist is by no means wont to conceive his view as pessimistic on that account. Or take the thinker Schopenhauer, for instance, whose world philosophy is purely ideologistic, in all respects like the pure ideologism of the Upanishads. Is he somewhat of an optimist, according to the James classification? Kant himself, a very pure introverted type, stands as remote from either optimism or pessimism as do the great empiricists. It seems to me, therefore, that this antithesis has nothing to do with James's types. Just as there are optimistic introverts, there are also optimistic extroverts, and vice versa. It would, however, be quite possible for James to have fallen into this mistake as a result of the subjective projection previously referred to. A materialistic or purely empiricistic or positivistic world philosophy seems utterly cheerless from the standpoint of the ideologist. He must, therefore, sense it as pessimistic. But, to the man who puts his faith in the god matter, the materialistic view of the world seems optimistic. From the ideological standpoint, the materialistic conception seems to sever the vital nerve, since its chief power, active apperception and the realization of the archetypes, is thereby paralyzed. To the ideologist, therefore, such a view must appear completely pessimistic, for it robs him of all hope of ever again beholding the eternal idea embodied and realized upon the phenomenal plane. A world of real facts would mean banishment and perpetual homelessness. When, therefore, James draws a parallel between the materialistic and the pessimistic points of view, we are entitled to infer that he personally may belong to the ideologistical side an assumption that may easily be substantiated by numerous other characteristics from the life of this philosopher. This circumstance might also explain why the tough-minded has been saddled with the three somewhat dubious epithets sensationalistic, materialistic, and irreligious. This inference is further corroborated by that passage in Pragmatism, where James compares the material aversion between the types with a rencontre between Bostonian tourists and the inhabitants of Cripple Creek. Footnote 1. James, Pragmatism, page 13. The Bostonians are notorious on account of their spiritualized aestheticism. Cripple Creek is a well-known mining district in Colorado. The contrast can be easily imagined. Each type believes the other to be inferior to itself, but disdain in the one case is mingled with amusement. In the other, it has a dash of fear. End of footnote 1. This comparison is hardly flattering to the other type, and allows one to infer an emotional aversion against which even a strong desire for justice does not wholly prevail. This little human document seems to me a most valuable witness to the existence of an irritating disparity between the two types. It may, perhaps, seem trivial that I should make rather a point of such incompatibilities of feeling. But numerous experiences have convinced me that it is just such feelings as these, lying unobserved in the background of consciousness, that occasionally deflect even the most impartial reasoning, coloring it with prejudice and wholly thwarting understanding. It is, indeed, conceivable that the Cripple Creek inhabitants might also eye the Boston tourists in their own particular way. E. The fifth pair of opposites is religiousness versus irreligiousness. Naturally, the validity of this antithesis for James's type psychology depends essentially upon the definition he gives to religiousness. If he conceives its nature wholly from the ideologistical standpoint, as an attitude in which the religious idea plays a dominant role, in contrast to feeling, 
He is certainly justified in describing the tough-minded as also irreligious. But James's thought is so wide and so essentially human that he can hardly have omitted to see that the religious attitude can also be determined by religious feeling. In fact, he himself says, But our esteem for facts has not neutralized in us all religiousness. It is itself almost religious. Our scientific temper is devout. The empiricist replaces a lack of respect for eternal ideas by an almost religious belief in the actual fact. If a man's attitude is orientated by the idea of God, it would be psychologically the same were he orientated by the idea of matter, or were he to exalt real facts to the determining factor of his attitude. Only insofar as this orientation takes place unconditionally does it deserve the epithet religious. But, considered from a high standpoint, the real fact has the value of an unconditional factor equally with the idea, the archetype, which is the age-long product of the reactions and repercussions of man, and his inner determinants with the hard facts of external reality. At all events, from the psychological standpoint, absolute surrender to real facts can never be described as irreligious. The tough-minded has his empiricistic, just as the tender-minded has his ideologistic religion. It is, however, also a fact of our present cultural epoch that science is governed by the object, religion by the subject, i.e., ideologism, for the primordial self-operative idea must take refuge somewhere when, as in science, it has been ousted from its place by the object. If religion is thus understood as the present-day phenomenon of culture, James is so far justified in describing the empiricist as irreligious, but only thus far. For philosophers are not an absolutely isolated class of men, and their types also will reach to common humanity, far beyond the province of philosophic men, perchance extending even to civilized humanity in general. On this general ground, therefore, it is surely not permitted to class as irreligious the half of civilized mankind. From the psychology of the primitive, we know that the religious function belongs simply to the constitution of the psyche, and is constantly and everywhere present, however undifferentiated it might be. If we are not to assume a limitation of James's concept of religion, such as we have just alluded to, then again it must be a question of an affective derailment, which, as we have already seen, can happen only too easily. F. The sixth pair of opposites is indeterminism versus determinism. This antithesis is, psychologically, of great interest. It is obvious that empiricism thinks causally, whereby the necessary connection between cause and effect is axiomatically assumed. The empiricistic attitude is orientated by the felt-into object. It is, as it were, impressed by the external fact with a sense of the inevitability of effect following cause. It is quite natural that the impression of the unalterableness of the causal connection should, psychologically, obtrude itself upon such an attitude. The identification of the inner psychic processes with the course of external facts is already granted by the fact that a considerable sum of one's own activity in life is unconsciously bestowed upon the object in the act of feeling into. The subject is therefore assimilated into the object, although the feeling into subject believes that it is the object which is assimilated. But, whenever a strong accent of value is laid upon the object, it at once assumes an importance which, in its turn, also influences the subject, forcing him to a dissimulation from himself. Human psychology is admittedly chameleon-like. This is a fact of daily experience in the work of the practical psychologist. Where the object is constantly paramount, an assimilation to the nature of the object takes place in the subject. Thus, for example, identification with a loved object plays no small part in analytical therapy. Furthermore, the psychology of the primitive provides us with abundant examples of dissimulation in favor of the object, as, for instance, the frequent assimilation to the totem animal or ancestral spirits. The stigmatizing of saints in medieval and even recent times belongs also to this connection. 
In the Imitatio Christi, dissimulation is actually exalted to a principle. In view of this unquestionable aptitude of the human psyche for dissimulation, the translation of the objective causal connections into the subject can be easily understood. The psyche, accordingly, labors under an impression of the unique validity of the causal principle, and the whole armory of the theory of cognition is required to ward off the overmastering power of this impression. This is further aggravated by the fact that the very nature of the empiricistic attitude prevents one from believing in the inner freedom, since every proof, indeed every possibility of proof, is lacking. Of what consequence is that frail, indefinite feeling of freedom in the face of the overwhelming mass of objective proofs to the contrary? The determinism of the empiricist, therefore, is almost inevitable, assuming that the empiricist carries his thinking to its logical conclusion and does not prefer, as infrequently happens, to possess two compartments, one for science and the other for religion he has acquired from his parents and from society. As we have already seen, the essence of ideologism consists in the unconscious activation of the idea. This activation can result from an aversion to feeling into acquired later in life, or it can exist from birth as an a priori attitude, fashioned and favored by nature. I have, in my practical experience, seen many such cases. In this latter case, the idea has an a priori activity, without, however, appearing in consciousness, which is accounted for by its emptiness and unrepresentability. As a paramount, inner though unrepresentable fact, it is superordinated to objective external facts, and yields, at least in a sense of its independence and freedom to the subject, who, as a result of this inner assimilation to the idea, feels himself independent and free vis-a-vis -vis the object. When the idea is the principal orientating factor, it assimilates the subject to its own quality just as completely as the subject tries to assimilate the idea to himself through the shaping of the material of experience. Thus, as in the above-mentioned attitude to the object, there takes place a dissimulation of the subject from himself. In the reverse sense, however, that is, in favor of the idea. The inherited archetype survives all ages. It is a factor superordinated to every change upon the phenomenal plane, preceding and superseding all individual experience. Hence, the idea acquires a particular force. Its activation transveys a pronounced feeling of power into the subject, since it assimilates the subject to itself by means of inner unconscious identification. There dawns within the subject a feeling of power, independence, freedom, and eternity. Compare to Kant's postulate of God, freedom, and immortality. When the subject senses the free activity of his idea exalted above the reality of facts, the idea of freedom makes its natural claim upon him. If his ideologism is pure, he must certainly arrive at a conviction of free will. The antithesis here reviewed is highly characteristic for our types. The extrovert is distinguished by his striving towards the object, his feeling into an identification with the object, and his will dependence upon the object. He is influenced by the object in the same degree as he strives to assimilate it. The introvert, on the other hand, is distinguished by his apparent self-assertion in presence of the object. He struggles against every dependence upon the object, he repels every influence from the object, on occasion he even fears the object. All the more, however, is he dependent upon the idea which shields him from outer reality and yields him to this feeling of inner freedom, albeit in return. It also gives him a pronounced power psychology. G. James's seventh antithesis is monism versus pluralism. It is at once intelligible from the foregoing argument that the attitude orientated by the idea must tend towards monism. The idea is always a hierarchical character, whether it be gained by abstraction from representations and concrete concepts, or whether it has an a priori existence as an unconscious form. In the former case, it is the highest point of the building which, in a sense, rounds off and comprises everything subordinated to it. In the latter, it is the unconscious lawgiver, regulating the possibilities and necessities of thought. The idea in both instances has a ruling quality. 
Although a plurality of ideas may be present, yet for a longer or shorter period one idea gains the upper hand, constellating the majority of the psychic elements in a monarchical fashion. Conversely, it is equally clear that the attitude orientated by the object must always incline to a majority of principles, pluralism, since the multiplicity of objective qualities entails also a plurality of concepts and principles, without which a suitable interpretation of the nature of the object cannot be gained. The monistic tendency belongs to the introverted attitude, the pluralistic to the extroverted. H. The eighth antithesis is dogmatism versus skepticism. It is also easy to see in this case that dogmatism is the attitude par excellence that follows and clings to the idea, although an unconscious realization of the idea is not eo ipso dogmatic. It is nonetheless true that the way in which an unconscious idea is almost violently embodied inevitably persuades one to believe that the man in whom the idea is paramount starts out from a dogma in whose rigid folds the material of experience is impressed. It is self-evident that the attitude governed by the idea must have an a priori skepticism in relation to all ideas, since its chief desire is that objective experience in general should be allowed its say, undisturbed by universal concepts. In this sense, skepticism is an actually indispensable precondition of all empiricism. This pair of opposites also confirms the essential similarity between James's types and my own. End of chapter 8.2, The Characteristic Pairs of Opposites in James's Types, Part 2, Recording by Avian X. Section 37 of Psychological Types, The Psychology of Individuation. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Avian X. Psychological Types, or The Psychology of Individuation, by Carl Gustav Jung. Translated by Helton Godwin Baines, 1882 to 1943. Chapter 8.3, General Criticism of James's Conception. In criticizing James's conception, I must first lay stress upon the fact that it is almost exclusively concerned with the thinking qualities of the types. In a philosophical work, one could hardly expect otherwise. But such a necessarily one-sided setting readily gives rise to confusion, for without difficulty one could demonstrate this or that quality, or even a number of them, in the opposite type. For example, there are empiricists who are dogmatic, religious, idealistic, intellectualistic, and rationalistic. There are also ideologists who are materialistic, pessimistic, deterministic, and irreligious. Even were one to show that such expressions designate very complex matters in which many diverse nuances are in question, the possibility of confusion would not be remedied. Taken individually, James's expressions are too broad. Only in their totality do they give an approximate picture of the typical contrast, without thereby bringing it to a simple formula. In general, James's types are a valuable supplement to the picture of the types we have gained from other sources. James was the first to indicate, with a certain distinctness, the extraordinary importance of temperament in the shaping of philosophical thinking, and for this great credit is due. For the aim of his pragmatic conception was to reconcile the antagonisms of philosophical views resulting from temperamental differences. Pragmatism, as we know, is a widespread philosophical current originating in the English philosophy, F.C.S. Schiller of Oxford, which assigns a value to truth that is restricted to its practical efficacy and usefulness, quite unconcerned about its contestability from this or that standpoint. It is characteristic that James should introduce his presentation of this philosophical view with just this very contrast of types, thus practically establishing the necessity of a pragmatic point of view. So the drama, which was already given to us by early medieval psychology, is repeated. At the time, the opposition was worded, nominalism versus realism, and it was Abelard who attempted the reconciliation in his sermonism or conceptualism. But since the understanding of that day was entirely wanting in a psychological point of view, his attempted solution turned out to be correspondingly one-sided in its purely logical and intellectual bias. 
James takes a deeper grasp. He conceives the opposition psychologically, and accordingly attempts a pragmatic solution. It would, however, be unwise to cherish any illusions concerning the value of this solution. Pragmatism is but a makeshift, which may claim to be valid only so long as no further sources are discovered that could add fresh elements to the shaping of philosophical viewpoints, other than the possibilities of cognition, which are shaped and colored by temperament. Bergson certainly has pointed to intuition and the possibility of an intuitive method, but it admittedly remains merely an indication. A proof of the method is lacking and will not be so easily forthcoming, although Bergson may point to his concepts of élan vital and de récréatrice as the results of intuition. Apart from this intuitively conceived basic view, which derives its psychological justification from the fact that, even in antiquity, particularly with Neoplatonism, it was already a thoroughly familiar combination of ideas, the Bergson method is intellectual and not intuitive. Nietzsche made use of the intuitive source in an incomparably greater measure, and by doing so was able to free himself from the purely intellectual in the shaping of his philosophical ideas. But he did this in such a way, and to such a degree, that his intuitionism went far beyond the limits of a philosophical system, and led him to an artistic creation, i.e. to something which, for the most part, is inaccessible to philosophical criticism. I refer naturally to the Zarathustra, and not to the collection of philosophical aphorisms which offer themselves in the first place to philosophical criticism by very reason of their prevailing intellectualistic method. If, therefore, one may speak at all of an intuitive method, Nietzsche's Zarathustra has, in my opinion, furnished the best example of it. Moreover, it has strikingly demonstrated the possibility of a non-intellectualistic, though nonetheless philosophical, comprehension of the problem. Schopenhauer and Hegel appear to be the forerunners of the Nietzschean intuitionism, the former on account of the feeling intuition which lends such a decisive coloring to his views, and the latter by virtue of the conceptual intuition underlying his whole system. With these two forerunners, if one may use such an expression, intuition ranked below the intellect, but with Nietzsche it ranked above it. The opposition between the two truths demands a pragmatic attitude if one desires to do any sort of justice to the other standpoint. Yet indispensable though the pragmatic method may be, it presupposes too great a resignation, thus becoming almost unavoidably bound up with a lack of creativeness. But the solution of the conflict of the opposites can proceed neither from a logico-intellectual compromise, as in conceptualism, nor from a pragmatic estimation of the practical value of logically irreconcilable views, but simply and solely from the positive creation which receives the opposites into itself as necessary elements of coordination, just as a coordinated muscular movement always involves the innervation of antagonistic muscle groups. Pragmatism, therefore, can only be a transitional attitude that shall prepare the way for creation by the elimination of prejudice. This new way, which pragmatism prepares, and Bergson indicates, German philosophy, not, of course, the academic schools, has, in my view, already trodden. It was Nietzsche, with a violence particularly his own, who burst open this closed door. His creation leads far beyond the unsatisfying formula of the pragmatic solution, and it has accomplished this just as fundamentally, as the pragmatic recognition of the living value of a truth transcends the arid one-sidedness of the unconscious conceptualism of the post-Abelardian philosophy, and still there are heights to be scaled. End of chapter 8.3 General Criticism of James's Conception Recording by Avian X Section 38 of Psychological Types for the Psychology of Individuation This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Avian X. Psychological Types for the Psychology of Individuation by Carl Gustav Jung. Translated by Helton Godwin Baines, 1882 to 1943. Chapter 9. The Type Problem in Biography. Part 1. As one might almost expect, the province of biography also yields its contribution to the problem of psychological types. Chiefly, 
we have to thank the natural science method of Wilhelm Ostwald, who was able, by means of a biographical comparison of certain outstanding natural scientists, to establish a typical psychological antithesis, which he termed the classic and romantic types. While the former, says Ostwald, is characterized by the well-rounded perfection of each individual achievement, and at the same time by a rather withdrawn nature whose personal effect upon his environment is but slight, the romanticist stands out by reason of the very opposite characters. His quality lies not so much in the perfecting of individual work, as in the variety and telling originality of numerous achievements that follow each other in rapid succession. In addition, the effect he exercises upon his contemporaries is, as a rule, immediate and impressive. It must also be pointed out that the rapidity of mental reaction is the decisive criterion of the particular type to which the scientist belongs. Pioneers who possess great reactive rapidity are the romantics, while those with slower mental reactions are the classics. The classic produces slowly, as a rule, only bringing forth the ripest fruit of his mind relatively late in life. A never-failing characteristic of the classic type, according to Ostwald, is the absolute need to stand without error or blemish in the public eye. As a compensation for his lack of personal influence, the classic type is assured an all the more potent effect with his writings. This effect, however, seems also to be beset with limitations, as the following case, quoted by Ostwald from the biography of Helmholtz, testifies. Apropos Helmholtz's mathematical researches concerning the effect of induction shocks, de bois Raymond writes to the scientist, You should devote yourself, and please don't take this amiss, much more carefully to the problem of how to abstract yourself from your own standpoint of science, so that you may understand the standpoint of one who, as yet, knows nothing about the matter, or what it is you want to discuss. To which Helmholtz replies, And as to the paper, I really took great pains this time in the presentation of my material, and I imagined that, at last, I might be satisfied with it. Whereat Ostwald observes, he is quite oblivious of the problem from the reader's point of view, because, true to his classic type, he is writing for himself, i.e., he presents the material in a way that seems to him indisputable, while the rest do not matter at all. What de bois Raymond writes in the same letter to Helmholtz is extremely characteristic. I have read both the treatise and the summary several times without understanding what you have actually done, or the way you did it. Finally, I myself discovered your method, and I am now gradually beginning to understand your presentation. For the classic type, this case is true to the life, for he seldom or never succeeds in kindling souls of the like nature with his own, a thoroughly typical event, which shows that the influence ascribed to him through writing is, as a rule, largely posthumous, i.e. it appears only in the subsequent discovery of his writings, as in the case of Robert Mayer. Moreover, his writings often seem to lack any convincing, inspiring, or directly personal appeal, since ultimately, writing is just as much a personal expression as a conversation or lecturing. The influence the classic type transmits through writing depends not so much, therefore, upon the externally stimulating qualities of his writings, as upon the circumstance that these are all that finally remain of him, and that only from these can the man's actual achievement subsequently be reconstructed. For it seems to be a fact, which is also alluded to in Ostwald's description, that the classic seldom communicates what he is doing and the way that he does it, but only what he arrives at, quite regardless of the fact that his public possesses no inkling of his route. It would seem that his way and method of work are of less importance to the classic just because they are more intimately linked up with his personality, which is something he always keeps in the background. Oswald compares his two types of the four ancient temperaments, with special reference to the peculiarity of slow or rapid reactions, which in his view seems to be fundamental. The slow reaction corresponds with the phlegmatic and the melancholic temperaments, the quick reaction with the sanguine and the choleric. He regards the sanguine and the phlegmatic as the normal middle types, whereas the choleric and the melancholic seem to him morbid exaggerations of the basic character. If one glances through the biographies of Humphrey Davy and Liebig upon the one hand, and of Robert Mayer and Faraday upon the other, 
one cannot but perceive that the former are both distinctly romantic and sanguinely choleric, while the latter are just as clearly classic and phlegmatically melancholic. This observation of Ostwald seems to me entirely convincing, since the four antique temperaments were most probably constructed from the same principle of experience as that upon which Ostwald has also established the classic and romantic types. The four temperaments are obviously differentiated from the standpoint of affectivity, i.e. the manifest affective reactions. This classification is, however, superficial from the psychological standpoint, for it judges exclusively from the outer appearance. According to this ancient division, the man whose behavior is outwardly peaceful and inconspicuous belongs to the phlegmatic temperament. He passes as phlegmatic and is thereupon classified among the phlegmatics, but, in reality, he may conceivably be all this yet no phlegmatic, but on the contrary a deeply sensitive, even passionate nature, in whom emotion pursues the inward course, wherewith the intensest inner excitement expresses itself through the greatest outward calm. Jordan's type conception takes this fact into account. He judges not merely from the surface impression, but from a rather deeper grasp of human nature. Ostwald's fundamental marks of distinction, like the antique temperamental divisions, depend chiefly upon the external impression. His romantic type is characterized by the presence of a quick outward reaction, whereas the classic type reacts just as quickly, maybe, but within. As one reads the Ostwald biographies, one sees at once that the romantic type corresponds with an extrovert, while the classic with the introvert. Humphrey Davy and Liebig are perfect examples of the extroverted type, just as Robert Mayer and Faraday are model introverts. The outward reaction is characteristic of the extrovert, just as the inner reaction distinguishes the introvert. The extrovert has no especial difficulty in his personal manifestations. He asserts his presence almost involuntarily, because in obedience to his whole nature, he strives to transvey himself into the object. He easily gives himself to the world about him, and in a form necessarily comprehensible, and therefore, acceptable to his world. The form is, as a rule, pleasing, but in any case, inintelligible, even when it is unpleasing. For, as a result of his quick reaction and discharge, both valuable and worthless contents will be transveyed into the object, winning manners hand in hand with forbidding thoughts and affects. But from this quick unloading and transference, there is less elaboration of his contents, which are, therefore, easy to understand, so that, even from the mere fleeting apposition of immediate expressions, a shifting succession of images is produced which clearly present to the public eye the ways and means by which the investigator has attained his result. The introvert, on the other hand, who reacts almost entirely within, does not, as a rule, divest himself of his reactions, affect explosions excepted. He suppresses his reactions, which, however, can be just as quick as those of the extrovert. They do not play on the surface, hence the introvert may easily give the impression of slowness. Since immediate reactions are always strongly personal, the extrovert cannot choose but exhibit his personality. The introvert, on the other hand, hides his personality, because he suppresses his immediate reactions. Feeling into is not his aim, nor the transference of his contents into the object, but rather abstraction from the object. Hence, instead of immediately divesting himself of his reactions, he prefers to make a long internal elaboration of them, before finally bringing forth a prepared result. His constant effort is to free his result, as far as possible, from personal elements to present it clearly differentiated from every personal relation. His contents, the matured fruit of prolonged inner labor, emerge into the outer world in the most completely abstracted and depersonalized form. Accordingly, they are also difficult to understand, because the public lacks all knowledge of the preliminary steps or the kind of route by which the investigator reaches his result. A personal relation to his public is also lacking, because the introvert, in suppressing himself, shrouds his personality from the public eye. 
But often enough, it is just the personal relationship which brings about the understanding that was denied to mere intellectual apprehension. This circumstance must constantly be borne in mind when judgment is made upon an introvert's development. As a rule, one is ill-informed about the introvert, because his real self is not visible. His incapacity for the immediate outward reactions occludes his personality. Hence, to the public eye, his life provides ample scope for the play of fantastic interpretations and projections, should he ever chance, by virtue of his achievements, to become the object of general interest. End of chapter 9. The Type Problem in Biography, Part 1. Recording by AvianX. Section 39 of Psychological Types, or the Psychology of Individuation. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by AvianX. Psychological Types, or the Psychology of Individuation, by Carl Gustav Jung. Translated by Helton Godwin Baines, 1882. To 1943. Chapter 9. The Type Problem in Biography. Part 2. The observation of Ostwald that early mental maturity is characteristic of the romantic needs, therefore, to be somewhat modified. The romantic is certainly able to display his prematurity, but the classic, although perhaps equally mature, may conceal his products within himself. Not designedly, of course, but from an inability for immediate expression. As a result of deficient differentiation of feeling, the introvert exhibits a certain awkwardness, a real infantilism in the personal relation, i.e. in that element which the Englishman calls personality. His personal manifestations are so uncertain and vague, and he himself is so sensitive in this respect, that he dares to reveal himself to his circle only with what, in his own eyes, is an apparently finished product. He also prefers to let his product speak for him, instead of personally interceding on its behalf. The natural result of such an attitude means a considerably delayed appearance upon the world's stage. So frequently is this so, that the introvert might easily be described as late in maturing. Such a superficial judgment, however, wholly ignores the fact that the infantilism of the seemingly early matured and outwardly differentiated extrovert is simply within, in his relation to his inner world. In the early matured extrovert, this fact is only subsequently revealed, in some moral immaturity, for instance, or, as is so often the case, in an astonishing infantilism of thought. As a rule, the romantic has more favorable opportunities for development and growth than the classic, a fact which Ostwald justly observes. He makes a visible and convincing appearance before his public, allowing his personal importance to be recognized immediately through his external reactions. In this way, many valuable relations are quickly established, which enrich his work and give breadth to its development. The classic, on the other hand, remains hidden, his lack of personal relations limits any extension of his sphere of work, but thereby his activity gains in depth, and his labor has lasting value. Both types possess enthusiasm, but, while that which fills the extrovert's heart overflows from his mouth, the introvert's lips are sealed by the enthusiasm that moves him within. Kindling no flame of enthusiasm in the world about him, he even lacks a circle of colleagues of equal caliber. Even had he, too, the impelling desire to impart his knowledge, his laconic expression, as also the mystified lack of comprehension it produces in his public, would deter him from further communications, for it very frequently happens that no one believes he has anything extraordinary to give. His expression, his personality, appear commonplace to the superficial judgment, while not infrequently the romantic immediately appears interesting, and understands the art of encouraging this impression by every sort of means, whether permissible or not. 
This differentiated capacity for expression provides a suitable background for impressive ideas, besides being an accommodating assistance in helping the deficient understanding of his public over the interstices of his thinking. Ostwald's emphasis upon the successful and brilliant academic activities of the Romantic is therefore entirely expressive of this type. The Romantic feels himself into his pupils, and knows the right word at the right moment. But the Classic is held to his own thoughts and problems, and thus is blind to his pupils' difficulties in understanding. Speaking of the Classic Helmholtz, Ostwald remarks, In spite of his prodigious learning, comprehensive experience, and richly creative mind, he was never a good teacher. His reactions never came instantaneously, but only after a certain lapse of time. Confronted by a pupil's question in the laboratory, he would promise to think it over, and only after several days would he bring the answer. This turned out to be so remote from the situation of the pupil, that only in the rarest cases was it possible for the latter to discover any connection between the difficulty he had felt and the well-rounded theory of a general problem subsequently expounded by the teacher. Thus, not only was the immediate help lacking upon which every beginner very largely relies, but also that guidance commensurate with the pupil's personality, by which he may gradually develop from the natural dependence of the beginner to the complete mastery of his chosen branch of science. All such defects have their immediate source in the inability of the teacher to react directly as the need of the pupil presents itself, his reactions demanding so much time for their expected and desired operation that their very effect is lost. Ostwald's explanation of this, as the result of the slowness of the introvert's reaction, seems to me inadequate. There is no sort of proof that Helmholtz possessed a low reactive rapidity, he merely reacted inwardly, rather than outwardly. Because the pupil was not felt into, as it were, the latter's need was dark to him. His attitude is wholly bent upon his thoughts. Hence, instead of the personal wish of the pupil, he reacts to the thoughts the pupil's question has excited in himself. And this he does so rapidly and fundamentally, that he at once divines a further connection which, at the moment, he is incapable of appraising, and rendering back in an abstract and finely elaborated form. This is not because his thinking is too slow, but because it is objectively impossible to seize in a moment the entire dimensions of the problem divined and give it a ready formula. Naturally, not observing that the pupil has no inkling of such a problem, he firmly believes he has an important problem to deal with, and not merely an extremely simple and, to him, trivial piece of advice which could be given in a moment, if only he could allow himself to see what the pupil was waiting for to enable him to get on with his work. But as an introvert, he is not felt into the other's personality. He is only felt into his own theoretical problems, his inner world, where he goes on spinning the threads of the theoretical problem taken from the pupil, threads which are certainly germane to the problem, but not to the pupil's momentary need. Naturally, from the academic standpoint, this peculiar attitude of the introverted teacher is very unsuitable, quite apart from the unfavorable personal impression it engenders. He gives an impression of slowness, singularity, even thick-headedness, on which account he is very often underestimated, not only by the larger public, but also by his own smaller circle of colleagues, until one day his work and ideas are eventually followed up, elaborated and translated by later investigators. Gauss, the mathematician, had such a distaste for teaching that he informed each individual student who reported himself that, in all probability, his course of lectures would not take place, hoping by this means to unburden himself of the necessity of giving them. That teaching was so painful to him, as Oswald justly observes, lay in the necessity of pronouncing definite scientific results in his lectures without ever having previously established and elaborated every detail of the text. To be obliged to communicate his results to others without such elaboration may have felt to him as though he were exhibiting himself before the strangers in his nightshirt. With this observation, Ostwald touches a very essential point, 
namely the above-mentioned disinclination of the introvert, for any part of himself other than quite impersonal communications, to reach the surrounding world. Ostwald emphasizes the fact that, as a rule, the romantic is compelled to bring his career to a close at a comparatively early stage on account of increasing exhaustion. He is also disposed to attribute this fact to his greater reactive rapidity, since this concept of mental reactive rapidity is, in my view, still remote from the region of scientific fact, and since no proof is as yet forthcoming, neither is it susceptible of proof that the external reaction takes place more rapidly than the internal. It seems to me that the earlier exhaustion of the extroverted discoverer must be essentially related to the external reaction peculiar to his type. He begins to publish very early, becomes rapidly famous, and soon develops an intensive activity, both academically and as a publicist. He cultivates personal relationships among a very wide circle of friends and acquaintances, and, in addition to all this, he takes an unusual interest in the development of his pupils. The introverted pioneer begins to publish later. His works succeed one another at longer intervals and are mostly sparing in expression, Repetitions of a theme are avoided, except where something entirely new can be brought into them. The pithy and laconic style of his scientific communications, which frequently omit all information concerning the way he has traversed, or the material elaborated, hinders any general understanding or acceptance of his works, and so he remains unknown. His distaste for teaching does not bring him pupils. He is so little known that any relations with a larger circle of acquaintances is precluded. As a rule, therefore, he lives a retired life, not from necessity merely, but also from choice. Thus he escapes the danger of spending himself too lavishly. His inner reactions lead him constantly back to the circumscribed tracks of his research activities. These in themselves are very exacting proving as time goes on so deeply exhausting as to permit of no incidental expenditure of energy on behalf of acquaintances or pupils. There is the additional circumstance that the manifest success of the romantic is also a vitalizing and invigorating factor, but this is very often denied the classic, so that he is forced to seek his only satisfaction in the perfecting of his work of research. In the light of these considerations, the relatively premature exhaustion of the romantic genius seems to me to depend more upon the external reaction than upon the higher reactive rapidity. Ostwald does not regard his type division as absolute in the sense that every investigator can be shown forthwith to belong to one or the other type. He is, however, of the opinion that the really great men can generally be included quite definitely in one or the other end group while the average people much more frequently represent the middle position in respect to reactive rapidity. In conclusion, I would like to observe that the Ostwald biographies contain material which, though partial, has a very valuable bearing on the psychology of the types, and strikingly exhibits the coincidence of the romantic with the extroverted type, and the classic with the introverted. End of chapter 9, The Type Problem in Biography Part 2. Recording by Avian X. Section 40 of Psychological Types, or the Psychology of Individuation. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Paul Harvey. Psychological Types, or the Psychology of Individuation, by Carl Gustav Jung, translated by Helton Godwin Baines, 1882-1943, Section 40. Chapter 10, General Description of the Types, A Introduction. In the following pages, I shall attempt a general description of the types, and my first concern must be with the two general types I have termed introverted and extroverted. But in addition, I shall also try to give a certain characterization of those special types whose particularity is due to the fact that his most differentiated function plays the principal role 
and an individual's adaptation or orientation to life. The former I would term general attitude types, since they are distinguished by the direction of general interest or libido movement, while the latter I would call function types. The general attitude types, as I have pointed out more than once, are differentiated by their particular attitude to the object. The introvert's attitude to the object is an abstracting one. At bottom, he is always facing the problem of how libido can be withdrawn from the object, as though an attempted ascendancy on the part of the object had to be continually frustrated. The extrovert, on the contrary, maintains a positive relation to the object. To such an extent does he affirm its importance that his subjective attitude is continually being oriented by and related to the object. How fond, the object can never have sufficient value for him, therefore its importance must always be paramount. The two types are so essentially different, presenting so striking a contrast that their existence, even to the uninitiated in psychological matters, becomes an obvious fact, when once attention has been drawn to it. Who does not know those taciturn, impenetrable, often shy natures, who form such a vivid contrast to these other open, sociable, serene, maybe, or at least friendly, and accessible characters, who are on good terms with all the world, or even when disagreeing with it, still hold a relation to it by which they and it are mutually affected. Naturally, at first, one is inclined to regard such differences as mere individual idiosyncrasies. But anyone with the opportunity of gaining a fundamental knowledge of many men will soon discover that such a far-reaching contrast does not merely concern the individual case, but is a question of typical attitudes. With a universality far greater than a limited psychological experience would at first assume. In reality, as the preceding chapters will have shown, it is a question of a fundamental opposition, at times clear and at times obscure, but always emerging whenever we are dealing with individuals whose personality is in any way pronounced. Such men are found not only among the educated classes, but in every rank of society. With equal distinctness, therefore, our types can be demonstrated among laborers and peasants as among the most differentiated members of a nation. Furthermore, these types override the distinctions of sex, since one finds the same contrasts among women of all classes. Such a universal distribution could hardly arise at the instigation of consciousness, i.e., as a result of a conscious and deliberate choice of attitude. If this were the case, a definite level of society, linked together by a similar education and environment, and therefore correspondingly localized, would surely have a majority representation of such an attitude. But the actual facts are just the reverse, for the types have, apparently, quite a random distribution. In the same family, one child is introverted and another extroverted. Since, in the light of these facts, the attitude type, regarded as a general phenomena, having an apparently random distribution, can be no affair of conscious judgment or intention, its existence must be due to some unconscious, instinctive cause. The contrast of types, therefore, as a universal psychological phenomena, must in some way or other have its biological precursor. The relation between subject and object, considered biologically, is always a relation of adaptation, since every relation between subject and object presupposes mutually modifying effects from either side. These modifications constitute the adaptation. The typical attitudes to the object, therefore, are adaptation processes. Nature knows two fundamentally different ways of adaptation, which determine the further existence of the living organism. The one is by increased fertility, accompanied by a relatively small degree of defensive power 
and individual conservation. The other is by individual equipment of manifold means of self-protection, coupled with a relatively insignificant fertility. This biological contrast seems not merely to be the analog, but also the general foundation of our two psychological modes of adaptation. At this point, a mere general indication must suffice. On the one hand, I need only point to the peculiarity of the extrovert, which constantly urges him to spend and propagate himself in every way, and on the other, to the tendency of the introvert to defend himself against external claims, to conserve himself from any expenditure of energy directly related to the object, thus consolidating for himself the most secure and impregnable position. Blake's intuition did not err when he described the two forms as the prolific and the devouring. As is shown by the general biological example, both forms are current and successful after their kind. This is equally true of the typical attitudes. What the one brings about by a multiplicity of relations, the other gains by monopoly. The fact that often, in their earliest years, children display an unmistakable, typical attitude forces us to assume that it cannot possibly be the struggle for existence, as it is generally understood, which constitutes the compelling factor in favor of a definite attitude. We might, however, demur, and indeed with cogency, that even the tiny infant, the very babe at the breast, has already an unconscious psychological adaptation to perform, inasmuch as the special character of the maternal influence leads to specific reactions in the child. This argument, though appealing to incontestable facts, has nonetheless to yield before the equally unarguable fact that two children of the same mother may at a very early age exhibit opposite types, without the smallest accompanying change in the attitude of the mother. Although nothing would induce me to underestimate the well-nigh incalculable importance of parental influence, this experience compels me to conclude that the decisive factor must be looked for in the disposition of the child. The fact that, in spite of the greatest possible similarity of external conditions, one child will assume this type, while another that must, of course, in the last resort, he ascribed to individual disposition. Naturally, in saying this, I only refer to those cases which occur under normal conditions. Under abnormal conditions, i.e., when there is an extreme and therefore abnormal attitude in the mother, the children can also be coerced into a relatively similar attitude. But this entails a violation of their individual disposition, which quite possibly would have assumed another type if no abnormal and disturbing external influence had intervened. As a rule, whenever such a falsification of type takes place as a result of external influence, the individual becomes neurotic later, and a cure can successfully be sought only in a development of that attitude which corresponds with the individual's natural way. As regards the particular disposition, I know not what to say except that there are clearly individuals who have either a greater readiness and capacity for one way or for whom it is more congenial to adapt to that way rather than the other. In the last analysis, it may well be that physiological causes inaccessible to our knowledge play a part in this. That this may be the case seems to me not improbable in view of one's experience that a reversal of type often proves exceedingly harmful to the physiological well-being of the organism, often provoking an acute state of exhaustion. End of section 40. Recording by Paul Harvey. Section 41 of Psychological Types, or the Psychology of Individuation. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, 
please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Tatiana Chichilla, Columbus, Ohio. Psychological Types, or The Psychology of Individuation, by Carl Gustav Jung. Translated by Helton Godwin Baines, 1882-1943. Chapter 10b, The Extroverted Type, 1. The General Attitude of Consciousness. In our descriptions of this and the following type, it will be necessary, in the interest of lucid and comprehensive presentation, to discriminate between the conscious and unconscious psychology. Let us first lend our minds to a description of the phenomena of consciousness. 1. The general attitude of consciousness. Everyone is, admittedly, oriented by the data with which the outer world provides him, yet we see that this may be the case in a way that is only relatively decisive. Because it is cold out of doors, one man is persuaded to wear his overcoat. Another, from a desire to become hardened, finds this unnecessary. One man admires the new tenor, because all the world admires him. Another withholds his approbation, not because he dislikes him, but because in his view the subject of general admiration is not thereby proved to be admirable. One submits to a given state of affairs because his experience argues nothing else to be possible. Another is convinced that, although it has repeated itself a thousand times in the same way, the thousand and first will be different. The former is orientated by the objective data, the latter reserves a view, which is, as it were, interposed between himself and the objective fact. Now, when the orientation to the object and to objective facts is so predominant that the most frequent and essential decisions and actions are determined, not by subjective values but by objective relations, one speaks of an extroverted attitude. When this is habitual, one speaks of an extroverted type. If a man so thinks, feels, and acts, in a word, so lives, as to correspond directly with objective conditions and their claims, whether in a good sense or ill, he is extroverted. His life makes it perfectly clear that it is the objective, rather than the subjective value, which plays the greater role as the determining factor of his consciousness. He naturally has subjective values, but their determining power has less importance than the external objective conditions. Never, therefore, does he expect to find any absolute factors in his own inner life, since the only ones he knows are outside himself. Epimetheus-like, his inner life succumbs to the external necessity, not, of course, without a struggle, which, however, always ends in favor of the objective determinant. His entire consciousness looks outwards to the world, because the important and decisive determination always comes to him from without. But it comes to him from without only because that is where he expects it, all the distinguishing characteristics of his psychology, insofar as they do not arise from the priority of one definite psychological function or from individual peculiarities, have their origin in this basic attitude. Interest and attention follow objective happenings, and, primarily, those of the immediate environment. Not only persons, but things, seize and rivet his interest. His actions, therefore, are also governed by the influence of persons and things. They are directly related to objective data and determinations, and are, as it were, exhaustively explainable on these grounds. Extroverted action is recognizably related to objective conditions. Insofar as it is not purely reactive to environmental stimuli, its character is constantly applicable to the actual circumstances, and it finds adequate and appropriate play within the limits of the objective situation. It has no serious tendency to transcend these bounds. The same holds good for interest. Objective occurrences have a well-nigh inexhaustible charm, so that in the normal course the extrovert's interest makes no other claims. The moral laws which govern his action coincide with the corresponding claims of society, i.e. with the generally valid moral viewpoint. If the generally valid view were different, the subjective moral guiding line would also be different, without the general psychological habitus being in any way changed. It might almost seem, although it is by no means the case, that this rigid determination by objective factors would involve an altogether ideal and complete adaptation to general conditions of life. An accommodation to objective data, such as we have described, must, of course, seem a complete adaptation to the extroverted view, since from this standpoint no other criterion exists. But from a higher point of view, it is no means granted that the standpoint of objectively given facts is the normal one under all circumstances. Objective conditions may be either temporarily or locally abnormal. An individual who is accommodated to such conditions certainly conforms to the abnormal style of his surroundings, but in relation to the universally valid laws of life, he is, in common with his milieu, in an abnormal position. 
The individual may, however, thrive in such surroundings, but only to the point when he, together with his whole milieu, is destroyed for transgressing the universal laws of life. He must inevitably participate in this downfall with the same completeness as he was previously adjusted to the objectively valid situation. He is adjusted but not adapted, since adaptation demands more than a mere frictionless participation in the momentary conditions of the immediate environment. Once more, I would point to Spittler's Epimetheus. Adaptation demands an observance of laws far more universal in their application than purely local and temporary conditions. Mere adjustment is the limitation of the normal extroverted type. On the one hand, the extrovert owes his normality to his ability to fit into existing conditions with relative ease. He naturally pretends to nothing more than the satisfaction of existing objective possibilities, applying himself, for instance, to the calling which offers sound perspective possibilities in the actual situation in time and place. He tries to do or to make just what his milieu momentarily needs and expects from him, and abstains from every innovation that is not entirely obvious, or that in any way exceeds the expectation of those around him. But on the other hand, his normality must also depend essentially upon whether the extrovert takes into account the actuality of his subjective needs and requirements, and this is just his weak point, for the tendency of his type has such a strong outward direction that even the most obvious of all subjective facts, namely the condition of his own body, may quite easily receive inadequate consideration. The body is not sufficiently objective or external, so that the satisfaction of simple elementary requirements, which are indispensable to physical well-being, are no longer given their place. The body accordingly suffers, to say nothing of the soul. Although, as a rule, the extrovert takes small note of this latter circumstance, his intimate domestic circle perceives it all the more keenly. His loss of equilibrium is perceived by himself only when abnormal bodily sensations make themselves felt. These tangible facts he cannot ignore. It is natural he should regard them as concrete and objective, since for his mentality there exists only this and nothing more in himself. In others, he at once sees imagination at work. A too extroverted attitude may actually become so, regardless of the subject that the latter is entirely sacrificed to so-called objective claims, to the demands, for instance, of a continually extending business, because orders lie claiming one's attention, or because profitable possibilities are constantly being opened up, which must instantly be seized. This is the extrovert's danger. He becomes caught up in objects, wholly losing himself in their toils. The functional, nervous, or actual physical disorders which result from this state have a compensatory significance, forcing the subject to an involuntary self-restriction. Should the symptoms be functional, their peculiar formation may symbolically express the psychological situation. A singer, for instance, whose fame quickly reaches a dangerous pitch, tempting him to a disproportionate outlay of energy, is suddenly robbed of his high tones by a nervous inhibition. A man of very modest beginnings rapidly reaches a social position of great influence and wide prospects, when suddenly he is overtaken by a psychogenic state, with all the symptoms of mountain sickness. Again, a man on the point of marrying an idolized woman of doubtful character, whose value he extravagantly overestimates, is seized with a spasm of the esophagus, which forces him to a regimen of two cups of milk in the day, demanding his three-hourly attention. All visits to his fiancée are thus effectively stopped, and no choice is left to him but to busy himself with his bodily nourishment. A man who, through his own energy and enterprise, has built up a vast business, entailing an intolerable burden of work, is afflicted by nervous attacks of thirst, as a result of which he speedily falls a victim to hysterical alcoholism. Hysteria is, in my view, by far the most frequent neurosis with the extroverted type. The classical example of hysteria is always characterized by an exaggerated rapport with the members of his circle and a frankly imitatory accommodation to surrounding conditions. A constant tendency to appeal for interest and to produce impressions upon his milieu is a basic trait of the hysterical nature. A correlate to this is his proverbial suggestibility, his pliability to another person's influence. Unmistakable extroversion comes out in the communicativeness of the hysteric, which occasionally leads to the divulging of purely fantastic contents, whence arises the reproach of the hysterical lie. To begin with, the hysterical character is an exaggeration of the normal attitude. It is then complicated by compensatory reactions from the side of the unconscious which manifests its opposition to the extravagant extroversion in the form of physical disorders, whereupon an introversion of psychic energy becomes unavoidable. Through this reaction of the unconscious, 
another category of symptoms arises which have a more introverted character. A morbid intensification of fantasy activity belongs primarily to this category. From this general characterization of the extroverted attitude, let us now turn to a description of the modifications which the basic psychological functions undergo as a result of this attitude. End of section 41. Recording by Tatiana Chichilla, Columbus, Ohio. Section 42 of Psychological Types, or the Psychology of Individuation. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Tatiana Chichilla, Columbus, Ohio. Psychological Types, or the Psychology of Individuation, by Carl Gustav Jung. Translated by Hilton Godwin Baines, 1882 to 1943. Section 42. Chapter 10b. 2. The Attitude of the Unconscious. It may perhaps seem odd that I should speak of an attitude of the unconscious. As I have already sufficiently indicated, I regard the relation of the unconscious to the conscience as compensatory. The unconscious, according to this view, has a good claim to an attitude as the conscious. In the foregoing section, I emphasize the tendency to a certain one-sidedness in the extroverted attitude, due to the controlling power of the objective factor in the course of psychic events. The extroverted type is constantly tempted to give himself away, apparently, in favor of the object, and to assimilate his subject to the object. I have referred in detail to the ultimate consequences of this exaggeration of the extroverted attitude, viz. to the injurious suppression of the subjective factor. It is only to be expected, therefore, that a psychic compensation of the conscious extroverted attitude will lay a special weight upon the subjective factor, i.e. we shall have to prove a strong egocentric tendency in the unconscious. Practical experience actually furnishes this proof. I do not wish to enter into a casuistical survey at this point, so must refer my readers to the ensuing sections, where I shall attempt to present the characteristic attitude of the unconscious from the angle of each function type. In this section, we are merely concerned with the compensation of a general extroverted attitude, I shall, therefore, confine myself to an equally general characterization of the compensating attitude of the unconscious. The attitude of the unconscious as an effective complement to the conscious extroverted attitude has a definitely introverting character. It focuses libido upon the subjective factor, i.e. all those needs and claims which are stifled or repressed by a too extroverted conscious attitude. It may be readily gathered from what has been said in the previous section that a purely objective orientation does violence to a multitude of subjective emotions, intentions, needs, and desires, since it robs them of the energy which is their natural right. Man is not a machine that one can reconstruct, as occasion demands, upon other lines and for quite other ends, in the hope that it will then proceed to function in a totally different way, just as normally as before. Man bears his age-long history with him, and his very structure is written the history of mankind. The historical factor represents a vital need to which a wise economy must respond. Somehow the past must become vocal and participate in the present. Complete assimilation to the object, therefore, encounters the protest of the suppressed minority, elements belonging to the past and existing from the beginning. From this quite general consideration, it may be understood why it is that the unconscious claims of the extroverted type have an essentially primitive, infantile, and egotistical character. When Freud says that the unconscious is only able to wish, this observation contains a large measure of truth for the unconscious of the extroverted type. Adjustment and assimilation to objective data prevent inadequate subjective impulses from reaching consciousness. These tendencies, thoughts, wishes, affects, needs, feelings, etc., take on a regressive character corresponding with the degree of their repression, i.e. the less they are recognized, the more infantile and archaic they become. The conscious attitude robs them of their relatively disposable energy charge, only leaving them the energy of which it cannot deprive them. This remainder, which still possesses a potency not to be underestimated, can be described only as primeval instinct. Instinct can never be rooted out from an individual by any arbitrary measures. It requires the slow, organic transformation of many generations to effect a radical change, for instinct is the energetic expression of a definite organic foundation. Thus, with every repressed tendency, a considerable sum of energy ultimately remains. This sum corresponds with the potency of the instinct and guards its effectiveness, notwithstanding the deprivation of energy which made it unconscious. 
the measure of extroversion in the conscious attitude entails a like degree of infantilism and archaism in the attitude of the unconscious. The egoism which so often characterizes the extrovert's unconscious attitude goes far beyond mere childish selfishness. It even verges upon the wicked and brutal. It is here we find in fullest bloom that incest wish described by Freud. It is self-evident that these things are entirely unconscious, remaining altogether hidden from the eyes of the uninitiated observer so long as the extroversion of the conscious attitude does not reach an extreme stage. But wherever an exaggeration of the conscious standpoint takes place, the unconscious also comes to light in a symptomatic form, i.e. the unconscious egoism, infantilism, and archaism lose their original compensatory characters, and appear in more or less open opposition to the conscious attitude. This process begins in the form of an absurd exaggeration of the conscious standpoint, which is aimed at a further repression of the unconscious, but usually ends in a reductio ad absurdum of the conscious attitude, i.e. a collapse. The catastrophe may be an objective one, since the objective aims gradually become falsified by the subjective. I remember the case of a printer who, starting as a mere employee, worked his way up through two decades of hard struggle, till at last he was the independent possessor of a very extensive business. The more the business extended, the more it increased its hold upon him, until gradually every other interest was allowed to become merged in it. At length he was completely enmeshed in its toils, and, as we shall soon see, this surrender eventually proved his ruin. As a sort of compensation to his exclusive interest in the business, certain memories of his childhood came to life. As a child, he had taken great delight in painting and drawing. But, instead of renewing this capacity for its own sake as a balancing side interest, he cannibalized it into his business and began to conceive artistic elaborations of his products. His fantasies unfortunately materialized. He actually began to produce after his own primitive and infantile taste, with the result that after a very few years his business went to pieces. He acted in obedience to one of our civilized ideals, which enjoins the energetic man to concentrate everything upon the one end in view. But he went too far, and merely fell a victim to the power of his subjective infantile claims. But the catastrophic solution may also be subjective, i.e. in the form of a nervous collapse. Such a solution always comes about as a result of the unconscious counter-influence, which can ultimately paralyze conscious action in which case the claims of the unconscious force themselves categorically upon consciousness, thus creating a calamitous cleavage which generally reveals itself in two ways. Either the subject no longer knows what he really wants, and nothing any longer interests him, or he wants too much at once and has too keen an interest, but in impossible things. The suppression of infantile and primitive claims, which is often necessary on civilized grounds, easily leads to neurosis, or to the misuse of narcotics such as alcohol, morphine, cocaine, etc. In more extreme cases, the cleavage ends in suicide. It is a salient peculiarity of unconscious tendencies that, just in so far as they are deprived of their energy by a lack of conscious recognition, they assume a correspondingly destructive character, and as soon as this happens, their compensatory function ceases. They cease to have a compensatory effect as soon as they reach a depth or stratum that corresponds with the level of culture absolutely incompatible with our own. From this moment, the unconscious tendencies form a block, which is opposed to the conscious attitude in every respect. Such a block inevitably leads to open conflict. In a general way, the compensating attitude of the unconscious finds expression in the process of psychic equilibrium. A normal extroverted attitude does not, of course, mean that the individual behaves invariably in accordance with the extroverted schema. Even in the same individual, many psychological happenings may be observed in which the mechanism of introversion is concerned. A habitus can be called extroverted only when the mechanism of extroversion predominates. In such a case, the most highly differentiated function has a constantly extroverted application, while the inferior functions are found in the service of introversion, i.e. the more valued function, because the more conscious is more completely subordinated to conscious control and purpose while the less conscious, in other words, the partly unconscious, inferior functions are subjected to conscious free choice in a much smaller degree. The superior function is always the expression of the conscious personality, its aim, its will, and its achievement, whilst the inferior functions belong to the things that happen to one. Not that they merely beget blunders, e.g. lapsus linguae or lapsus calami, but they may also breed half or three-quarter resolves, since the inferior functions also possess a slight degree of consciousness. The extroverted feeling type is a classical example of this, 
for he enjoys an excellent feeling rapport with his entourage, yet occasionally opinions of an incomparable tactlessness will just happen to him. These opinions have their source in his inferior and subconscious thinking, which is only partly subject to his control and is insufficiently related to the object. To a larger extent, therefore, it can operate without consideration or responsibility. In the extroverted attitude, the inferior functions always reveal a highly subjective determination with pronounced egocentricity and personal bias, thus demonstrating their close connection with the unconscious. Through their agency, the unconscious is continually coming to light. On no account should we imagine that the unconscious lies permanently buried under so many overlying strata that it can only be uncovered, so to speak, by a laborious process of excavation. On the contrary, there is a constant influx of the unconscious into the conscious psychological process. At times, this reaches such a pitch that the observer can decide only with difficulty which character traits are to be ascribed to the conscious and which to the unconscious personality. This difficulty occurs mainly with persons whose habit of expression errs rather on the side of profuseness. Naturally, it depends very largely also upon the attitude of the observer, whether he lays hold of the conscious or the unconscious character of a personality. Speaking generally, a judging observer will tend to seize the conscious character, while a perceptive observer will be influenced more by the unconscious character, since judgment is chiefly interested in the conscious motivation of the psychic process, while perception tends to register the mere happening. But insofar as we apply perception and judgment in equal measure, it may easily happen that a personality appears to us as both introverted and extroverted, so that we cannot at once decide to which attitude the superior function belongs. In such cases, only a thorough analysis of the function qualities can help us to a sound opinion. During the analysis, we must observe which function is placed under the control and motivation of consciousness, and which functions have an accidental and spontaneous character. The former is always more highly differentiated than the latter, which also possesses many infantile and primitive qualities. Occasionally, the former function gives the impression of normality, while the latter have something abnormal or pathological about them. End of section 42. Recording by Tatiana Chichilla, Columbus, Ohio. Section 43. Psychological Types or the Psychology of Individuation. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Sindhu Ravindran. Psychological Types or the Psychology of Individuation by Carl Gustav Jung. Translated by Helton Godwin Baines, 1882 to 1943. Section 43. The peculiarities of the basic psychological functions in the extroverted attitude. Number one, thinking. As a result of the general attitude of extroversion, thinking is oriented by the object and objective data. This orientation of thinking produces a noticeable peculiarity. Thinking in general is fed from two sources. Firstly, from subjective, and in the last resort, unconscious roots, and secondly, from objective data transmitted through sense perceptions. Extroverted thinking is conditioned in a larger measure by these latter factors than by the former. Judgment always presupposes a criterion. For the extroverted judgment, the valid and determining criterion is the standard taken from objective conditions no matter whether this be directly represented by an objectively perceptible fact or expressed in an objective idea. For an objective idea, even when subjectively sanctioned, is equally external and objective in origin. Extroverted thinking, therefore, need not necessarily be a merely concretistic thinking. It may equally well be a purely ideal thinking. If, for instance, it can be shown that the ideas with which it is engaged are to a great extent borrowed from without, that is, are transmitted by tradition and education. The criterion of judgment, therefore, as to whether or no a thinking is extroverted 
hangs directly upon the question, by which standard is its judgment governed? Is it furnished from without or its origin subjective? A further criterion is afforded by the direction of the thinker's conclusion, namely, whether or no the thinking has a preferential direction outwards. It is no proof of its extroverted nature that it is preoccupied with concrete objects. Since I may be engaging my thoughts with a concrete object, either because I am abstracting my thought from it, or because I am concretizing my thought with it. Even if I engage my thinking with concrete things, and to that extent could be described as extroverted, it yet remains both questionable and characteristic as regards the direction my thinking will take, namely, whether in its further course it leads back again to objective data, external facts, and generally accepted ideas or not. So far as the practical thinking of the merchant, the engineer, or the natural science pioneer is concerned, the objective direction is at once manifest. But in the case of a philosopher, it is open to doubt. Whenever the course of his thinking is directed towards ideas, in such a case, before deciding, we must further inquire whether these ideas are mere abstractions from objective experience, in which case they would merely represent higher collective concepts, comprising a sum of objective facts, or whether, if they are clearly not abstractions from immediate experience, they may not be derived from tradition or borrowed from the intellectual atmosphere of the time. In the latter event, such ideas must also belong to the category of objective data, in which case this thinking should also be called extroverted. Although I do not propose to present the nature of introverted thinking at this point, reserving it for a later section, it is however essential that I should make a few statements about it before going further. For if one considers strictly what I have just said concerning extroverted thinking, one might easily conclude that such a statement includes everything that is generally understood as thinking. It might indeed be argued that a thinking whose aim is concerned neither with objective facts nor with general ideas scarcely merits the name thinking. I am fully aware of the fact that the thought of our age, in common with its most eminent representatives, knows and acknowledges only the extroverted type of thinking. This is partly due to the fact that all thinking which attains visible form upon the world's surface, whether as science, philosophy, or even art, either proceeds direct from objects or flows into general ideas. On either ground, although not always completely evident, it at least appears essentially intelligible and therefore relatively valid. In this sense, it might be said that the extroverted intellect, that is, the mind that is oriented by objective data, is actually the only one recognized. There is also, however, and now I come to the question of the introverted intellect, an entirely different kind of thinking, to which the term thinking can hardly be denied. It is a kind that is neither oriented by the immediate objective experience, nor is it concerned with general and objectively derived ideas. I reach this other kind of thinking in the following way. When my thoughts are engaged with a concrete object, or general idea in such a way that the course of my thinking eventually leads me back again to my object, this intellectual process is not the only psychic proceeding taking place in me at the moment. I will disregard all those possible sensations and feelings which become noticeable as a more or less disturbing accompaniment to my train of thought, merely emphasizing the fact that this very thinking process, which proceeds from objective data and strives again towards the object, stands also in a constant relation to the subject. 
This relation is a conditio sine qua non without which no thinking process whatsoever could take place. Even though my thinking process is directed as far as possible towards objective data, nevertheless it is my subjective process and it can neither escape the subjective admixture nor yet dispense with it. Although I try my utmost to give a completely objective direction to my train of thought, even then I cannot exclude the parallel subjective process with its all-embracing participation, without extinguishing the very spark of life from my thought. This parallel subjective process has a natural tendency, only relatively avoidable, to subjectify objective facts, that is, to assimilate them to the subject. Whenever the chief value is given to the subjective process, that other kind of thinking arises which stands opposed to extroverted thinking, namely, that purely subjective orientation of thought which I have termed introverted. A thinking arises from this other orientation that is neither determined by objective facts nor directed towards objective data. A thinking, therefore, that proceeds from subjective data and is directed towards subjective ideas or facts of a subjective character. I do not wish to enter more fully into this kind of thinking here. I have merely established its existence for the purpose of giving a necessary complement to the extroverted thinking process, whose nature is thus brought to a clearer focus. When the objective orientation receives a certain predominance, the thinking is extroverted. This circumstance changes nothing as regards the logic of thought. It merely determines that difference between thinkers, which James regards as a matter of temperament. The orientation towards the object, as already explained, makes no essential change in the thinking function. Only its appearance is altered. Since it is governed by objective data, it has the appearance of being captivated by the object, as though without the external orientation, it simply could not exist. Almost it seems as though it were a sequelar of external facts, or as though it could reach its highest point only when chiming in with some generally valid idea. It seems constantly to be affected by objective data drawing only those conclusions which substantially agree with these. Thus it gives one the impression of a certain lack of freedom, of occasional short-sightedness, in spite of every kind of adroitness within the objectively circumscribed area. What I am now describing is merely the impression this sort of thinking makes upon the observer, who must himself already have a different standpoint or it would be quite impossible for him to observe the phenomenon of extroverted thinking. As a result of his different standpoint, he merely sees its aspect, not its nature, whereas the man who himself possesses this type of thinking is able to seize its nature, while its aspect escapes him. Judgment made upon appearance only cannot be fair to the essence of the thing, hence the result is depreciatory. But essentially, this thinking is no less fruitful and creative than introverted thinking. Only its powers are in the service of other ends. This difference is perceived most clearly when extroverted thinking is engaged upon material, which is specifically an object of the subjectively oriented thinking. This happens, for instance, when a subjective conviction is interpreted analytically from objective facts or is regarded as a product or derivative of objective ideas. But for a scientifically oriented consciousness, the difference between the two modes of thinking becomes still more obvious when the subjectively oriented thinking makes an attempt to bring objective data into connections not objectively given, that is, to subordinate them to a subjective idea. Either senses the other as an encroachment, and hence a sort of shadow effect is produced, wherein either type reveals to the other 
its least favorable aspect. The subjectively oriented thinking then appears quite arbitrary, while the extroverted thinking seems to have an incommensurability that is altogether dull and banal. Thus the two standpoints are incessantly at war. Such a conflict we might think could be easily adjusted if only we clearly discriminated objects of a subjective from those of an objective nature. Unfortunately, however, such a discrimination is a matter of impossibility, although not a few have attempted it. Even if such a separation were possible, it would be a very disastrous proceeding, since in themselves both orientations are one-sided, with a definitely restricted validity, and they both require this mutual correction. Thought is at once sterilized whenever thinking is brought to any great extent under the influence of objective data, since it becomes degraded into a mere appendage of objective facts in which case it is no longer able to free itself from objective data for the purpose of establishing an abstract idea. The process of thought is reduced to mere reflection, not in the sense of meditation, but in the sense of a mere imitation that makes no essential affirmation beyond what was already visibly and immediately present in the objective data. Such a thinking process leads naturally and directly back to the objective fact, but never beyond it. Not once, therefore, can it lead to the coupling of experience with an objective idea. And, vice versa, when this thinking has an objective idea for its object, it is quite unable to grasp the practical individual experience, but persists in a more or less tautological position. The materialistic mentality presents a magnificent example of this. When, as a result of a reinforced objective determination, extroverted thinking is subordinated to objective data, it entirely loses itself, on the one hand, in the individual experience, and proceeds to amass an accumulation of undigested empirical material. The oppressive mass of more or less disconnected, Individual experiences produces a state of intellectual dissociation, which on the other hand usually demands a psychological compensation. This must consist in an idea, just as simply as it is universal, which will give coherence to the heaped up but intrinsically disconnected whole, or at least it should provide an inkling of such a connection. Such ideas as matter or energy are suitable for this purpose. But whenever thinking primarily depends not so much upon external facts as upon an accepted or second-hand idea, the very poverty of the idea provokes a compensation in the form of a still more impressive accumulation of facts, which assume a one-sided grouping in keeping with the relatively restricted and sterile point of view, whereupon many valuable and sensible aspects of things automatically go by the board. The vertiginous abundance of the so-called scientific literature of today owes a deplorably high percentage of its existence to this misorientation. End of section 43 Please click like, subscribe and click the bell for notifications.